traits. Um, it turns out that insects um, aren't so much attracted to lights. It actually sort of um, stuns them. They're sort of lost in the lights. And one recent study suggested that up about a third of the insects that might be swirling around your light at night are not there in the morning either because of exhaustion or they've been picked off by, a, um, by predators. So maybe reconsider your lights or how long you have your lights on. And then reduce your sound print. Lots of ways to do that. Uh, if you reduce your amount of lawn, of course, you're going to be mowing a lot less. Um, so less effort and less noise and a lot more biodiversity. Um, you might consider non-gas powered machines. Again, I'm throwing all of these out, not suggesting that everybody can or will uh, adopt all of these. I still have a gas powered uh, lawnmower. Um, but lawnmowers, uh, non-gas powered electric uh, machines produce far less sound. So just something else to consider. Uh, and along those lines, the leaf blower, um, not only is it loud, but uh, leaves are really important um, places for our beneficial insects um, to find refuge to overwinter. They're also great fertilizer for our gardens and lawns. So just maybe rethink what you're doing with your leaves and uh, realize that they're this great sort of natural fertilizer that falls from the trees every year, as Doug Tallamy would say. And if you do have a sound system, maybe reconsider it um, and enjoy the sounds of nature instead. So I think the idea is that if we tune into the soundscapes and to the sounds of nature, we'll appreciate them more deeply and we are much, much, we'll be much more likely to preserve um, what we care about and act accordingly. So a couple of just quick ideas before we wrap up about ways to sort of hone your listening skills. You know, the whole idea of mindfulness, which is quite popular now, is um, a great way to, to focus on the sounds in nature is to just apply those ideas and to really just focus on a particular sound or a set of sounds. One idea is to think about having what you might call a sound diet and per perhaps play a game maybe with your kids um, and identify say five pleasurable sounds in a 20 minute period and then take the next 20 minutes and, and see what you're hearing that you don't like so much. And maybe then consider um, what you'd like more of in your life and in your world and then what you might like less of and is there anything that you can do about it? Um, I found about, out about this quite recently. There's a great magazine called Emergence Magazine and they had this great um, piece on five practices for listening to the language of birds. Um, if you get a chance to look that up, uh, I highly recommend it. The author makes a point that the birds, just listening to the ver ver birds um, opened this like, fresh dimension of, of sensory experience and made the author realize um, you know, tune into the ecological rhythms and connect more fully with the sounds and feel more at a home uh, in nature and in their own home. You could also consider taking a sound walk. Um, the uh, uh, Canadian, he's a Canadian musician, Murray, R. Murray Schaefer, but also sort of pioneered the field of sound, uh, acoustic ecology. He suggests going out for a walk and listening really actively to the sounds that you're hearing and maybe you could focus on adding up the per number of times you hear a specific kind of sound if you're with kids maybe do a little scavenger hunt for kinds of sounds buzzes or squeaks there's all kinds of ways to encourage your listening skills and making more people more aware of their soundscapes um, it's suggested will actually be a better way to curb noise pollution than actually any kind of uh, noise ordinance that could be introduced. So I'd like to um, sort of in conclude or nearly conclude with this quote from W.B. Yeats, the great Irish poet, uh, the world is full of magic things patiently waiting for our senses to grow sharper. So let's all sharpen our listening skills and I just wanted to briefly play this beautiful sound. If you're a birder, you may know it. If not, listen for it. It's um, 
a lovely trilling of a wood thrush, which if you're lucky, you'll hear in the spring and summer. And then as I mentioned, Bernie Krauss, the, the father of safe ecology, he's written a wonder, wonderful book called The Great Animal Orchestra. Um, and I also highly recommend his, um, it's about a 10 minute TED talk about soundscape ecology and the sounds of nature and the importance of them to humans. Um, the idea that we evolved listening and hearing nature and as we cut ourselves off from those sounds, we sort of cut ourselves off from our natural home. So if you get a chance, look him up and by all means listen to his TED talk. So just to quickly recap, just start by practicing your listening skills. Um, think about planting native. Uh, minimize your lawns. Um, again, it's like a green desert. Um, introduce more biodiversity into your yards. Hold off on the chemicals. Add shelter, add water. Perhaps reduce your sand print and take a deep breath. Pause this COVID crisis has really called, caused all of us to pause a little bit and perhaps we've all started to notice uh, the sounds of nature more deeply as a result. And so I just want to leave you with um, a, a few um, sources and I have a little um, flyer that I've put together that we um, I'll share with Mary Ellen and she can share with all of you at the end if you're interested. These are just some of the sources of information on the topic. This is um, particularly where you will find information, uh, pollinator-pathway.org. Um, the Audubon offers lots of lists for plants, uh, lots of plants on lists um, for birders, lots of other sources. Of course, Doug Ptolemy's books are a huge, um, rich source of information. Um, the Norker Watershed Association too. Um, these are just a few of the books uh, that I found particularly useful. Bernie Krause's books and then Doug Ptolemy's books are wonderful. And uh, if you haven't read it, um, consider um, taking uh, The Silent Spring. It's really profoundly um, a moving and um, affecting. And then a whole bunch of other online sources. Uh, again, these are all on the flyer that we can offer you. I just wanted to highlight this one, which I discovered more recently, and it's a National Park Service um, uh, sound, natural sounds page, and there are all kinds of uh, resources here about exploring sound and understanding sound. So if you get a chance, check that out. And I just wanted to conclude by thanking you and by uh, letting this little fellow thank you as well. So, this is the sound that I mentioned earlier as what I consider uh, one of the heralds of spring. It's the spring peepers and it's really not too many months off now that we'll be hearing them again. So with that, I wanted to thank you all for coming in. I know there's lots of other things you've done with your Wednesday late afternoon. And I am gonna stop my screen share now and bring um, Mary Ellen back on. Intro here. Hello, everyone. I'm Joanne Gabriel, and on behalf of Darien Library, I want to welcome you to this evening's program, What We Grew Then and What We Grow Now, a look at the history of gardening. I am really excited to welcome Dr. Craig LaHoulier, aka North Carolina's Tomato Man, as he takes us <laughs> on a genealogical tour of American gardens and gardening through the years to learn what cultural, historical, and even meteorological events impacted what we grew then, 
what we grow now and what we might grow in the future. Before we begin, I would like to mention that programs at Darien Library are made possible by the annual Friends of the Library campaign. We thank you for your support to make programs like this possible and our collections available to the community. Our presenter this evening is the author of two best-selling books on gardening, Epic Tomatoes and Growing Vegetables in Straw Bales. His gardening obsession began in 1981 when he began tending his first garden with wife Susan. He soon joined Seed Savers Exchange, becoming an advisor for tomatoes, and became responsible for naming and popularizing many well-known tomato varieties. He is an amateur tomato breeder who continues to co-lead the Dwarf Tomato Project, a unique worldwide volunteer tomato breeding project that brings great tomatoes to those who choose or require container gardening. A popular lecturer across the country at major gardening events, as well as a frequent guest on podcasts and radio shows and Instagram, please welcome Craig LaHoulier. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Joanne. Boy, I get myself in lots of trouble, don't I? I could make my life a lot simpler, but I'm having a blast. And uh, I'm so delighted to be doing another talk for the library because my tomato talk this year was one of my favorite events. And uh, I'm also really excited to be doing this talk because not many people ask me to do it. It's uh, a bit of a fringe. It's a bit of a departure for me, uh, not being focused on tomatoes. But I've always loved um, I've always loved uh, gardening and history and genealogy, and this talk really works for me, uh, especially since I've often been on the hunt for particular varieties. So when we think of gardening through the years, I think there are some really lovely terms such as kitchen garden. Uh, this is the food garden at the Seed Savers Exchange and a cottage garden. Um, it really evokes the country, the garden outside the door. So in Hendersonville here, this is my version of our kitchen garden, I guess. And uh, this is a picture that I took today. This is my summer squash, green beans, uh, cucumbers, eggplant, peppers, tomatoes in straw bale and container garden. It is also an obstacle course uh, for our dogs and they really love that. And right outside our back door, where if we just open the curtain every morning to let the dogs out right off the porch, this is what we see when we wake up, which is our own little cottage garden of all types of flowers. So let's take you way back. Why am I gonna start in the mid 1800s instead of prior to that? It is really because there wasn't a lot of stratification of different varieties leading up to the 1850s or so. And if you look at seed catalogs, the numbers of varieties were pretty limited. Um, you can get a sense in the Thomas Jefferson Farm book in the 1700s to early 1800s of the types of things you grew. There were a lot of varieties that came over from France, but really gardening in the US really started taking hold in the mid 1800s. And this is the oldest seed catalog image that I could find. And I'll show you the link where I found this at the end of the talk, but this is a McMahon company, Philadelphia in 1804. So we're gonna start just by dancing through the time points that I chose to get an idea of what was happening in gardening at the time. This is a page from the 1860 Thorburn. So in the mid 1800s, US seed companies were on the rise, uh, selling a lot of European varieties. There were no hybrids. There was very little art. And in fact, there were very few descriptions. For example, in this uh, dwarf or snap beans section, you see a whole lot of names. You see wonderful prices, 20 cents a packet. Sorry that the, um, the definition on this picture isn't that great, but it's really, really old. And in-ground gardening and farming is the focus. And if you look at dwarf and snap beans, kinds, they would just use the numbers. 3, 12, and 13 are the earliest. So not a whole lot of info. Things started getting really exciting and really colorful in the early 1900s. And this is, I believe, when my grandfather must have started gardening. 
And it was actually his garden that I used to walk through and I, I would give anything to know what varieties he grew. So there is an explosion in the number of US seed companies. There are breeding breakthroughs and that the companies are, not, are now starting to carry some US bred varieties, quite a few. Hybrids were not sold, but were often created to st for a starting point to create new varieties, just like we do in the Dwarf Tomato Breeding Project, where we breed two tomatoes, make a hybrid, and then work on it for six, seven, eight years to get something that's not hybrid, that is stable. Uh, canning was very, very important. And if you look at that tomato on the Livingston Seed Company catalog, that's from 1900, that is pretty much the shape that seed companies were aiming for for tomatoes and the size. They really liked the four or five, six ounce round tomatoes. There were some photos, but mostly it was gorgeous art. And I feel really fortunate that through eBay and um, antique shops, I have a collection of about 400 of these old sea catalogs. And it's just fun to pick up a stack of them and flip through and just think about all of the time that the artists put into recreating what they were looking at out of the farm. Ingrown gardening was still the thing. We're switching now to the mid 1900s, victory gardens. Seed companies were now starting to consolidate. Indeed, many of the great ones were starting to disappear. Hybrids changed the paradigm because it was in the mid 1900s that companies started realizing if I sold a hybrid, people now have to come back to this company every year to get it. So the effort to create open pollinated varieties started going by the wayside. When hybrids hit, companies stopped carrying a lot of those old varieties, so there became less to choose from, and I have a slide that's going to exhibit that. Still colorful, but the art is a little bit less creative. In fact, a lot of times you're seeing colored photographs. Um, vegetable varieties were pretty standard. Green bell pepper that turned red. Your red tomato with an occasional pink, and now there was some talk of container gardening coming to the fore as well, but mostly when they talked about farming and gardening under the cultural sections, it was about growing in your garden. Here we are today. We have it all. Um, aside from the loss of some key historic varieties along the way that did go extinct, we have the biggest choice of any garden gardeners in history Heirlooms have been on the rise ever since the mid 1970s. The Seed Savers Exchange was, of course, a real key to that. And the formation of the Seed Savers Exchange then gave rise to some of the great catalogs, such as Southern Exposure Seed Exchange and Baker Creek and Seeds Bloom and Victory. That meant people were starting to save their own seeds. And there became specialized companies such as Totally Tomatoes or the Tomato Growers Supply Company or the Cook's Garden or the Vermont Bean Seed Company. And of course, anything goes in garden, raised bed, containers, straw bales, hydroponics. So this is the time. However, take a look at this and I'll talk you through it um, where you should take a peek at. Um, Vertically, I've got, I, I looked at seed catalogs and I looked at one from 1860, the Thorburn, the one from 1908, the Burpee from 1960, Burpee from 1998, and a Johnny's from 2019. And then I looked at some key crops and we could get a sense of where the diversity was in the gardens, what people really like to grow. So in the mid 1800s, it was all about peas, 45 different types of peas, four types of eggplant, seven types of peppers, 10 types of tomatoes. And part of this is due to the fact that Americans thought tomatoes were poisonous until we got a little bit beyond the mid 1800s. In 1908, peas were still holding their own, but all of a sudden there were just tons of different melons being sold. Tomatoes have crept up, 52 varieties, peppers and eggplant, still not that many, and the other crops sat somewhere in between. You hit um, 1960, and all of a sudden, the numbers of peas available dropped precipitously, but beans started becoming the thing to grow. Tomatoes are still holding their own. Um, turnips took a drop of 32 varieties in 1908 to six varieties in the mid-1900s. 
And then here we are, um, 1998, um, and this is burpee. So this is a catalog that's gonna focus mostly on hybrids, lots of beans, only 23 types of tomatoes, but then let's, let's look at what happens when you look at a specialty catalog that has a lot of heirlooms such as Johnny's, 105 different tomatoes to choose from. And really, the and 64 different peppers because we now have lots of people that want to grow the hottest pepper. There's all types of pepper diversity. But the numbers at the bottom tell the story. We start off low and then it looks really good. Lots of different varieties in the early 1900s and then boom. Mid 1900s, hybrids start predominating. The numbers of different types of things you can purchase and grow start dropping. Seed savers exchange forms, catalyzes the creation of specialty companies and heirloom companies, and our diversity is all the way up again. However, and I'll repeat it again, we cannot discount the relevance of the formation of the seed savers exchange in 1975 by Kent and Diane Wheely for saving our botanical her heritage because things were looking pretty bad. Um, the race was on to grow the prettiest hybrid that was adorning the cover of a catalog. And there were all kinds of anecdotes such as if you don't grow hybrids, your garden will fail. Boom. This is the Bible of diversity, the Seed Savers yearbook. I, I showed a picture of it on edge because it is, it is literally over an inch thick and contains thousands and thousands and thousands of varieties. And you can actually um, go online and use the exchange, the online version of the seed catalog if you don't wanna get a paper version. So now let's focus on individual crops and see what happened through the years to see which one, which varieties that were popular at these times still exist today? What are the familiar names? And if we look in the mid 1800s, we do see some beans that have made it to today. Valentine, horticultural, refugee, case knife, cranberry bean. Um, if we look at beets, it was mostly red, early, early turnip, blood turnip, yellow turnip. There's a yellow one in there. And we have whites. Um, we have greens for stews. Look at those prices again, 10 cents per ounce of seeds. And I just had to dedicate a page to the mangle wurzel, just because it's a funny word. And it's something that I think, unless you're a farmer, um, you don't grow very often, but they are grown as a sugar beet type crop, very large roots to feed your cattle with and apparently the cows are very happy eating them. And you can look at just a few different types that Salzer was selling, Salzer's Eiffel, Eiffel Tower mangle, um, pretty cool. Let's move on to eggplant, boring, long purple, large purple, improved New York white, uh, improved New York and white for ornamental. However, look at that improved New York I obtained seeds from this, and this is improved New York growing in my garden, one of my Raleigh gardens in the early 2000s. And improved New York is essentially what you think of, or that type when you see the big purple black eggplant in a store. And when I look at these, I think eggplant Parmesan because you can cut nice big slabs out of them. Look at lettuce quickly. Um, almost everything was green. Uh, green head, hardy green, tennis ball. Uh, brown Dutch was actually one that was kind of a reddish rusted color. Um, and it is available to grow today. So we can still grow tennis ball, kos, which is essentially romaine lettuce, oak leaf and brown Dutch. These are lettuces that have stood the test of time. Musk melons, interestingly, in the mid 1800s, it was all about the green fleshed ones. I like to go to Trader Joe and buy their Galia melons, G-A-L-I-A, because they're just a super delicious green flesh melon. That was actually the standard back then. And some of those green flesh melons are still growable today, except they're much smaller. And those of us who really like sweet cantaloupes or musk melons would probably find that some of these older varieties just don't have those sugar levels, but nutmeg and Jenny Lind and Persian all carry through to today. 
The mid 1800s peppers clearly were something that was not a, a huge crop in America. Cherry pepper, uh, sweet Spanish, small chili, um, and really what carries through to, to today is we still have hot or sweet cherry peppers. A squash pepper is really kind of a pimento type, it's a sweet, and of course a barrels and cayenne. I'm not going to, I know tomatoes are my thing, but I'm not going to linger overly long on them tonight. But I just wanted to show you this wonderful um, cut that came out of a um, mid 1800s catalog. Is anybody else hearing a funny sound or is that just, okay, it's better now. So look at the shape of the tomato in the upper left. Um, that was the exception rather than the rule. And as you can see, as the tomatoes got smaller, they got rounder. This is another beautiful cut. Uh, Bennery was a, a, a French seed company. And if you look in the lower right, there's that large irregular picture. But these are just a sampling of the types of tomatoes that were available to grow in 1876. What's interesting to note is that speckled one in the middle right and also, if you look at how ribbed and ridged the larger fruited tomatoes were. Now, I can't tell you a lot about this, but in a pretty well-known garden, uh, there is a group that actually uh, was excavating. And uh, when they excavated, they would plant sections of the soil. And the sections of the soil, when they planted it in the greenhouse, grew a tomato plant. And I'm working with them on this kind of super secret little project. But they gave me seeds to grow out. And this is what the tomato looked like in my garden. Um, I don't know the fate of this project yet, but compare that picture to the picture in the lower right and the picture in the upper left. So if that's true, then I have seeds of a tomato that's been around an awfully long time. Um, let's look at tomatoes, cherry, pear, uh, plum in yellow and red. So when we grow yellow cherry, yellow pear, red plum, we're growing tomatoes that actually are around even before the mid 1800s, well in, uh, into the 1700s. And you see uh, Fiji Island, which is extinct, large, irregular shaped pink tomato. But looking at the history of it and the places that it may have traveled, there's a chance, a remote chance, but that German Johnson, um, if you hear my dog barking, it's because something's going on outside. Um, sorry about that. Big ridged pink tomato. So Fiji could be related to German Johnson and the cook's favorite is extinct. Mammoth is extinct. Mid 1800s with flowers. Now these were hand-drawn, beautifully colored, the types of flowers that were popular in those days, asters, balsam, an annual that very few people grow anymore, dianthus, petunia, phlox. These, you think of these as all cottage garden type flowers, sweet williams, stocks, hollyhocks, mignonette, which used to come in all types of different colors and it's hard to even find it anymore. And it's a flower that was so fragrant that it was planted in window boxes um, when the horses would go and leave their waste in the street, having mignonette in the window boxes would help make the indoor air hopefully smell a little better. Pansy and coxcomb. How sad is this? This is a page from a mid 1800s uh, seed catalog, flower section, no descriptions, no pictures, just a list of lots of flowers. So now we're gonna skip ahead to the early 1900s and see what's going on. And I'm going to only highlight the, th the, the new things that showed up. And wax beans showed up. Yellow, yellow string beans started showing up in the early 1900s. Um, beets were still pretty standard. A couple that we can grow today are Crosby's Egyptian and Detroit Dark Red. They're some of the standard beets. New York Improved is still on the list. Um, this is a page from Burpee in early 1900s, and all of their eggplant were dark purple. Um, again, with lettuces, they're all green, and we've got Butterhead and Iceberg and Koss. Early 1900s, salmon flesh melons all of a sudden started coming in, but 
the main melons of the day were still Emerald Gem and Rocky Ford, which were green fleshed. And Rocky Ford is actually the forerunner of the Galia type melon. This is 1924, but I found this in a seed catalog and it's close enough to the early 1900s. But the, the watermelon moon and stars was actually available in a seed catalog for just a few years, the Henderson Seed Company. And here is a picture of Kent Wheely when he rediscovered it in the mid 1980s, growing in a farm very close to where he started the Seed Savers Exchange. Now, some of the bell peppers that we're familiar with are starting to show up in the catalogs. They tended to be big and oblong and thick walled and green, and they would ripen red. And they list Ruby King in this catalog. It was renamed World Beater. And I actually got World Beater out of the USDA section uh, uh, seed storage unit. And here it was growing in my 2000s garden. Really nice big bell pepper. Early 1900s, we have to return to tomatoes. And it was all about Alexander Livingston. And he did his work between 1870 and 1920 and put out a huge variety of tomatoes. And I love this page from one of his early catalogs where he shows that he had peach tomatoes and yellows and pinks. And this is just a partial list. And he liked to put this list in every one of his seed catalogs. And some of the varieties you see here are still available to grow today, such as Paragon, Perfection, Golden Queen, Favorite, Beauty, Stone, um, Gold Ball, Buckeye State, Honor Bright, um, et cetera. And Mike Danton and I, Mike of Victory Seeds and I, were hunting seed, uh, seed collections to try to recover. And we found 90% of the Livingston varieties and they can be grown today. Every now and then you'd find really cool varieties that I rescued, such as this one. Uh, Ferris wheel, which the Salzer Seed Company released in 1894 and is one of my favorite tomatoes. Got that out of the USDA collection. And here it is growing in my 2018 garden. I actually grew it in Hendersonville um, last year and absolutely loved it. And then I, I found a few more famous old tomatoes hiding in the USDA collection as well. And they're now listed by seed companies such as Isbell's Golden Colossal from 1918. And there it is uh, growing in my garden in Raleigh. And a tomato that a lot of people have contacted me about, Winsall, because when I taped the Growing a Greener World uh, session with uh, Joe Lample back in 2016, I opened it with a story about an elderly man who was so shocked that I was selling Winsall tomato plants at the farmer's market. And here it is in the page where it was introduced. And here it is uh, growing in my garden. Early 1900s was all about flowers such as asters, carnations, hollyhocks again, mignonette, nasturtium. What's interesting is sweet peas really hit their stride right around this time. And in fact, they would sell uh, 115 different sweet peas and they would have them by different colors, so 10 different blues and 15 different reds, whereas now if you were to look at sweet peas, you can only find blends. Mid-1900s, this book is one of the books that really triggered my love of gardening, Crockett's Victory Garden. He had his TV show on PBS, and he was a, a huge influence. Now the seed catalogs got a little bit more boring looking because a lot of them just had black and white catalogs. Now the move was to bush from pole beans and the effort was to make them stringless so that when you pick them and want to cook them, you didn't have to pull the string. Um, beets, what can I say? Mid 1900s, red still predominates. Mid 1900s, black and purple eggplant, no Asian types, no whites, no pinks. Mid 1900s, lettuce, vastly green. Simpson, Grand Rapids, and Slow Bolt are all available to grow today. Melons, um, salmon fleshed now predominate. So we've now made the switch from the green fleshed melon to the salmon fleshed melons. And uh, I think the majority of the seed catalogs 
at that time carried those. And then for peppers, the only new things were Hungarian wax and Golden California Wonder. Otherwise, it was kind of the same old stuff. This is important because here is the photograph. Here is the page that flipped the paradigm on gardening from open pollinated and being able to save seeds and developing varieties that could become heirlooms to hybrids. This is the 1949 Burpee catalog, Burpee's Big Boy. And um, this was a big seller for them. It was really popular. It was the time of the Victory Gardens. And once Burpee hit gold with this, the vast majority of seed companies then just put all of their efforts into developing new hybrids. As far as mid 1900s with, fl with flowers, again, Crockett also put out a book called Crockett's Flower Garden, and that became hugely influential. Um, the covers of the catalogs were really attractive. Um, these are the types of flowers that were popular in the mid 1900s. Sweet peas were in the decline. In fact, whereas you could get 100 or 150 different types 50 years prior, now you could maybe get five or 10 types and they were predominantly mixes. The big things were petunias and zinnias. Snapdragons and impatiens were really taken off. Marigolds really took off. This is the sad thing. The older the seed catalog, the more the seed companies went into the effort of creating separate colors for any given flower. So you could get um, yellow marigolds, you could get 10 different types, etc. cetera. The, the whole advent of the mixes, so you want to get the petunia mix, eight different colors. And uh, I just liked it when you had the choice of buying the mix or the separate color better. So now here we are today. And uh, because of the Seed Savers Exchange, because of all of the seed companies that emerged because um, of all of the heirlooms that were saved by gardeners all over the world. Look at, this is a bowl of the beans and we're not even looking of course at the pods, which can also be all different colors. But the diversity in the seed color with beans is often the attraction to a lot of people. And the fact that bean colors are so distinct is often a way to tell if you have the authentic variety or if you have a cross, you grow a bean and you know what the seeds were like when you planted it. And if the seeds in that bean come out differently, then you know you have a problem. Look at what we can now do with beets. And um, the red beet has been added to with, by the Chiogia, which is the one that when you cut it, it has the white and red bullseye in between. We've got golden beets of different hues. We've even got white beets. We've got beets that have very dark reddish green um, foliage. And so the whole thing about cooking with beet greens has, has become a thing. And beet greens are one of our favorite greens. And if I look at some of the recent uh, Johnny's catalogs, the efforts with beets seem to be making them smoother and um, better flavor. Beets are one of those unusual vegetables that tend to be a love-hate thing. Uh, they produce a substance called geosmin, and it's the same substance that if you walk outside in your garden and it rains a little bit, it smells earthy. That chemical is present in beets and gives them that earthy taste that some people don't like very much. We've, we've found some beet preparations that we love that minimizes uh, that geosmin uh, funky character. And one of the biggest offenders we found is with Chiogia the white red uh, zoned one, beautiful beet, uh, but it's the earthiest one of the ones we've eaten. Today's eggplant, and these are all from my garden. Some of these are varieties that I've developed by dehybridizing, taking hybrids uh, uh, from catalogs that I purchased, saving the seed and just see what the diversity looks like. All, uh, everything except the green with lavender striped one at the top came from the hybrid Orient Express. Uh, the one at the top came from the bees crossing uh, Casper with um, something, probably a black one because I've gotten all kinds of different colors. But now eggplants have been discovered and there are all kinds of different shapes, sizes and colors. And uh, I think using them in different ethnic preparations has helped uh, with the increase in popularity 
And lettuce has seen, just seen an incredible explosion and all kinds of different colors that people are growing. Now, lettuce to me, homegrown lettuce to me is the thing. It's sweet, it's tender, it's delicious. I've not found, and I've grown a lot of different colored lettuces, but I've not found a hugely uh, different flavor between them. What I've found is the hugest flavor between um, those that you purchase at a store and those that you grow yourself. Uh, but I like to, we like to play with our food. And so we grow lots of different colors just to make our salads interesting. Microgreens are a big thing. Um, it's one of the biggest uh, ad advances in um, farming is microgreens in specialty markets. And Johnny's, if you look at their lettuce selection, it's really clear that they have moved in to try to take advantage of that. Uh, today's melons. Um, we have the best of the old and the best of the new. And we have melons from all over outside of the US. We have green fleshed and, and orange fleshed and ones that are barely white fleshed. We have seedless watermelons. And some of these changes you may say are advances and some maybe not. Um, some people will say that uh, seedless watermelon will never taste as good as a seeded watermelon. And I will concur that the two best watermelons that I've ever eaten are Moon and Stars, and that had seeds, and Bradford, and that had seeds, but it didn't matter. They were worth the effort. And I've, I've had some seedless watermelon that have come close. There was a farmer at the Raleigh Farmer's Market that sold uh, 10 to 12 pound orange flesh seedless and if you hit it just right, it was one of the best watermelons I've had. But for the most part, not quite. Um, all of these peppers I grew in my Raleigh garden, and I just uh, spread them all over the floor one day to show the diversity. Um, and these really are all just different sweet bell peppers, including a lot of my dehybridization work on here as well. Um, pretty much all of the ones on the right, the different bells, uh, the lavenders and the yellows, are for me working with the hybrid Islander and then working over 10 years to see what kind of colors I could get out of it. Uh, we've got green pimento peppers and chocolate peppers and uh, the corno de toro frying peppers. And I don't even have a slide on hot peppers, but the range of heat and colors uh, to the point and the heat to the point of real pain, I just can't do the habanero types, but they're just beautiful. And I actually like to grow hot peppers and spread them around in my garden just to make the garden beautiful and colorful. And of course, tomatoes. So again, with tomatoes, we have just about all of the old and so many of the new and everything in between. And a lot of people have asked me why I've chosen tomatoes to focus on. And to me, um, there are three crops that have the greatest color and flavor diversity and have interesting stories associated with them. And it's apples, melons, and tomatoes. Now they're a beautiful eggplant, but really homegrown eggplant all pretty much tastes the same. It's good. You cook it and make wonderful things with it. Bell peppers, all kinds of different colors. They, they're either unripe and taste kind of like munching on the lawn, or you let them go to their ripe color and they're wonderfully sweet and you can roast them. But tomatoes, is where you get all of the nuances of tart to sweet and fullness to blandness and peachiness. With flowers today, as I said, even more so, there are less separate colors and more mixes. And even the types of flowers that have become really, really popular seem to have narrowed down. You know, if you drive around and look at what plant people are planting on medium strips or in their gardens at home, you see a lot of petunias. You, you now see the little cabriacola, which are the morning uh, um, million bell versions of petunias, which you can't grow from seed. You have to grow from cuttings. So um, I guess our companies create them by doing hybridization, and then the nurseries grow plugs out. Lots of impatience, lots of vinca. And that's where a lot of the effort is making different vinca colors, lots of daylilies. Uh, lots of interesting colored iris and lots of marigolds. But 
There's no mignonettes. There's no balsams. Um, you don't see sweet williams as much. Lots, lots of flowers missing. So where I wanted to go next um, is to talk about how to find um, some old varieties of seeds. Um, because this describes some of the ways that I've filled my garden up with so many unique varieties. So if you Google um, GRIN, Germ Plasm Resources Information Network, G-R-I-N, they have a network of um, where they hold seed all over the country. And some of their locations are for different crops, but you can search it. And that's how I found Ferris wheel and Livingston's Magnus and Peak of Perfection, where you think of a variety that you're looking for, uh, maybe something that a loved one had grown and you think it's lost, and you can put the name in the box um, and it will come up with a listing. And if it's available to distribute, it will say uh, 50 seeds and you put in your information and it's free. There's no charge. You just click the button and submit it. And in a few weeks, a packet of those seeds come in. And I get a lot of emails from people looking for particular varieties, some tomatoes, some other things. And what I'll often do is do a search and get the seed and then I'll send them to the seed. Um, hopefully lots more people are learning about this and we'll do the search. Um, old varieties of vegetable seeds certainly are in um, the great diverse seed catalogs that have popped up and, you know, Victory Seeds, of course, my friend Mike owns it and he lists all of our dwarf tomato project varieties. So I have a great fondness for his company Part of it is the historical accuracy that he applies to his trade. Um, his descriptions are very, very full. And I can say the same thing about Southern Exposure Seed Exchange. I've been friends with them going way back. Um, they're the company that actually released Cherokee Purple to the world back in 1993, after I sent them a sample in 1991. And the owner at the time, Jeff McCormick, grew it and called me up and thought Cherokee Purple was kind of funny looking and wasn't sure that people would want to grow it after they saw how funny looking it was, but it's caught on. And uh, my friend Ira Wallace uh, there now runs the show and they, again, wonderful descriptions and just a great selection. But I could go on and on, of course, you know, you've got Johnny Selected Seeds, which has not only um, lots of heirlooms, but also the newest and best hybrids been, being created right now. I've been a big fan of Stoke Seeds for, for many, many years. So there's just a lot of seed companies. But for me, the most important company of all is the Seed Savers Exchange, because without them, and again, I've, I've said it a few times, without them forming in 1975, we wouldn't have had the previous page with the two seed companies, uh, Victory and Southern Exposure Seed Exchange, because they wouldn't have had the heirlooms to be able to form their company about. So it was really important. Um, and they'll be celebrating their 50th year, 50 year anniversary in a few years. And I still think in the gardening public, they're still relatively unknown. And um, the most numbers of listed members in the Seed Savers Exchange, the numbers of people who are actually saving seeds and distributing them out was just a little over a thousand. And when you think of how many people there are in the world, that's an extremely low number. But it also tells me that few are really chosen to the, to the point of obsession to get involved in heirlooms and seed saving. But um, they, the Seed Savers has a great catalog where they actually sell a lot of different heirloom types, but they also have the exchange where you can- uh, Hi there. Uh, hello? Uh, could you mute please? Ah. Um, I think I sent out the wrong link and there are lots of Craig Lahuliers on this call, but I guarantee you I'm the only one. Um, now, this is a warning about seeds because we're talking about gardening then and now, and now we're talking about gardening now. Um, 
when there are lots of heirlooms being grown and there are lots of companies being formed, it doesn't mean that there are some mistakes that are happening. And some mistakes may be willful and some may not be. But I've got three examples here. And I'm not going to talk about the company, but the, the three things will illustrate. This is the right story, and it's about the um, introduction of Golden Queen, which is a variety from Alexander Livingston, but it's the wrong tomato because Golden Queen is not a stupefyingly brilliant orange. This is actually a picture of Golden Queen, which is a 1950s or so variety that was released by Stoke Seed. Um, so this is erroneous. Golden Queen is a somewhat oblate lemon yellow tomato, and uh, we have found the real one. This is an example of the correct story. I mean, sorry, this, this is the correct tomato, but is the wrong story. So Orange Russian 117 um, hails from the famous seed bank of the former Soviet Union. This tomato was bred by uh, a friend of mine, Jeff Dawson, who gardens in California, by crossing Russian 117, which is a variety that was in the Seed Savers Exchange, with a bicolor. He created the hybrid and then he worked on it for about 10 years and it was released to the public in somewhere in the 1980s. So this, this is a ploy that some seed companies occasionally through the years will use to create some buzz about a variety, but you have to be careful. And this is the right tomato, but the wrong history. So White Queen um, introduced by Livingston in 1882, um, Livingston never created a white tomato. White Queen was a variety that was released by, I believe, uh, Earl May or Henry Field in the late 1920s. Um, and I've actually found, found that and, um, by looking through the link that I'll show you in a little while. So. These are all um, very misleading things to do. And I, would, I really want seed companies to really try hard to find the correct information before they list things in their catalog, because everything has a name and everything has an appropriate story. And that story does not need to be elaborated to make a profit. So that's my, that's my little um, sermon for the evening. So now I just wanted to end by showing you just some great pages that I've found in seed catalogs over the years that exhibit how gardening has changed. This is from an 1868 Vic floral guide, and they would have a page in their catalog called Gossip with Customers. Um, I'm not going to read all of it, but the first, another season has passed away, and with it, all the floral beauties that made summer and autumn so attractive. Um, the past season in many parts of the country was rather unfavorable, especially for the smaller and more delicate seeds. Third paragraph, my customers, so far as I've learned from many letters received, have met their usual and most gratifying success. So isn't it great that the owners of a seed company that would probably get lots of letters, would look through those letters and collate them and do a gossip with their customers. Hyperbole. So what is used in um, today's seed companies to try, to try to create the buzz? And it could be, oh God, what would be the sexy tomato shot, the food porn shot? It would be adjusting the coloring, putting a, putting a, a tomato or a, a melon or something on the cover that was colorized to a point where you could taste it on your tongue or, but the problem is you grow it in your garden and it doesn't quite look like that. So here's an example in a Salzer's catalog and Salzer's was just a wonderful seed company uh, that was in La, La Crosse, Wisconsin from the late 1800s into the mid 1900s. And the paper was really cheap and fragile but they pack so much information to every page that those are the ones I really go back to and study the most. 
And look what the artwork is. They would um, have a cabbage sitting on a pedestal that was so big that some guy with a feather in his cap was on top of it. And everybody else was standing around ooing and eyeing. And at the bottom, absolutely sure heading, 999 out of 1,000 plants will produce a head. Hyperbole, exaggeration. Here's one of my favorite pages to do with tomatoes from the Mall Seed Company in 1904. And they called this the enormous tomato. And they had the yardstick up there, eight to the yard. And then in a picture below, they have this um, young lady. Um, she looks kind of like a doll that would have been popular at the time, I guess. Um, and she says seven of an, our enormous tomatoes make a yard. So we don't know if it's eight to the yard. We don't know if it's seven to the yard. Greatest of the main crop tomatoes, absolutely the finest large tomato. However, if you flip through Mall's catalog, they list lots of tomatoes, and every single tomato is the largest tomato without exception. So this is how they exaggerated. I love this. And then because you're doing art, not photography, you could make a cabbage field um, look like there was no possible way that you could get between those plants because, right, what did we say? 999 out of 1,000 perfect heads and the guys in his little carriage there and every cabbage is perfect and stacked up. And then I'm sure all of you who grow tomatoes, um, your tomato plant looks like that plant on the left edge, right? Um, you've got your vine, it's all nicely espaliered or trained and there's simply more tomatoes than foliage on it. So this is also from a 1904 Falzer, Salzer seed catalog. And the quote of the guy there is, well, well, seeing is believing. Uh, now Salzer's giant tree tomato, um, that type of tomato is known as uh, climbing triple crop or tree or giant tree. Um, it used, seeds of it used to be sold in Sunday supplements of the Sunday paper. And it really is either a large fruited tall, indeterminate. Uh, they can be potato leaf or regular leaf, uh, but they don't produce like that, of course. Another page that will take you back and, and make you envious for times is um, these collections. So 35 packets of the earliest and best vegetable novelties postpaid for $1. And if you know, you can see the pictures below for a 50 cent collection, but they're including asparagus, beets, beans, um, corn, two types of cabbages, and on and on. I love this um, woodcut from the Mall Seed Catalog in 1905 because they talk about the operation and how it all happens, uh, where the seeds are packed, the flower seeds, the mail room, everybody just um, busily working, everybody laid out perfectly, um, all efficient and just one seamless process, right? But this is this is what they wanted to um, give you the impression of if you order seeds from the Mall Seed Company. They got this, it's all in hand. And just um, for your amusement, um, these are garden, garden implements from the mid 1800s, um, the Garden King cultivator and the auto spray pump and Stevens hand fertilizer sower, the Apollo lawn sweeper. Um, just really, really cool. So anybody who's into genealogy or history, spending a few hours with these catalogs, maybe with a glass of wine, it's, it's really fun. Here's a peek into the early 1900s life. This is from a catalog where you're on the farm. Uh, you can actually see a ladder back there. So there's some kind of a fruit tree. Um, it looks like melons were grown here. Uh, there's baskets of melons on the right. Uh, there's baskets of tomatoes on the left. And, you can, and those look like they're shiny. So they're probably vine ripened. And anybody who knows if you stack tomatoes like that, uh, the ones in the bottom are probably not going to last for very long. And uh, we got some 
uh, eating going on and some sewing going on. So that's just a typical peek into early life. And our journey ends here, but I've got a few more slides, but this is Thorburn Seeds and I showed quite a few of their catalogs. And this is a picture um, mid 1800s in New York of the horse drawn carriage that is picking up seeds for delivery. So I'm a nostalgic guy and um, anybody who's seen my tomato talk has seen this. I garden because my grandfather Walter on the left uh, brought me into his gardens when he was, when I was three or four years old and my dad Wilfred on the right would bring me to park and show me flowers. So my garden journey started here with the first garden that we planted in my yard in Pawtucket, Rhode Island in 1962. Um, so I was six years old. My brother was two years old. Um, my outfits, pretty bad, but his outfit is worse. I'll just be thankful of that. I do have my two books and people who are interested can contact me by email if you want to sign copy. And the deal these days is you get both my books signed with about a half a dozen packets of really interesting seeds. So um, I shared a lot of information with you about how people gardened over the year. Now it's time for all of you on this um, on this Zoom, or if you watch the Zoom after, to go grow a gardener yourself. Find someone to share your passion with and just get them into it. So how to uh, get in touch with me? Uh, CraigLahulier.com has my blog, frequently asked questions, speaking events such as these, although I'm not as disciplined with those as I should be. Instagram is really better these days, or my blog, my project. Um, email nctomatoman at gmail.com. Um, I am on Instagram. Uh, in fact, I've left Facebook and Twitter a couple of years ago. So if anybody wants to catch what I'm doing in the garden, I'm on Instagram at nctomatoman. And I've just started a little series, Plant of the Day. So each morning I get up and I go out in the garden and take a picture and I feature something I'm growing. And then every Thursday, I um, go live from my driveway. Um, sometimes it's just after I water. Sometimes the dogs are running around the yard. Sometimes, like last week, I'm chased indoors by a thunderstorm. But I uh, usually will take people on a tour of the garden, and these are at one-week intervals. So you can see how things are growing, but I save them all. So you can go to my Instagram page to the videos tab and find out. Uh, if, you, if you don't get to watch them live, you can see them after the fact. And then I take usually 20 minutes to answer whatever questions pop into people's minds. And then for the last two years, I've been in a great adventure teaching a course, Growing Epic Tomatoes with Joe Lample. It's uh, all online, it's all self-paced, except um, everybody gets their whack at Joe and I for an hour every Friday where you can bring all of your questions and we hold a Zoom. Uh, that course will relaunch next March and next spring, there will be a new organic vegetable gardening course that Joe is going to launch. And I'll be having more about that on my blog and on Instagram, but this is the link. For garden history buffs, make sure you mark this down, take a picture of the screen. It's um, archive.org slash details slash USA dash nursery and seed catalog. It is the Henry Gilbert nursery and seed trade catalog collection. There are more than 70,000 catalogs fully digitized and searchable and you can search them by text you can search them by year you can look for what i typically do is i'll put in salzer and then have them sort it by year released oldest to newest and they are digitizing catalogs all the time so for the last thing that i want to say and i think um Joanne uh, mentioned this at the beginning. We've seen that through the years, uh, people garden particular ways and they varied their types of crops. Uh, different types of things grew in popularity and some ebbed and flowed. And I mentioned one of the last things I said was we are very lucky to be gardening now just because of the vast array of wonderful things that we can grow in our garden. However, 
we also are at a unique time in gardening history where we're having to figure out how to get things to grow well. Um, as an example, when I lived in Raleigh for 28 years, gardened in my driveway the whole time, the first year we moved in there, we had five days of not or above. The year we moved out in summer of 2019, we had 70. So what happens with temperature and weather has incredible impacts on your garden, uh, watering, feeding, disease, pest, what you can grow, what will set fruit. So one of the beauties of gardening is that it causes you to think on your feet and to develop techniques that work for you. Now, farmers, of course, this is a really big deal for them because they're growing food on large scales and they have to really make things work. But those of us who are home gardeners, our job every year is to start with a plan and then have that plan in our head and realize that within day five, that plan may be changing because the forecasted weather, you're getting frost that you don't expect or you're getting a stretch of 95 degree days you don't expect or you get more hailstorms. So gardening to me is always a thinking hobby. It's being in a bubble of peace and joy, growing your own food, listening to the birds, doing something healthy. And I hope I shared something in this talk that will pique your curiosity, um, reveal a little something about how your grandparents or great grandparents may have gardened and maybe make you feel thankful that you get to garden now, judging on all of the great things. So Joanne, that's my talk and I'm going to uh, stop sharing and just take some questions. Excellent. Um, I'm going to start with, can you just explain for our audience um, what a hybrid is? Absolutely. So what happens with a hybrid is somebody typically in a seed company has figured out that if I take the pollen from one variety and apply it to the flower of another variety, and uh, a fruit forms, and you have to actually take the anther, the pollen bearing bodies off that flower before you apply the pollen, because for certain crops, such as um, tomatoes and peppers, they're, they're um, perfect flower, meaning if everything goes with they'll self pollinate. So you need to remove the anther at just the right time, apply the pollen, a fruit will form the seeds in the fruit that forms are the hybrid. So if you grow sun gold tomato, the seeds in the packet that you buy are from a handmade cross in a greenhouse and that tomato forms and they process those seeds and they put the tomatoes in the packets. So a hybrid can never be an open pollinated or heirloom variety that you save seeds from and expect to get the same thing. Because if you grow out seeds saved from a hybrid, you'll get things that look like mom and dad and all the little cousins and aunts and uncles in between. Now you can use a hybrid to start creating a new variety. Um, our dwarf tomato project, we created hybrids by crossing tall growing and determinate varieties with dwarf varieties, aiming for the best color and flavor. And then we knew we'd get a hybrid that would be indeterminate. We saved seeds from it and we started selecting out the dwarfs Eight years later, we have new named varieties. Um, I could talk for hours just about this, but I think all you need to know is a hybrid is created by a handmade cross of two varieties that are kept secret. Nobody but the company that created it knows what the parents of Sun Gold are. So once a company takes a hybrid off the market, you'll never be able to grow it again unless you write lots of letters to the company and pressure them to create it again. So if you took those sun gold tomatoes and you grew them and you planted mm. and you saved those seeds from those sun gold, they would not be sun golds the next year? They would be sun gold second generation, meaning they were being very, very diverse. And people have been trying to do this for a long time, trying to get an offspring that was just as wonderful as the hybrid and no one is there yet. People have edged up to it and they've got some good tomatoes. I've gotten pinks, whites, yellows, oranges, reds, all kinds of diversity, but none of them have the flavor of sun gold. Uh -huh. So interesting. Um, the question is, is it a bad thing to grow a hybrid? 
awful. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, there are, hybrids are neither bad nor good. Let's say that a gardener is an artist that has a palette. Hybrids are just one of the paint on the palette. Um, Lemon boy is a wonderful hybrid tomato. Sun gold is wonderful. I wouldn't be without sun gold. Um, so use hybrids. Uh, maybe you have terrible disease for certain things in your garden and you need to stick to hybrids that have certain protections on them to be able to get a decent crop. So hybrids sometimes help people that can't grow certain things otherwise to get some of your crop in. However, what's um, really nice is to have an array of different things in your garden. That way you get to test the diversity because the diversity of heirlooms in terms of flavors, colors, sizes, et cetera, is always going to be greater than hybrids. There is maybe 10,000 different heirloom tomatoes where maybe there's 250 or 500 different hybrid tomatoes. Um, so I don't demean anything. I just decide what is it that I want to grow, test lots of things out, and um, if you like it, keep growing it. And if, if you don't, try something new. Okay. Um, here's a question. Do you have any idea as to why the melon switched from green to, green to salmon? You know, I don't, except um, there must have been a salmon flesh variety that created something different enough. And we know what we're like as gardeners. If we see anthocyanin tomatoes or striped tomatoes, if we see, if we see, see things that are different, often there is a subset of gardeners who like to flock to that. They like to be on the cutting edge of things. I would suspect a, a company sold an iron flesh melon. It might've been Tip Top. That's a variety that goes back into the 1800s. It was very tasty. And um, maybe an area of the country decided that their consumers uh, liked orange flesh melons or salmon flesh melons better than green. And that started to tip the tide. Interestingly, there are still regional preferences. So in uh, Arkansas and areas of the South, uh, pink tomatoes are favored over red tomatoes. And that preference goes way back into the um, late 1800s, early 1900s. So different areas of the country, different clientele develop preferences. And you know, we eat with our eyes. And I remember when I first started selling tomato plants, I could not talk certain people into buying anything other than a red tomato. Well, my family only eats red tomatoes. So I'd say, okay, I'll sell you, this red, sell you this red tomato, but I'm going to give you a green fleshed one. I'm going to give you a purple one. Within five years, they were back for the baker's dozen of tomato colors. My family loves the colors. We now play with our food. I want a purple one and a white one and a chocolate one. Grocery stores also tell us how to eat. And so if a grocery store has nothing but red tomatoes and green peppers, et cetera, et cetera, a lot of the non-gardening public is going to think, that's what I want to eat. And really, gardeners and chefs become the sharp edge of the spear. We become the cutting edge that then drives change. Invite neighbors in. Have a tomato tasting. It's, as you can tell, I love this because it's a fun process to take part in helping to get people to open their eyes and try wonderful things that they never would have thought they would have liked before. That's great. Uh, any tips to help folks identify heirloom slash open pollinated seeds? Well, if all seed catalogs, catalogs did the right thing, every hybrid would have an F1 in parentheses after the name. And in the description, it would say sun gold F1 hybrid. So you've got to look for that. And if it doesn't say anything, then you should be able to assume it's open pollinated. Now you'll notice that you never see hybrid beans in seed catalogs because I believe it's just not worth the cost to create them. So pretty much all beans are open pollinated. Mm -hmm. I think pretty much all peas are open pollinated. However, you will often see a PVP, meaning patent uh, variety pending. So you can save seeds from that and grow them yourself, but you can't save seeds then and sell those seeds. So you get into some really interesting idiosyncrasies on labeling, but if you don't see F1 hybrid, you should assume it's open pollinated. Now, Shepard 
uh, I think it was Shepherd Company used to have three hybrid tomatoes, Dona, Larissa, and Carmelo, and they were all F1 hybrids. But in one catalog, it wasn't clear that they were. And all of a sudden, Save Seed of the three started showing up in the Seed Savers Exchange yearbook, but they could have been F2s or F3s or who knows. So you got to be really careful about uh, paying attention. And if you have any questions on that, you can always email me because I kind of keep track of, you know, the buzz and, and what's on. And sometimes you have to just, you, you have to know the style of a catalog to know where they list this information and such. Um, and the melon um, question is followed by another question. How do you identify the ripest <laughs> melon in a grocery store with the best sweetness? Or is it... Uh, well, yes. if uh, if I could figure that out, I'd, I wouldn't be bringing in the occasional bad melon back to Trader Joe because it was flavorless. Melons are really hard. And for cantaloupes and musk melons, they're called slip melons. And if anybody's ever grown them, when they're ripe, you just gently press down where the stem attaches to the fruit and it just pops right off. And that's when you know they're ripe. But what I suspect happens is some of them get picked not quite at that stage, and maybe the the little stem is ripped off a little bit. But that's it. So when you're at a store looking at melons, what I like to do is just see if the stem can be depressed in a little bit where the stem was, and then smell it. And if it smells sweet, you have maybe an 80 or 90 percent chance of that being a delicious sweet melon. Honeydews are really, really hard. And I've, I'm batting only 500 with honeydews in purchasing them. And I've had some of the best in my life and I've had some that just go right back to the store. Watermelons can be really tough. And the, the wisdom is there's a place where watermelons sit in the ground that, that is whitish, but as they ripen, that becomes yellow. So if you look at a bin of melons, and have a nice yellowish spot on them, they should be okay. I don't understand the thumping thing, the flipping thing, or any of that. Uh, when you grow them, it's supposed to be that the little pigtail tendril closest to the fruit, when that dries up and drops off, you can pick your melon. But it's never going to be an exact science. And like I said, I'm a I'm a huge watermelon eater, and I've been um, I've been disappointed more often than I have been delighted. So what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Anything and, else? Um, I think we'll, we'll wrap it up with one more question. The Seed Savers Exchange, um, is it international? Like, so let's say um, you have um, a history where um, you had seeds from another country, from yeah. some grandparents, and, mm -hmm. um, could you, and you know the name of the seeds, and could you buy them on Seed Savers Exchange? Is it, is it, is it international? It, well, so there, there are several ways. In, in which it can be international. Number one, there's lots of people in different countries that are members of it. Mm -hmm. What's complicated that is increasing inability to ship seeds into different countries from the US and into the US from different countries. There has been some concern about different diseases getting in. Oh. And so there, there's kind of been a lockdown on that. One of the reasons that Petrina and I had to split the Dwarf Tomato Project to Australia versus the US is because she couldn't get seeds from me anymore and I couldn't get seeds from her anymore and we had to go it alone. However, uh, there are people from uh, different countries that participate. The other thing is a lot of what's listed in the Seed Savers Exchange has come over from Europe or Asia or South America or, or you name it and it's been so if the Seed Savers has been there for almost 50 years, it's got quite a collection. And um, if people are looking for particular things, they can always email me. I know the people at Seed Savers and you know, I can just ask them to search their data banks for this or that, and they can look for it. Um, family heirlooms are great. And Mike Dunton at Victory likes to work with me. So when people will send me a family heirloom, my goal is to get it in a seed catalog because that reduces the risk of it going extinct. And there's a fellow named Walt Swokla from Connecticut who sent me his uh, grandmother's tomato and I loved it. And I sent it to Mike and Mike and Walt talked and now Canselmo family heirloom is there. People are buying it and loving it. 
And Walt was so excited that he now buys packets and gives them to relatives for Christmas. So it can get people really thrilled to have a piece of your family heritage and being able to grow that in your garden. That is really exciting and encouraging. And I think we'll stop there on a very positive mo uh, note. Thank you so much for everyone for attending this uh, evening's program. Fascinating look at uh, our vegetables and our seeds and where they came from and where they are now. And um, thank you, Craig, for the wonderful talk. And I uh, hope to see more of these kind of talks in the future. My absolute pleasure. We'll okay. be taught we'll be talking. Have a okay. great have a great garden, everyone. Thanks well, thank everyone. You. Bye. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the RMA Speaker Program. Uh, before today's program, though, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about uh, next week. Next week, our speaker will be Carl Steinmetz, uh, Professor of uh, Landscape, Architecture, and Planning uh, at Harvard. His topic will be Urban Planning and Landscape Design. He will tell us about a new discipline that combines various professions, including uh, landscaping, architecture, and planning. But for today, I'll introduce uh, uh, Gerald Pollack, who will talk about and introduce today's speaker. Jerry? Doctors Without Borders is known for its humanitarian and dangerous medical work in conflict zones and in countries affected by endemic diseases. It was founded in 1971, and by 2019, was active in 70, 70 countries with over 35,000 personnel, mostly local doctors, nurses, and other professionals. Its annual budget has grown to approximately $1.6 billion. It is an NGO and provides medical care across boundaries irrespective of race, religion, creed, or political affiliation. Explicitly excluded in decision-making are political, economic, or religious factors. Its funding comes principally from private sources. Private donors provide about 90% and corporate donors provide the rest. In 2019, the organization won the Nobel Peace Prize. Our speaker today, Matthew West, has spent six years in the field with Doctors Without Borders, working in nine developing countries in Africa and the Middle East. He has had many roles pertaining to logistics and operations and has been involved with dozens of projects, including displaced persons, war surgery, burn surgery, HIV, mother and child health care, obstetrics, and management training. He will tell us about what it's working, what it is like to work with Doctors Without Borders. Matthew. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for having me. And, and Gerald, thanks. Thank you for the wonderful introduction. And I'd also like to thank the Retired Men's Association of Greenwich for having me this morning. Um, I have a video, a bit of a slide presentation I'm going to share with you all. And we're going to do this. And I think, I think you can all see my, my slideshow now. Anyway, again, my name is Matthew West. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here this morning. I actually grew up not too far away from Greenwich. I'm, I'm a native of New Jersey but I currently live in uh, New Orleans. And as Jerry mentioned, I, I worked for Doctors Without Borders for about six years. Um, he gave a wonderful introduction, but I actually have a, a brief two minute video here that also offers some more information about MSF or Doctors Without Borders. And um, 
who we are and what we represent. So I might show this to you very quickly here. Doctors Without Borders, also known internationally by our French name, Médecins Sans Frontières, or MSF, is an independent medical humanitarian organization. Founded in 1971, MSF won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1999. Today we have some 33,000 staff on the ground in roughly 70 countries. We work in communities affected by war, natural disasters, disease outbreaks, chronic neglect, and other crises. We treat people based on medical needs alone, regardless of race, religion, or political affiliation. On any given day, we assist patients who have no other access to healthcare services. Our medical teams can offer critical services such as surgery, maternal care, vaccinations, and mental health counseling. When people are forced from their homes, we focus on treating illnesses and injuries. We work to prevent disease outbreaks in refugee camps and other settlements. We treat malnutrition and the consequences of sexual violence. Our advocacy message is always the same. People at risk should be able to access health care and medical workers, even in active conflict zones, must be able to provide it. And life-saving medicines and vaccines must be affordable and accessible to the people who need them most. The ongoing support of our donors, together with the profound commitment of our aid workers, will allow MSF to provide independent and impartial assistance to people in crises for a long time to come. We know that the future holds many challenges for people around, Oops. around the world, but we also know what's possible when we go where we're most needed with the materials we need to deliver life-saving medical care. Okay. So again, Doctors Without Borders is an impartial, independent, and neutral medical humanitarian actor. Um, we're internationally known by our French acronym, MSF, or Médecins Sans Frontières, so which is what I'm going to use to refer to the organization moving forward in the, in the presentation here. Firstly, I'd like to mention that I'm not a doctor. I did logistics and operations for MSF over, for, for six years. Um, I worked in nine different countries, which you can see listed here, over a period of no, uh, nine missions in nine countries. Um, so what is logistics? Logistics is the essentially kind of the backbone uh, support structure for the medical teams to do all of the medical work. Um, this includes things like supply, procurement, power, water, construction, vehicles, IT, um, really kind of the, the, the backbone of the organization. Um, I can tell you, I, I can recall working in Nigeria once and I had an orthopedic surgeon who uh, was mending people's broken bones on a daily basis ask me how to use a toaster. And so I, and I, I actually got to say, uh, well, you, you don't have to be a surgeon to work a toaster. But anyway, the, the bottom line is it, it takes all types out there to, uh, to make it happen. Quite often I'm asked how I got into this. Um, I can tell you briefly in 2009, a friend of mine was telling me about uh, MSF and which I said, uh, that, that sounds interesting, but I'm not a doctor. And he said, no, no, they're looking for uh, people with ju the skills just like you have um, kind of logistics. So I was interested and I signed up to attend an information session by MSF and it just so happened that about um, two weeks prior to this uh, info session, the earthquake in Haiti happened. 
So I went to this info session, um, which was in Los Angeles, and the woman uh, was explaining to us how within hours after the earthquake, MS have had cargo planes full of supply and drugs and people on the way to, to Haiti to respond right away. So I was completely inspired and decided that, that I wanted to do this. And so I applied and I found myself some, month, some months later on an airplane for Kenya for my first mission, which was in 2011. Now, Kenya is a very kind of stable country in East Africa, which is pretty typical for first missioners to go to somewhere that's not a very high security context. Um, so I was working in a town called Homa Bay in Western Kenya. I'm not sure if you could see my cursor, but anyway, it's right about here. Um, the, this was an HIV and tuberculosis project, and I was to be the new logistics manager for um, a, a period of nine months. So I was working in this hospital here. Uh, this was actually a Ministry of Health hospital uh, where MSF was responsible for all the HIV and tuberculosis activities and the health department was responsible for everything else. And this is, it's actually fairly common that MSF would um, work side by side with the Ministry of Health as a partner. So we built a huge clinic in this hospital for the education and treatment of HIV. I was one of six international staff in the project with over 150 local national staff. Now, this is also very common that the vast majority of the uh, people MSF has working in any given project comes from the country and region where we're working. Um, and this is a very, it's critical to the success of a project because the national staff, they speak the languages, they understand the customs, um, they're really the link to the community that we're serving. So about 90% of all MSF staff in the world are um, local national staff. We ran the tuberculosis ward in this hospital now, uh, TB is a highly infectious disease, but um, curable with proper treatment. And we were treating about 200 people for tuberculosis and multi-drug resistant tuberculosis in this project. Um, we were treating much more than that, actually. We, we, uh, we were treating um, a lot of people uh, for HIV and TB. Uh, and it, it, in reality, we had over 10,000 people on uh, life-saving antiretroviral drugs, or ARVs, um, for HIV. So again, I was the, the logistics manager in this project, which once again is uh, kind of in charge of the daily operate, daily runnings of the project, which is uh, supply, power, water, construction, vehicles, et cetera. I had a team of about 30 guys, which included uh, watchmen, drivers, uh, mechanic, uh, logistics assistant, storekeepers, um, we had a lot of construction projects scheduled for that year, which was a good fit for me because I had a very um, broad construction and technical background. Um, doing construction in uh, MSF pretty much means you're the architect, the engineer, the contractor, and the inspector all in one. We also did a lot of outreach. We were supporting about eight um, smaller health facilities uh, in the rural region around this town. Um, this is all HIV and tuberculosis support. In this photo, you can see some uh, a pharmacy we built for one of these outreach centers um, out of shipping containers, which was kind of a creative solution we had to a problem and also kind of exemplifies that it doesn't always have to look pretty uh, in order to be functional and work. Um, 
Uh, waste management is, is always a priority for MSF. Here you can see a medical waste incinerator that we were building for one of these small uh, health clinics. And I had the privilege of working with this really amazing team. So once again, this, the, 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 the majority of the staff in this project were national staff um, who took a lot of pride and passion actually in their work. You, you can imagine that um, in this region, the, the infection rate was about 30% of the population had HIV. And so with an infection rate like that, uh, you can imagine that uh, basically all of these people have friends and family who are affected by uh, this HIV epidemic. And yes, that is Sasha Obama's face on the back of a bus. I interestingly enough, this is the, uh, where I was, was the Luo region of Kenya, which is where Barack Obama's father came from. Uh, his grandmother lived in a mud hut just about 30 miles away. And something I didn't know, but um, in the Luo tribe, uh, effectively, everyone's last name begins with the letter O, which made filing all of this alphabetically actually quite challenging. Anyway, um, MSF, we're still working in Kenya. We're still doing HIV work uh, in Kenya and um, all over the world. We have about 250,000 um, HIV positive patients worldwide who received their life-saving drugs from an MSF facility. So I was in this project and here you could see Homa Bay uh, right on Lake Victoria. I was there for about nine months. And um, but at the end of this mission, I was hooked and I knew that I wanted to go back. So my second mission, MSF sent me to South Sudan. And I'm using my cursor, I, again, I'm not sure if you could see my cursor, but this is Greater Sudan here. And um, Sudan, in a very simplified uh, explanation, has, has been going through a, effectively a 70 year conflict. Um, it has a very long and complicated history. You have, um, many different ethnic groups there, different religions, um, different political ideology, and a very, very large reserve of oil in the country, um, which is actually turns out the perfect recipe for a 70 year conflict. So in 2011, um, South Sudan highlighted here became an independent country. Um, at the time, so I, I, I traveled there in January of 2012. And my cursor is right, um, right about here. There was renewed fighting in the southern part of what is now North Sudan. Um, so this fighting was forcing people from their homes to flee over the new border of South Sudan into a newly forming refugee camp um, called Yida. And so I was I was sent there to work with uh, with MSF in this in this new camp for displaced persons. So this is an aerial shot of Yida in 2012, which at the time was about 20,000 people. This is a very remote uh, region in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, Again, these people fled their homes, uh, mostly because of aerial bombardment from the Sudanese government. Um, they fled their crops, their livelihood, and they uh, crossed over the border into South Sudan uh, into this newly forming refugee camp. So we have a very large influx in, in, of refugees coming in. Um, MSF has the ability to respond to something like this very quickly, primarily because of our independent funding. So what do I mean by that? Um, the vast majority of our don uh, donations come from private donors, as opposed to large institutions or um, grants or something like this. 
This gives MSF the flexibility to respond very quickly and, and more importantly, I think, to adapt to as things are changing in the context on the ground. And so what we saw on the ground here was a camp that was quickly becoming overcrowded with uh, limited access to latrines, showers, uh, clean water, and healthcare. In this photo here, these are people uh, lining up to collect water from a shallow water um, hand pump. So in response to these needs, MSF began to immediately set up this small field hospital. Um, in the capital of South Sudan, which is called Juba, we have, uh, we have what's called emergency preparation stock or EPREP. Uh, so this is, these are things like logistics supplies, drugs, tents that we can deploy very quickly to respond to some sort of crisis. So again, this is a very remote region uh, where we have to essentially fly in everything. And here you can see us unloading a small generator into the back of the world's oldest pickup truck. <laughs> um, when you're flying in all your supplies, you, uh, you're constantly considering weight, uh, how much things weigh. And we want to utilize uh, local materials as best and effectively as we can. So we built, th these are just some straw huts that we were living in. I was living in one of these structures while we were out there, just a simple grass hut. We also built our first pharmacy out of straw sticks and plastic sheeting, which was a good temporary solution, but but not a long-term uh, plan because the daily temperatures here were well into the 120 degrees, um, which is not a good environment for our drugs. So we used, um, again, kind of tapped the local knowledge and started making bricks, uh, sun-dried bricks, and built a pharmacy right on site. We take security very seriously in MSF. This was an active conflict area, and we had um, uh, the camp had previously been bombed by the Sudanese government. So on the right, you can see foxholes that we had dug out of the back uh, of, uh, these are patient wards, these tents. And the photo on the left, this is me standing in front of a makeshift um, bomb bunker that we built that also served as our office. Now the bunker was, it was super uh, dusty and dirty. And um, we only had one computer that we could share between all of us uh, with, with a satellite connection for internet. And the computer got so much dirt inside it that the space bar stopped working. So we had to start all of our emails with, you know, I don't have a working space bar right now. Um, because you look really professional when you're sending emails to the Capitol uh, with all the words smashed together. <laughs> but anyway, um, meanwhile, we're running. Uh, the, and so again, this is, we're just doing basic primary healthcare in this, um, uh, in this camp here. So these are very simple things like uh, vaccination, um, treating malaria, diarrhea, malnutrition, um, respiratory infections, all things that are actually very easy to treat, but can be fatal if, if they go untreated. I like this photo here. It kind of uh, demonstrates that, uh, you know, in MSF, the vast majority of our patients are actually women and children, about 70%. So, after three months of setting up this hospital in this uh, war-torn refugee camp, my, my mission was coming to an end. I was getting on an airplane to head back to the capital where I was looking forward to a real shower and a cheeseburger. Sitting next to me on the plane was a boy of about eight years old uh, with his father. And they had walked for about a week to get to our um, health facility. The boy had a massive infection on what was remaining of his um, hand. 
because he had he had blown off a, about two weeks earlier he had he had blown half of his hand off playing with an unexploded device such as the one uh, pictured on the right here so on the right this is a this is a cluster bomb um, typically it's it's like an old Soviet weapon that was uh, used by the Sudanese government it's designed to kind of open in the atmosphere and rain uh, small bombs all over the place. Um, and quite often they just don't deploy correctly like this one did. And so these did not explode. And now you have these silver balls that's kind of shiny balls that are attractive to children. And they play with them and they, they detonate. And this is unfortunately an all too common uh, story in this uh, region here. So I'm sitting on this plane next to this child and um, this young man, and and um, I'm thinking to myself, man, I've you know I've really had a privileged life. Um, you know, I I didn't grow up in war like like these people are. Um, I never had to walk a mile to collect drinking water from a muddy puddle that was shared by livestock. I never had to wonder if our crops was going to be enough to feed all of us for the year because the markets are empty and we don't have any money anyway. You know, and I'm, I'm thinking about all these things because these were things that I witnessed out there and I was feeling uh, grateful for my life. Um, and also I was feeling gratitude for MSF because I'm quite sure um, if we were not there, uh, this boy would have lost his life. Now, we, we were not able to um, treat his infection in our small field hospital, so we were actually flying him to the capital to have his hand amputated, um, which it was. And so he, he went to the capital and he lost his hand, but he did live. So South Sudan is uh, one of the poorest, least developed nations in the world. Uh, there's still ongoing conflict there. Um, routinely, year after year, this is one of MSF's largest operations in the world. I think we typically spend about $100 million a year for programming in South Sudan. Now, following, um, following South Sudan, MSF offered me a couple missions in the Syrian context. This was, would be in 2013-14. So in March of 2013, the conflict in Syria was entering its third year, and they offered me a mission to be one of the logistics coordinators for, um, for its operations in the Idlib province, which is right around here. Um, MSF had operations all over the country, but the section I was working for was responsible for this region. And right in that region alone, we had mental health care programs for Syrian refugees in Turkey. We had a number of water hygiene and sanitation programs for uh, refugees in camps along the Turkish-Syrian uh, border. We had a very large outreach program where we were supporting a lot of health structures in the region with supplies and drugs. And our two big projects were two trauma surgical units that specialized in severe burns. So again, we started in the region um, doing kind of war trauma surgery. We noticed, uh, observed that there was a gap and a need for burn management. So we quickly adapted and became the referral hospital in the region for, for burn care. Um, burns are, are it's a fairly technical surgery that requires a hyper sterile environment, uh, which is a difficult thing to achieve in a conflict area, but something that MSF is able to, to do pretty well. Now, um, Working in Syria admittedly was, was about the most challenging thing I've ever done. Um, and not, challenge, not just because we're, we're running this very technical surgical program, um, but the context was uh, changing very quickly all the time. There was a lot of different military and armed actors in the region. 
and there was a, a very high level of risk operating there. So I can try to briefly describe for you um, just like a typical day um, working in this project. So I was one of about 12 to 15 international staff um, living in a three bedroom house. It was about a 70 yard walk to the hospital, which you see pictured here. Now the, um, because of the security nature of this project, the only place most of us were permitted to go was either the house, the hospital, or that 70 yard stretch of road. That's all you saw. You weren't, uh, we weren't permitted to go anywhere else without any, some sort of approval from our project coordinator. So in the morning, I would wake up, I would walk the 70 yards to the hospital, I'd come in the front doors here, and I would sit down and have tea with uh, some of the watchmen and drivers. And what I'm doing is kind of connecting with them and trying to gather um, security information from people I know and trust in the region there. Um, they are expressing concern to me this morning uh, because two of their Syrian colleagues have disappeared two weeks ago um, with no word. And this was unfortunately something fairly common, typical happening, uh, because the Syrian government was uh, detaining and reportedly torturing and killing uh, people who were working in medical structures on the uh, opposition side of the conflict, which is where we happen to be working. So um, we have about 30 patients in this hospital. Um, on this particular morning, the, the OT team actually invited me to come in for, um, for a surgery, which I had never witnessed before. So I scrubbed and put on the gowns and everything. Um, inside the operating theater is an anesthetist, a surgeon, a few nurses, and a man lying on the table with third degree burns covering most of his legs. Um, and so they're, they're performing a graft surgery. They're taking good skin off of his body and grafting it over his wounds. And this is, this is something that this patient has to go through many times. There's, there's numerous operations like this with, um, uh, a lot of physical therapy in between. It's a very long process. And this is something that our operating team um, does tirelessly every single day. Um, I admittedly only lasted about 15 minutes because I, I, I think I had seen enough and, um, and I had a lot of work to do just to keep the daily runnings of the hospital going. So at some point later in the day, we receive um, an ambulance arrives from one of the health structures that we are supporting closer to the front line. They're bringing us uh, a burn patient. Um, we bring the patient inside, and usually what we would do is uh, fill this uh, the fuel tank of this ambulance and um, maybe give them some medical supplies to take back to their um, health structure near the front line. And the driver, I, you could just tell by the look, the kind of pale, glazed, glazed over look on his face that uh, how things were going on the front line. Um, anyway, he thanks me and gets back into his uh, bullet riddled van and drives off. I then receive a phone call from my assistant that our waste incinerator, which is located in a different part of town, um, has been blown to pieces because some people with a 500 pound gun mounted on the back of a truck was using it for target practice. So I said, okay, I guess we just have to build another one. As the day's winding down, I am, uh, I'm leaving for the day and I see our watchman kindly asking a couple of soldiers to leave their guns and grenades at the door before they go in to visit one of their friends um, because we don't allow weapons into any of our hospitals or vehicles. Um, so these two soldiers, they were reluctant to comply, but they, they did um, finally leave their guns. So after dinner that night, the um, 
myself and the other international staff were sitting around playing cards and we receive an emergency call because someone had just just come to the hospital with um, 90 uh, third degree burns covering about 90 percent of their body and um, and the patient was that he was conscious and asking us how he how he was doing and if he was going to make it and honestly all we could do for him in this case was try to make him as comfortable as possible and assist him with getting in contact with his family because the reality is um, even though we're we're saving a lot of people out there every day uh, we just can't save them all so I woke up the next morning thinking I need to call home. Um, I, I actually had not told my parents that I was working in Syria. I, I had gone on mission to Turkey and they were under the impression I was working in Southern Turkey, which was partially true. Um, anyway, I decided I'm gonna tell them today uh, that I'm, I'm in Syria. Uh, I, I didn't want them to worry, but anyway, I decided I'm telling them today. So I called home and I explained to my mother, I'm in Syria, and kind of told her about, you're not going to believe the day I had yesterday, and explained to her what I just explained to you. Um, and then I, 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 but I told her, but you know, mom, I, I feel safe. Um, I'm working with an amazing team, and we're saving lives out here. Like, we're saving lives. And there was a long pause on the other end of the line. And finally, my mother says, my goodness, Matthew. Well, are you at least wearing your sunscreen? <laughs> <laughs> and which is kind of humorous, but uh, you know, the reality is that uh, this work is, it, it, it's very difficult and challenging, not just for the people that are working out there, but for their families as well. So um, I spent about four months uh, working in this project and I went home for some much needed rest and then MSF called me back and asked me if I wanted to go back out there. And I said, absolutely, because I knew I was a part of this amazing organization that was, and we were really uh, making an impact. Um, so I spent a year working in and around the uh, Syrian context uh, with MSF. Um, in this photo here, I was, I was part of primary health care and mental health care programs for refugees in um, northern Iraq. I helped open a surgical obstetric and maternity program for Syrian refugees in Jordan. I was part of a primary health care project for a very large um, refugee camp in Jordan. And this camp was big. I mean, like 150,000 person big. In 2014, there was about one and a half million um, Syrian refugees in Jordan. This is a country that was of a, a population of about 7 million to begin with. So MSF, you know, we're committed to um, Syria. We've been, we've been pretty much been working there since the beginning. We're still working there. Uh, that burn unit I just showed you, I was there in 2013. It's still running to this day. Um, about six months after I was there, we decided it was no longer safe to have international staff there. We pulled all the international staff out, um, but we're still running the project with all local Syrian um, staff. So once again, I took a break and then decided it was time to head back out there. So missions number seven and eight, I was in, I was um, going back to Sudan. A few years prior, MSF had been running a primary health care program in kind of a war torn area in, in Sudan. Um, we actually had to shut that hospital down because the Sudanese government had targeted and bombed uh, the MSF hospital twice. 
Um, so I was part of a small team to try to figure out how we could reopen a medical project in that region uh, because this was there was a population of about 400,000 in a very remote area with virtually no access to health care whatsoever. So I was on my way back to Yida, which was where my second, my second mission was, the Yida refugee camp. This exploratory mission was to be based out of there. And the camp in, in the few years had grown from 20,000 people to about 70,000 people. And they even built a new terminal at the airport. Um, the MSF hospital had grown from about 20 beds to 70 beds, and now all the staff who had been working there for three years were some of the um, most qualified healthcare workers in the region. This is Khalid. He was to be my guide on this uh, exploratory mission, and we hit the road. And again, this is a very remote area. Uh, no electricity, no phones. Um, this is what one of the better roads looked like. And we looked at many different previously, um, these are um, previously government run clinics in the region, uh, which had long been abandoned since the conflict. There was still staff around that we were able to meet with, um, but they all told us the same thing. There's no drugs, there's no drugs, there's no drugs. Um, you can actually see on the side of this building, those are the shrapnel marks um, because this facility had also been targeted by bombing. We came across this gentleman, uh, his house had been bombed by, um, uh, also by the Syrian, uh, Sudanese government. Um, this was, he, typically they make barrel bombs. They're just like a kind of a homemade bomb in a 55 gallon drum that they roll out of the back of cargo planes to just kind of instill fear on the population. So after a month of running around, we came to the conclusion that there was totally a project here. There's health centers in place. Um, we just need to get drugs here. And we also need to do something about the water situation because many of the hand pumps in the area were broken. So some months later in March of 2016, I returned to this area to be part of this um, team to open this new project. And we opened a number of these uh, public health care units. This is just basic outpatient, um, outpatient treatment. We moved some of our uh, highly trained staff from the Yida Hospital um, to uh, these rural health centers. So now we have staff and drugs for treating very simple, basic stuff. Uh, we're talking about vaccinations, respiratory infections, diarrhea, malnutrition, malaria. We also started a program to repair a lot of these uh, water pumps in the area there. Um, as I mentioned, about 60, 65% of them were, were not working just because they needed some basic parts. Um, this hand pump you see here, it's actually called an India Mark II. Uh, there's, they're all over the world. There's hun literally hundreds of millions of people around the world get their water from one of these. Uh, we started a training center at the Yida Hospital to train medical staff. And this is not only uh, MSF staff, but also non-MSF staff to try to build the capacity of healthcare workers in the region there. And things were going great until the rains started. Um, this is a very logistical mission. It's a lot of what we did was just transporting drugs to very rural health clinics. And so this sort of thing became part of our daily life. Um, this photo on the right, you can see the car is actually being escorted by a tractor because you, you basically couldn't go anywhere without a tractor because you were guaranteed to get stuck. One time we got stuck at a river crossing uh, without a tractor. And um, to be honest, I had never witnessed a flash flood before, but I can assure you that it's real because this happened in about 10 minutes. Um, and guess who got to make that phone call? Uh, 
Sometimes I debate whether or not to show this photo, but you know, the reality is uh, work in the field is hard, accidents happen. Um, and we, if, believe it or not, we managed to fix that car. I mean, if this is not a Toyota Land Cruiser commercial, I don't know. Anyway, I can't say enough about the national staff uh, I worked with in this region. Uh, these people have literally been living in war their entire life. And I can tell you from firsthand experience that uh, squatting in a foxhole, feeling the earth vibrating against your back from aerial bombardment happening uh, near, nearby is not an easy thing. Um, and it's something they've been enduring their whole life, but you know they keep smiling, they keep laughing, and they keep working with pride and passion. Um, MSF, is, it's truly been like one of the most incredible experiences of my life. Um, this photo here, uh, this, this is a very typical kind of international team makeup for a project. Um, these are all people who, you know, none of us knew each other beforehand. And next thing you know, we're all um, out there working together, trying to make the world a better place. And um, you have people from left to right here, uh, people from Nigeria, France, Kenya, Japan, Nepal, myself from the US, Australia, and another woman from Kenya. Uh, I've, I've never seen anything like it. So on any given day, MSF, we have about 450 projects in 70 plus countries worldwide with about 50, uh, 40,000 uh, field workers around the world. And again, about 90% of those are um, national staff. This, and I didn't mention before, but this, uh, I, this slideshow was part of a speaking tour I did some years ago, so don't mind the 2006, uh, 16 data here. Um, but this is just to give you kind of a quick snapshot of what we do on a yearly basis, which is, uh, and these numbers grow every year. So what you see here is only larger um, as the years go by. Um, but again, yeah, just millions of outpatient consultations. Um, the births, the vaccinations alone. Uh, MSF, you, you know, we, we, we are a uh, global uh, humanitarian medical movement um, and we're growing every single year. And it's been a really, uh, a real pleasure uh, being a part of them, working with them. Um, and so if you're interested, feel free to check out our, our website. Um, we have a lot of uh, videos on there. There's something called Month in Focus. There's a new video every month that kind of highlights a few projects. Um, there's a lot of reports. Uh, there's information on how to become a field worker if you're interested, um, as well as how to become a donor. And I thank you all for your time. And once again, I'd like to thank the Retired Men's Association for having me. And that's it. I think, I think we're going to have some questions. I'm happy to stay and, and answer any questions people might have. Matthew, thank you for this remarkable uh, narrative and demonstration. Uh, we do have a number of questions, but let me start by asking, we, we in the RMA have numerous retired doctors. Could they play a role uh, if they were so inclined? Yeah, you know, I'd say absolutely. The, um, I worked with international staff of all ages when I, when I worked out there. Um, ironically enough, it seemed like the vast majority of people uh, who work in the field are either in their 30s or in their uh, 60s or 70s. Uh, we had a lot of people who were um, maybe semi-retired or newly retired who had always dreamed of doing something like this and, and actually went out there and did it. Um, so it is possible. And I would say if you're interested, um, certainly go to the website. There are um, 
I mentioned in the beginning information sessions you can attend and, and some of uh, well you all live in the New York area so the um, the MSF US office is in New York City and they have um, information sessions there periodically and there's also s sessions you can attend online uh, they just kind of give you more information about what it might be like to be a field worker what sort of things they're looking for um, I can tell you right now, in terms of medical staff, um, we are always looking for doctors with any kind of tropical medicine, medicine experience, infectious disease experience, experience with HIV. Um, what else? Uh, maternity health care, uh, OBGYNs are always in uh, big demand. In addition to nurses, midwives, and um, uh, and then there's always people uh, like myself, sort of non-medical support. So I did logistics and operations, and we also have um, people who do administrative work. Uh, and a question comes from Dan Friedland. What relationship does MSF have with Partners in Health? Ah, Partners in Health. Um, this is uh, Paul Har Paul Farmer. I believe. Um, to be perfectly honest, we don't we don't work directly, to my knowledge, directly with partners in. Well, well I, maybe I should I should rephrase that. I'm not sure. I know um, Partners in Health works a lot in Haiti, and we also work in Haiti. And in terms of what sort of crossover we have with them, I'm not sure because I personally have never worked in Haiti or been involved with with that mission. Um, I can say that uh, anywhere we go, we do make an effort to work with other actors on the field. Um, so we're not duplicating services and, and, and try to work together. You know, we, we MSF has this uh, a very independent image, which we are um, kind of independent. But that's to say we're not, uh, we don't want to work with other actors. So um, I'm sure we have some kind of relationship with partners in health, uh, but I'm not really familiar with what that is. But we always try to work with other actors on the ground. Don Conway asks, I have a left leg prosthesis that fits the leg above the knee. I want to give it away. My wife was going to use it, but died before she got into rehab. Can your organization use it? I will ship it to wherever you say. Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, I, I'm not sure uh, how to respond to that. I would, my feeling is um, I don't believe we take those sorts of donations um, in terms of like old prosthesis. Um, we do a lot of we, we, we do a lot of um, uh, we have a war surgery program in Amman, Jordan that's very large and it's kind of a, a reconstructive surgery, surgical program for um, people coming from the entire uh, Middle East region um, but this is again this is uh, we have a lot of very qualified doctors and and people there I think they just make their own prosthetics and I think we're even starting to get into um, using 3d printers to make prosthetics in the field which is kind of something new and interesting that I haven't seen yet myself either but unfortunately it's it's a it's a it's a very uh, kind gesture but I'm not I'm not sure we accept those those kinds of donations. I, I wouldn't know where to tell him to send them. <laughs> Richard Bartholomew has a question that offers you a suggestion. He says, instead of using the space bar, <laughs> you could have used underline or dash. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> what? You <laughs> you're hired, Richard, you're hired. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> His question is, how much does MSF pay for drugs? Do the pharmaceutical companies provide them at substantial discounts? Mm. That is also a very good question. Um, MSF, we, 
I typically don't receive uh, donations from pharmacies. Um, I think very intentionally so. One of the reasons being is that uh, um, pharmaceutical companies have a tendency to, well, they're out to make a profit and they have, um, we have experienced that a lot of drugs, a lot of people in these regions don't have access to drugs. And one of the reasons they don't have access is because of pharmaceutical structuring, pricing, um, and their willingness to, to share patents and, and, and even do research for um, diseases that might not make them money. Um, so we're, we're actually, we have an initiative to, uh, uh, in some ways we kind of uh, challenge the pharmaceutical industry for a lot of these things. And so to prevent some sort of conflict of interest and to uh, maintain our independence, neutrality and impartiality, we don't really accept donations from pharmaceutical companies. To answer the other part of his question, we do pay for drugs. We get a lot of our um, drugs are, are generic forms. And to be honest, a lot of them come from Indian suppliers, um, which, um, which can be challenging, just oops, uh, moving, moving drugs from India to a lot of these parts of the world. And, and, and um, it's a, the supply chain is, is impressive. Now on that same theme, I have read that MSF wants poor countries to be able to access low-cost generic variations of expensive medicines, and that this was opposed uh, by the Obama administration. Has there been any change in this uh, orientation of the United States government? Oh, that's a good question, and not one I'm, I, to, to be perfectly honest, I don't really know, but, um, my feeling is probably not, uh, because the uh, as you as as you all know, the the uh, pharmaceutical industry is a very large and powerful industry um, in the U.S., which um, that is unwilling to give up or relinquish some of their 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 power and um, uh, and the money they're making. Ira Kaplan asks. What are the security actions taken to protect the MSF staff and surrounding camp? Okay, that, that's a great question. Um, so security is, um, uh, managing security is a very, very challenging thing. And, and I kind of showed you a very broad uh, sort of sample of what different projects can look like. So Kenya, very stable area um, it, versus Syria, which was a, a very high security context. In all these projects and missions, we have people whose one of their primary jobs is to monitor the context that we're in, constantly ana analyzing it, understanding what's going on around us, what's happening in the country, what's happening in the region, we also make an effort to um, maintain connections with all kinds of different parties, especially in a conflict area, um, and constantly uh, sharing with them and, and reinforcing that we are an independent, impartial medical actor. We're not armed. We're not here to take sides. We take anybody in our hospitals. Um, and quite often that uh, neutrality was our um, biggest safeguard uh, to protect ourselves because if uh, you know you have combatants in in an area all fighting each other but if they all know that we can take uh, someone one of our own injured people to that hospital for treatment then nobody's going to mess with that hospital because they recognize uh, basically our value um, for everybody. Um, but that being said, we have people that analyze context. We have, uh, I mean, there's offices in Europe where there's people who are just all day reading the news, studying. We have, um, we actually have people who are like university professors that we kind of uh, 
get knowledge from just to sort of understand the history of the context, what's going on, what's going on now, constantly trying to understand better what's happening and, and maintain, uh, as I said, contacts with different actors in the area. To answer her part about the camp, you know, we don't, and, and here again, as, as an independent neutral actor, it's not really our responsibility to um, provide security for a population of people, for a camp, for example. Um, because then that might start to look like we are taking sides or do have some sort of political um, agenda. Um, quite often, a lot of these refugee camps are um, managed in some ways by the UN, the United Nations, uh, UNHCR in, in particular. And so they have uh, people there, quite often soldiers there who, um, and these are kind of international soldiers, the blue helmets you, you see in the news all, all the time. And so they're really the ones providing security for a displaced population. Hollister Sturgis asks, how do you handle language barriers among staff and patients? Mm. Um, definitely challenging. And sometimes we have to hire translators and we would have people on staff and that's their job. They just, they, they're a translator. They might, um, which is something I should mention that uh, like in the operating uh, theater, or on a medical ward, you have doctors doing their rounds in the morning or something with a translator um, with them the whole time. Um, and which can be challenging to find someone who um, has that level of translation and also that understanding of kind of medical vocabulary. And um, uh, it's challenging. And I would say, uh, personally, my experience is you learn little tricks about um, um, well, I guess just uh, about how you speak and asking questions and then maybe asking the same question in a different way <laughs> to see if you get the same answer, um, just to make sure that, that um, every, everyone's un being understood because communication is a big, big challenge, yeah. John Freiberg notes that amazing dedicated, courageous service on behalf of the needy. Besides financial donations, do you accept donations in medical equipment, such as wheelchairs, crutches, braces, etc.? And if so, how does one go about it? So that's a great question. And I think uh, kind of like the previous question, unfortunately, we really don't accept uh, those, those forms of donations. Um, and I think one of the one of the reasons is is uh, we have different medical programming. All uh, m the majority of the places we work are sub-Saharan Africa and the Middle East, which is just really far from the U.S. And so just the logistics of transporting things out there, um, uh, and, and in some kind of usable condition is is uh, something we've never gotten into. We've always just sort of found suppliers in those regions, um, uh, which, uh, which is actually, it, it's not so bad um, finding, uh, finding things. Like I said, we, 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 we get a lot of stuff from Asia. Um, in the Middle East, we, Turkey is, is a big supplier. I mean, a lot of these countries are developed. They have supply systems and they make, they make all kinds of uh, everything we need, really. But it's a wonderful idea. I wish we did do that. I do. <laughs> I just don't think we do. John Feebles asks, it seems that logistics is a major part of MSF missions. Are there many logistics experts like yourself involved in MSF? Oh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I'm proud to say that uh, uh, in the in the grand HR scheme, the the logs or the logisticians, we actually make up the largest amount of HR out there, um, because the 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 logistics to run these operations and do what we do in these regions is really really tremendous. Uh, the need and the number of people it takes. Um, the, uh, the, the supply, the everything. 
it's pretty impressive. MSF started in, I think, 1973 um, in Nigeria. And for about the first 10 years, it was just a collection of doctors going and trying to do work in some various parts of um, Sub-Saharan Africa. Admittedly, um, MSF had moderate success for the first 10 years of the organization's um, existence. And it was about 10 years later that they first started to bring logistics people in to do things like set hospitals up, get the supply they need, get electricity there. Um, and, and it was really at that point that the organization started to accelerate and take off because you, you can't um, underestimate the effort it takes uh, to build a hospital in the middle of nowhere and have electricity and oxygen concentrators and beds and everything you need. Richard Frank asks, what about prevention efforts, malaria beds, uh, malaria bed nets, HIV behavior modification, food hygiene? Uh, the, uh, these are all things we're involved in, yes. We, we, um, prevention is actually one of the, uh, I'd say in any project we do, one of, one of the main things we're doing, which again is a lot of logistics work. So quite often we do like mosquito net distribution um, because yes, the, the, the best way to combat malaria is for people to not get malaria in the first place. Um, so this, and this is again, all logistics work of trying, of, of sourcing uh, mosquito nets, for example, transporting them all to where you are and then distributing them to say like a displaced population within a refugee camp. Um, and it, this is the same goes for like latrines. Quite often we just have big latrine building programs in camps um, for proper human waste management, um, clean water. Um, this is, we do a lot of vaccination work. So we, it, we actually do a ton. We have entire projects just in vaccination campaigns where we'll go out and, and literally vaccinate like 5 million people in six weeks. Um, to prevent a meningitis outbreak because it's much easier to prevent something like that than to manage it after it happens. Matthew, the time has come to thank you for an outstanding presentation of an extraordinary organization. Um, uh, the, uh, the Doctors Without Borders are, are really remarkable for their achievement, the humanitarian work that is done in very perilous uh, circumstances. So thank you very much for having made us more widely aware of this wonderful organization. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me. And, and thank you all for attending. I'm not sure how many of you are out there, but, um, oh, 56, I see, okay. <laughs> Thanks again for having me and thank thank you thanks to the Retired Men's Association for hosting MSF.
Are you rolling? We're rolling now. <laughs> I am going to call to order the special meeting of the Darien Police Commission, 2,437th meeting. Uh, first order of business is acceptance of the minutes of June 2nd. There are only two of us. I will make a motion. Second. I assume all in favor? Favor. It's going to be quite easy. Correspondence, Chief. I have a thank you letter here from Chief White, my compatriot at the Monroe Police Department, thanking uh, the department for allowing Lieutenant Nick Aranzulo to sit on their uh, police lieutenant promotional process, World Board. Uh, that was on June 8th. Uh, clearly, I've said before uh, to the commission that this does give us a benefit for our supervisors to sit on other oral boards for other departments so we can kind of assess how our people stack up. <coughs> uh, I think it's a, good, it's a good thing that we do. We do it across the state, and when we need it, we sometimes get it in return. So we do get a benefit for having a ranking officer sitting on promotional processes to see what's good, bad, and indifferent out there in the, in the world of policing. I agree. As always, I think our folks stack up, and that's why we get a phone call on a regular basis looking for our command staff members to sit on promotional process with another Fairfield County and Wigan County agency. So well done for Nick, appreciate him being able to do that. I have a second thank you note here from the co-chairs of the Henley Happening. Unfortunately for the Henley Happening, since it's almost every year it rains <laughs> on the weekend, it's just, I feel bad for them, but you know. It's no rain date either. No rain date typically. They, they, we tried this year, we were gonna try to change the date, and we're gonna try to move it up to try to, so we were working with them as diligently as we could to get it a successful you know, weekend. So it says we, it was lovely to work together for a common cause despite the letter and your generous support of our efforts to change the day. It all worked out. And this is what I like the best. Your officers could not have been more pleasant. And we really did end up with a rather wet yet successful day. The praise and congratulations we have been receiving couldn't have happened without you both. This came to Captain Marin and myself. But the credit goes to the officers that are working the job, especially in the rain. So I'm glad they, they got it done once again. We'll pray for no rain next year. Uh, OK, department activity. Captain. OK, this report um, will cover the time period from June 2nd to June 29th. On June 16th, a 44-year-old Rocky Hill man was arrested for car theft. On June 21st, a 31-year-old Stanford man was arrested for possession of narcotics forgery and motor vehicle charges. We had three catalytic converter thefts, but new to these incidents is that two of them were actually taken from residential driveways during the overnight. And if I could jump in there real quick and just add that at least one of these, if not two of them, the residents heard noise but did not call the police. So wait a minute, so. If you hear noise in your driveway, there could potentially be catalytic converter thefts. Please do not go out and confront anybody, but make a phone call to us. We'll come check it out. If it's a raccoon in your garbage can, we'll be very happy to just clear the scene and return to patrol. But don't wait till the morning if it's something a noise like that that could conceivably be someone stealing catalytic converters. I think there was a recent incident in Milford where a resident actually got attacked by somebody and it was not a good thing. She should call the police. It's it's a your point. Significantly yeah. attacked and, and injured very, very seriously. So please call us if you hear suspicious noises in your driveway. <clears throat> Uh, we had six domestic disturbances that we responded to, resulting in two arrests, two incidents involving mail theft and or check fraud, the five reports. Uh, we had one attempted theft of a moped that was secured at the Northern Heights train station, one burglary of a motor vehicle that was left unlocked, two DWI arrests, two commercial burglaries, three vandalism incidents, five incidents that involved either trespassing or breach of peace. Unfortunately, two structure fires and two vehicle fires. Uh, seven incidents involving, I added this because it was a little unusual for the, this time period. Seven incidents, incidents involving emotionally disturbed individuals which required hospitalization. Uh, three incidents involving non-fatal overdoses, two of which involved officers administ administering Narcan due to heroin and or fentanyl usage. 70 traffic stops were conducted by the patrol division, resulting in infraction tickets and misdemeanor arrests were applicable. 95 false alarms, both residential and commercial. 18 motor vehicle accidents, five of which involved minor injuries and surprisingly, the majority of those this time were on Route 124, which is Mansfield Avenue. Um, 
And lastly, um, didn't make the, the cut here, but unfortunately we had a, an incident in which a Lyft driver that was um, taking a fare from Stanford to uh, undisclosed destination in Norwalk um, was attacked by the, the, the fare, and the suspect began stabbing the, um, the driver, and the driver made the choice to crash the car to uh, end the attack, and the suspect fled after stealing the victim's um, cell phone. Uh, unfortunately, we weren't able to let, locate the suspect after the incident. We used assistance from Stanford Police Department and their canine unit. Uh, and this occurred on the 27th at approximately 10.37 p.m. And we're not releasing any other information on it at this point, but it's an active, very active investigation by the Darien Police Detective Division. And we ask that if anybody has any information that could uh, assist in the investigation to contact the Darien Detective Division at 203-662-5330. Very difficult <coughs> Inside of court, certainly happened inside a moving vehicle, and the only nexus to their hand was they happened to be a couple hundred feet over the Stanford line when the attack occurred. So there is no real identifiable threat to public safety in their hand. That your car was coming from Stanford going to Norwalk and it just occurred here. So I have full faith in our investigative unit that they will be able to successfully investigate this. Probably have some updates as we move forward. And one last thing to add, because people were um, inquiring, the, the victim was treated at the scene and also transported to Norwalk Hospital, treated for non-life-threatening issues, injuries, and expected to make full recovery. So as you can see in our report, we have been fairly busy, right? We are not immune to the same things that are happening everywhere. And I know you don't want to probably hear me say it again, but five unlocked cars, five with the keys in them, we're almost batting a thousand on these, despite our earnest pleas and our PSAs and everything else on getting folks to lock their cars. So they're going to continue as long as the pickings are good and cars are being left unlocked here. Okay. All right. Um, Mr. Public comment. <laughs> go with no. Um, old business building issues update. Women's locker room, the pipe was fixed. Um, we still see some issues in communications with the heat regulation. Um, most recently, this past weekend, we had some issues in there, so um, Dave Sabini sent somebody down to check it out. Um, and we had a boiler issue this morning. Uh, looks like a faulty something or other down Carbon there. Carbon monoxide detector. Yeah. So if someone's coming tomorrow to check on that. Okay, he's on. On the HVAC Feels front. Feels nice right now. Yes. <laughs> on, the, on the HVAC front, I mean, 50 years from now, people will be looking at our minutes for our meetings, and they're going to say, wait a minute, this was 2012. Now, this one is 2022, and they're still talking about the same issue. Uh, as of late, I must give some a little bit of credit to our vendor and the DPW folks. If they are here on a regular basis. Somebody even made the quip that they thought, you know, automated logic just abandoned their van in our parking lot because it's here every day. It, do, it does disappear and come back. But they are, the guy was running some kind of new wires yesterday. They are still working through it. Well, he's, they're still showing up. And I think this is just an all byproduct and an artifact of a design and an installation issue from back a decade. I thought we would be done talking about it in 2022. Unfortunately, we're not quite there yet, but 2023. Hopefully some going to be our year. We cross the finish line. Um, okay. Um, any other old business? Nothing. Uh, new business. Favorite topic, traffic, signs on Brookside, finalizing the quantity and cost. So, um, John from DPW, DPW? Um, and I drove up and down Brookside, and if we were going by line of sight, traffic poles, it would be like 13 on each side, going north and south. Seems to be a lot of signage there, so um, we were thinking maybe six on each side would work. 
I don't have the exact cost. I put a um, question into where we put it from and um, just waiting for the quote. As long as we get a, a number that we're okay with, uh, I'll put the order in. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a number from your perspective. I'll give it. Yeah, and if we decide, we, I'm sure, can deploy them somewhere else if we end up, I mean, we obviously, okay. let's uh, try the minimum, see if it moves the needle mm -hmm. so that we're not over-signing everything, and um, I'll go from there. Do that. we want to make a motion just to approve the, up to 12? Is that? Mm -hmm. um, all right, I make a motion that we approve up to 12 um, of the, what is it, walk left, bike right, stay safe signs to be deployed yep. up and down uh, Brookside Road. Try to see if I don't remember the exact road. We'll make it the same as the other. So, yeah, uh, I second. Okay, there's no other discussion. <coughs> in favor? Aye. Great Island acquisition is me. This is um, going to be kind of short and sweet because we don't have a lot to talk about. But I did want to go as the chair of the Legal Traffic Authority LTA, um, and obviously with Brent and Kevin, um, we've been getting a lot of questions about what our role is and traffic. Um, so I just want to make a couple of remarks. Um, and then, obviously, when the official formal proposals come, it will get a full bearing. But um, if and when the town closes on Great Island, uh, clearly traffic impacts management um, is going to weigh significantly on any proposed public uses for the property. I want to assure people that the LTA, again, Legal Traffic Authority, um, is well aware of the issues um, in the area as it relates to traffic, not lost on us. Um, but we obviously don't weigh in um, with an actual vote until a formal proposal is in front of us. Um, but enough of people have inquired um, that I had the chief um, kind of weigh in with, and share some of his initial thoughts. I would have him make them, but he wrote them, um, sent them to us, and I thought they were excellent. So if you don't mind, I'm going to read what your comments were if you want to elaborate. Um, I know he's sitting right here, but I'd like to. Um, should the town acquire Great Island from both the overarching public safety and legal traffic, traffic authority perspectives, proper planning, engineering, and traffic management concerns must be at the absolute forefront of any prospective considerations. The public roadways in this area predate internal combustion, as do the roads on Great Island itself. The area is very well traveled by bicycles and pedestrians in addition to automobiles on most days throughout the year. The simple truth is that significantly enhancing any of the public roads in the immediate area from a state safety standpoint is virtually impossible based on land ownership rights and the geometric topographic features of the existing roadway system. There is but one way in and out of Great Island. There are but two ways in and out of the area on the approach or departure to and from Great Island. Collectively, we must all keep this at the front of mind in the years ahead. Should the town be successful in acquiring this parcel to maintain in the public trust for generations to come? Um, I, I'm not sure we need to elaborate on that. It's just clearly we are all cognizant of um, the area and um, the traffic implications. Again, as of today, there is nothing specific for us to weigh in on. Um, I contacted the first selectman, and I don't believe the town has undergone any preliminary analysis. Um, but we've had no discussions. Um, and I think besides my visit to the first selectman um, this morning, the LTA has not been contacted by any commission or board or elected official. So no discussions with us behind the scenes. Um, most of what we do is here in public sessions. So. Um, you know, in the process of their due diligence, we have not had any kind of off meetings that would not have, um, you know, been publicized. Um, having said that, we are always happy to answer any questions um, people might have. Um, we will stay on top of it, uh, answer any questions as they arise. Um, obviously, you know, when the time comes, do our usual thorough analysis of 
anything that comes before us. Um, but that is you know, what I had to say on kind of Great Island because there's not much else to say since I already quoted you. Anyone, did I cover it pretty well, well enough? Again, if people have questions or comments, I, I encourage people to reach out to us. Um, but right now, it's not really in our bailiwick. Um, it's not there yet. <laughs> I think it's probably coming. <laughs> Um, all right, traffic. Darien Road Race, September 18th, 2022. Last but not least, right? That's pretty quick, though. So that one's mine. Um, I met with coordinators of Darien Road Race, including Jan Sidel, uh, last week or two, maybe two weeks ago. Um, I asked her to be present tonight just in case the commission had any additional questions, but there's no real changes for this year. This is one of the events that's on our annual list that we typically approve. Um, in our pre-race meeting, or at least the first, we, we kind of discussed any potential changes. I uh, explained my concerns, which were very few and uh, relatively uh, insignificant um, from previous races, specifically last year. We've gone over that. I think we're all on the same page. And they were um, advised that one of the first steps is to get your, <coughs> your approval to close the road. It's going to be the same route. Um, they're also having the, the fun run that will um, take place before the main race. Uh, I worked this event last year and there were very little problems. Uh, their problems ranged from uh, cars still trying to arrive with race participants after the race had already started. Uh, but we kind of squeezed, squeezed them in as safe as we can. I don't think we had any injuries last year. Nothing um, of real note that we were looking at changing other than I think a course got changed a tiny little bit right before the race started. And uh, you know we, we made it clear that we need to be on the same page with that well in advance of the start of the race in the days leading up to the race. Uh, last year, there were 353 participants, is what you, I think, told us. And this year, I don't think it's capped. I mean, you tell us that it's not capped, but um, I would expect, you know, probably around the same same amount. Hoping more, actually. But You're hoping for more? Yeah. Okay. So typically, we will uh, put signage out, traffic advisories. Um, we, we use some barricades and cones. They have hired up to three officers to assist in the event. And different this year, we will not have um, Officer Isaac, who would normally lead the race on the motorcycle. So we may need to borrow uh, some assistance from the patrol. Yeah, yeah. But um, the number of attendees consistent each year, but more or less? Uh, they only kept check, they didn't have check all years, but there's one, I guess it was 650 in 2015. There wasn't one in COVID, so it's sort of like between 400 and 350 to 500. So it hasn't been huge. It used to be bigger years ago, but I didn't keep track of them. What's that? Room for you if you want to do yeah. it. <laughs> Definitely put me on the spot. All right. <laughs> are people going to, are they allowed to register day of, or is it all online ahead of time? I think the intention is for it to be all ahead of time to make sure that we can get the signs, the pickups, and everything that they did last year because it's so snow. Okay. Um, I, I, one of the problems that I witnessed myself last year was there was actually people trying to launch their boats on the boat ramp at Pear Tree Beach when the race was, when finishers were trying to finish. And racers were literally running around a car back into the trailer. So I asked if they make contact with the boat club and reach out to their membership, and that would be prohibited during the race time, yeah. But I don't envision any uh, complications. Uh, I think it sounds like they, they're getting their ducks in a row for this event this year. All good with me. So we may, we may want to put out some kind of further uh, advisory of the boat launch ramp because most likely that's not boat club members putting their boats in. Potentially, yeah. It's, it's well, it's in September, so it's either probably. It's they're trailering, right? That seems unlucky that someone would be yeah. launching September 18th. Unless it's a beautiful day, and they just—it was a small. There were smaller boats, so I don't think there were boats that were. Right, so they probably weren't members. Yeah. At, at least an advisory that we have a race going on here. Yeah. If you can help us out, we appreciate it. Um, no issue here. So we need a motion to approve the Daring Road Race. 
I um, make a motion to approve the Darien Road Race uh, September 18th, 2022. Second. Any other discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Well, it might not be our quickest meeting, but that's all we got. And it's a special meeting. We cannot add to the agenda, so um, we do have to schedule another meeting. We have our magic calendars. I have. Can we send everybody's folder? Yes, it is. I guess I don't have to put the Um. All right, well, we're already here on the 30th, so I think the 7th is probably not the 21st. 21st, I will be on a well, hopefully well-deserved vacation with my feet at the lake in the cabin. So you, you can certainly have a meeting. And um, how about the... Your cell phone works at the cabin. <laughs> Spotty. <laughs> Not that day. Um, I know I will jinx us. Do we anticipate that we would need a meeting sooner rather than later? So we should try for the 14th, or should we push it off until some later date? I'm not anticipating anything of super important I mean, coming Clearly, down we had a very short agenda today. The only thing, if we pushed it to the 28th, is uh, Officer Jarvis would be graduating from the police academy. Depending on what time that is, that she typically attends that. Yes, he should. I have no idea what time that would be at this point. Is that on the 28th? On the 28th. Of this year. Could be during the I'm day. Probably way on the 4th. Probably in the morning, I presume. Or One, two, three, four. I don't want to go more than four weeks, but um, one, two, three, four, five weeks. Summer? I don't know. I'm going to say the 20th. If Chief's on vacation. On the 21st. Oh, 21st, you're on vacation. Yeah, so. 28th. The 14th, the 14th I could do the 20th. I could maybe do the 28th, depending on what time they set the graduation. Where, where's the graduation? Meriden. You could be in traffic until 9 o'clock at night. Yeah. Kind of could we try maybe, maybe yeah. try to find out what time that so graduation would be? Oh, it's evening? I think they are. Would you say evening? Evening. I thought oh, there were oh, better or worse. I know like, we haven't done this before, but happy to do the meeting earlier in the day. As yes, well. that's in true. The morning, ten o'clock. We, we could certainly, we could yes. certainly do that. Um, we could, we could go uh, to the twenty eighth, and we could pick a right, time. Let's we, let's think about the twenty eighth and work on the time. Find out what time graduation is, and then move us around. We'll touch base with Kevin too, right? Yes. So, let's go. Okay. With that. We're done. done. Stop it! Who are you? Darianne is a nonprofit organization committed to helping seniors remain living independently. We keep seniors connected to the community.
own in Darien. Oh, I'm so happy that it has come into being. At Home in Darien has helped to make me feel very independent because I don't have to rely on family or friends. I was in recovery from open heart surgery. And uh, although my son lives at home, he does not drive. So I was really in assistance and there you are. There was At Home Darien. I could sing your favorite song, yeah, you'd sing along, you'd sing along. I could wrap you in your favorite clothes and kiss your face just so you know. But I'm the one who's got your back, now turn around. Hope and Darian is always there where you need them. You just have to pick up the phone and ask, and they will answer you with any kind of help that you need. It was so wonderful to have At Home in Darien available to help my family after my dad had his stroke. Uh, he ended up in a wheelchair, and the only transportation that we could get for him was through At Home in Darien. I went through numerous doctor's appointments and therapy appointments and exams, and at every turn, I would pick up the phone and call At Home in Darien and say, can you help me out on this one? And there was never a no, there was always, yes, we can. I drive for At Home and Dairy Inn. I love what I do. We take excellent care of seniors. We make them feel safe and comfortable. I am a volunteer for At Home and Dairy Inn, and I shop for an elderly woman in town. It is incredibly rewarding for me to feel that I am making a difference in an older person's life. Our volunteers at Home and Dairy Inn are really committed and enjoy meeting our older citizens. I have benefited by volunteers in Darien, uh, volunteers uh, who come and uh, do some of the things for me that I'm not able to do myself. Yeah, at home in Darien allows my father to, to still be independent and it also allows my wife and I to be independent in our own lives also, so uh, it helps us both in that regard. It was wonderful. It was such a peace of mind for my mother to be able to schedule the appointments through at home in Darien for him to take the wheelchair van to doctor's appointments, to physical therapists, and what I loved the most was just taking him out to lunch or to the beach and to see how happy it made him to not have to be at home and be able to get out into the community. Uh, fortunate uh, to live in Darien with such a wonderful institution as this uh, is, is available to us. I don't know of any other town anywhere that is so fortunate and I'm very glad to be living here. Well, I say gratitude is, 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 is the word for at home in Darien. I mean, we're fortunate in this community to have such a caregiving service. Thank you, home in Darien, very much.
So it'll be very handy to the people who live on West Avenue trying to get to the train, or even if you live up on Roten Avenue, very convenient. And then I noticed they did a lot of landscaping. How does that work if the trees die? The way it would work is uh, planning and zoning has in its approval a requirement that the trees be maintained by federal realty. They will have an on-site property manager. Uh, I'm going to reach out to get their name to you once we find out who it is, which I expect will be December, January, and they will be in charge of things like garbage pickup, plantings, making sure things look really good, publicly owned company, so I want to make sure it's their uh, tenants, both commercial and residential, are very happy. Well, the feedback I've received from the project is people are really, um, really excited about it. Yeah. So It's nice to see the new um, facades come up on the building, like it really kind of brings it all together to see the architecture and how they tried to really keep it within the quintessential it, Darien. Yeah, I, what I like is, West Avenue is very different than it used to. The people on the other side of West Avenue just used to look at the roof of Walgreens. Yep. Now they'll be looking at some landscaping. The sidewalk on West Avenue I think is a huge benefit. Just makes everything more walkable. And it looks very big now. I think once it's dressed up, landscaped, tenants are in, it should be very exciting. Last but not least, downtown Darien, the Corbin District project. The first building, which is what our long timers call the Tibbetts building, right? Mm -hmm. Tibbetts was there for a long time. That's now 35 Corbin Drive. We expect completion in September, 90 days. Uh, there's two retail spaces there, and there's four apartments upstairs. And I think uh, Mr. Genovese, who's the principal at Baywater, has leased those up. Uh, the middle building, which is 15 Corbin, uh, and the front building, which is the former gas station at 1040 Post Road, which will soon be Bank of America moving down the street. Those will be done in January to March 2023, and the upstairs apartments a little less than a year from now. And he's already renting and leasing apartments. Phase two is the other side of Corbin. So one day, you will likely see a lot of people with stuff in their hands walking across the street into their new space, getting out of their old space. <laughs> and it's expected that in about a year from now, that whole post office, Corbin building, Legos, uh, d d d all the way down will be a big, hole in the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, so that is going to be a big project. There are, on that side of the street, I think six buildings of various sizes and heights. So that will take a little while. That's going to take a couple of years to get work their way through. But the good news is Mr. Genovese is an experienced builder. He's pre-leased them. He has tenants in mind. and. We've seen his track record of getting projects off the ground. So we are excited of many tenants he's going to bring. Many tenants he's trying to keep in Darien as much as possible. He's working very closely with his existing folks to try to keep them there well received in the community. And he's bending over backwards to find them space. So he is almost fully leased. And for the residential, those things are also, he's saying here, leasing up very quickly. So good news on that front. Stage one, you can see he's coming along very quickly. Once he got started, moving right along. Any questions about Corbin? Is it all Class A office space? I believe it is. Yeah. Are they, um, are they starting with the demo? Will they start at Corbin? I think down. they're going to do that whole block. It gives them the ability to, I'll call it, get out more out of the road than they have been. Gives them a lot of staging area. Uh, I've not figured out, I don't think you've heard from David, which buildings he's doing first. I think it's going to be tough to do six buildings Second at once. Phase. Second phase. Second phase. I don't think he's. One, two, three, four, five, six buildings. 
you might start one argument to be done is there's a little underground parking, maybe it digs the hole in the back first, up against I-95. Uh, there's a building here where kind of where the post office is, maybe he starts with that one first, it's most out of the way. I'll leave it to him and his team to figure out. But a lot of work to be done. That will be the biggest commercial project in the history of Darien. Well, I hope they do something great with the Corbin sign. Yes, that is a classic building, and if you haven't been in the building, it's very interesting. It's circa 1950, 1960. It's a fun building to walk through. Yeah. But, but there's still a lot of tenants in there. Pretty full. Yeah. I do want go ahead. Sorry, the outstanding question I had as I was walking downtown a couple of times, there was a couple of families who were asking about crosswalks. Are there going to be additional crosswalks put on the post road as a result of all these new retail spaces going in? My recollection is that David was able to get a crosswalk basically in front of what used to be the movie theater. Yeah, perfect. Uh, that is the best we could shake out a DOT. Yeah. Uh, that's a hard area that's getting back and forth is tricky. Yep. Yeah. Uh, what's nice about his project is, and you can see it if you go look at phase one, there's two areas where you can have vehicular and pedestrian traffic to get, I'll call it from Corbin Drive to 1020 Post, the Goose, the DCA thrift shop, CVS. So you'll be able to actually drive or walk from Corbin without having to go all the way around the block to those Entrant. buildings. So I think it's going to help people in a more pedestrian friendly, hey, let's go shopping at David's Phase 2. Oh, let's go to CBS. You don't have to drive there. Or let's go to the Goose for whatever. You can walk back and forth. So that should be a big improvement. We're excited to see that cohesiveness in downtown where you're able to more easily get from place to place. So, exciting. The last one I wanted to mention very briefly because it's not really on the same scale as these others is uh, you'll see a lot over the next year, BMW of Darien is doing a very big call it, renovation expansion. Uh, they're going to demolish some service bays in the back, build a new car wash building. Uh, it's a multiple phase project with new buildings going in. They're one of the town's largest employers, believe it or not. Uh, they had, if I recall, just trying to put my finger on it, 32 service bays. Which I didn't know, but it's a lot of service bays. And they are used, and that's why they're expanding. Uh, no, new largest service building with 30 service bays. Which means you got 30 cars and yeah. presumably 30 people working on cars at any one time, which doesn't include the dealership, however many people are in there trying to sell cars. And then the guys, after you maintain them, I guess they also wash your car. So it is a big business, town, one of the town's largest employers, and they're doing an expansion, which means things must be going pretty good. And uh, I look forward to seeing the finished product. I think that's going to be very nice. Uh, we do have two other quick things to announce. Complete Angler, who's been in town many years, used to be in downtown, recently moved to, I'll call it across the street from Vernal's is now uh, gotten approval to move to 319 Post Road, the corner of Birch and Boston Post Road. Many of you, depending on how long you've been in town, would think of it as the former Centro's, mm -hmm. or Anthony's Cold Fire Pizza, or was Jim mm -hmm. most recently. So Complete Anglers in their very small space now. I got a tour, and they're doing good business, and they're very excited about their new space, which allows them to spread out a little more. So here's a plug for Complete Angler. Um, the other one, which many of you heard of, is Bird Code. Bird Code is moving to where HSBC Bank was at 151 Boston Post Road. Uh, I'll call it the same side as Complete Angler. Uh, Bird Code, the best I could argue, is kind of a Shake Shack for chicken. It's, they have one other venue in West Hartford. I went up there, and they do very nice business. Uh, the owners are very down to earth. They will run the Darien venue. I saw them. West Hartford was a small. This would be their larger one, but they they're very hands-on. 
They attended all the local meetings of the Central Review Board, Planning and Zoning Commission, and I'm excited. It's going to be a good use of that building. And there's going to be a little drive through, a lot of the business to pick out. Is it open after football games? <laughs> we will be <laughs> we till 9 or 10 at night. Uh, so it, it's going to be good. I'm excited for them as small business owners, and they look to Darien, and I think they'll find success here. So, so is there any internal seating? Or is there's going to be a little internal seating, uh, some on the side of the building. Mm -hmm. And so the one we saw in Hartford had a pickup window. This will also have a pickup window. So it's Uber or DoorDash or Grubhub, I think Grubhub or DoorDash, pickup window, drive through, sit eat indoors or sit eat outdoors. And don't get the super spicy unless you really like spicy food. It's very good. <laughs> uh, no, it's excellent food and they're gonna be great tenants there. They're very responsive to the community. I think they'll be great with the community and a great place for people to go after before or after we go. Super. Any other questions for Jeremy? Thank you. No? Thank you. Oh, the, the developers get all the headlines for this, but we know you do a ton of work behind the scenes Absolutely. on this. Please know it's very much appreciated. Well, thank you. It's also the six people that sit there on Tuesday nights, <laughs> your fellow commission members who put in hard hours. Thank you all. Thanks, Jeremy. Thank you. So that was really appreciated. Um, my first selectman report is next on the agenda. The weekly COVID positivity rate as of July 5th was 9.09%, which was a sharp drop from the week before of 11.41%. On June 27th, the RTM voted to support the acquisition of Great Island, 60 plus acres along the coastline of Darien. The vote was 67 in favor of the purchase and 13 opposed. The contract was finalized on June 28th, and the town now has until October 5th August. to complete August. What did I say, October? Okay, August 5th to complete its due diligence on the property. Um, there have been some questions asked about the um, special permit application that we filed for the stables. So, Jeremy, could you um, could you speak to that for us? Sure, good evening. Jeremy Ginsburg, Director of Land Use for those watching at home. Uh, in Darien, uh, in the R1 zone, which the Steinkraus property is, the Great Island property, that zone allows permitted principal uses, single family residence and other uses. But by special permit, uh, the zoning regulations also allow private schools, churches, social, cultural, and recreational uses serving a community need or convenience and not including any activity carried primarily for profit, carried on primarily for profit. So things like country clubs, Oxford Riding, Racquet Club, DCA, those types of uses. And also by, allowed by special permit are municipal buildings and uses of the town of Darien and other governmental uses intended primarily to serve the needs of the local community, such as the building we're standing in, the town hall, or a police station, or a library. So the town has made application to the Planning and Zoning Commission. The, Monica has sent in a letter requesting a special permit to operate a, to rent the stables and equestrian facilities to an outside operator to allow them to run a full service show stable with certain parameters. Uh, if you think of a small, much, smaller riding and racket club, but that's the sense of what we're talking about. Either a recreational use under 404D or a municipal building and use of the town of Darien under 404E. Of course, that's with the presumption that the town owns it, so the town is applying as a contract purchaser, which is not an uncommon thing for the Planning and Zoning Commission to see, is someone who's only gonna buy the property if they can do a certain thing with it. So the application includes certain parameters and limits in terms of how many horses, uh, how many riding lessons, summer camp with limited hours and things like that. And that will be presented to the Planning and Zoning Commission 
on Tuesday, July 19th. That meeting is in the auditorium of Town Hall. I think it's gonna be a live meeting only. So if folks wanna send in comments or come to the meeting, we'll be in the auditorium. But basically, it's an application for a special permit to allow the town to get some, what I would call some very basic limited use of the stable. Allow horses to be there, allow people to come in and ride the horses, allow a basic summer camp to run, riding lessons, enough, at least in my opinion, just my opinion, to, I'll call it, keep it worthwhile to keep the lights on and the heat running, and it's quite, you've all seen it, you know it's a beautiful building, and it would be quite a shame to leave it vacant uh, and let it get run down. It's, it's been a stable for horses for many, many, many years, I think since it's been built, I would say almost certainly since it's been built, but it never came to the Planning and Zoning Commission to be operated in this manner. I'm sure Mr. Ziegler, when he owned the property, had horses, and they were his horses. He didn't have people coming for riding lessons. I am not aware of Mr. Ziegler running a riding camp or a summer camp, uh, so this would be a first for a special permit. Certainly people can have, in Darien, you can have horses on your property if you own a certain amount of land, but for you to have people come use the horses, that's a whole different ball game which requires the special permit. So that is why the town is applying, and certainly it's up to the Planning and Zoning Commission in terms of what may be granted, and that's why we're having a hearing next Tuesday night. Hopefully that answers the basic questions. Okay. Can I ask a question? You know, someone mentioned to me the idea of maybe having like a therapeutic riding program or something, which, I, frankly, I, I love the idea, but does the parameters of that permit limit that kind of activity? This is new to me, so I don't understand, I guess. You know, the whole I used world. to actually volunteer at Oxridge when Pegasus was there. Yep. And so they had, they had that, so I would think we would be able to do that. That's a great idea. I mean, there's so many in the area that yeah. are, they're phenomenal, and particularly. Yeah. I think this would, the way I'm reading this, this, the proposal, professional rides and lessons would be offered two to five days each week. The operator would offer lessons for ages five and up on school horses and ponies. Lessons are typically private 30 minute sessions, generally by appointment only. And what's the number of horses that's limited to? I think there's only a 18 stalls. Okay, so it's just limited to the number of stalls that are currently. Yeah, correct. Got it. Well, but I think we, <clears throat> the permit does suggest a maximum number of people be, based on 18 horses, two lessons. Right. And I think that's kind of what we were envisioning is, um, so this is not a 24 seven operation. It says here, the operator would be authorized to operate between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. Minimum of 15 minutes between activities to alleviate traffic problem, possible traffic congestion. No more than 18 horses will be boarded and not more than 36 individuals plus on-site staff will be present at any one time. So that's kind of the concept is quite limited. And again, I can't speak for anyone, I can speak for myself. One would envision this as kind of a, I'll use the word placeholder, because as you know, what's, uh, there are no plans, we tell people all the time, for Great Island at this time, that is to be determined. Yeah. I, in, in being transparent, I think we need to let the public know that under no circumstances have we as the Board of Selectmen negotiated any sort of lease or extended contract to this to this that's horse farm. No. This correct. is just giving us the option to be able to do it in the circumstances that that's what this commission or whatever gets set up correct. can choose to do that. I kind of foresee, and again, just me, as you know, the town runs through parks and recreation, runs numerous programs in this community. Right out there is usually about five o'clock, soccer for five-year-olds. And Park and Rec runs the program. They hire the, the coaches and they run the program. Alicia runs her youth camp. She hires the counselors <coughs> and she runs a youth camp every summer and has been for many years. So I would foresee something like that. Park and Rec potentially being the person who hires this outside person, group, company to operate the stable 
with these parameters. Go out to bed or whatever the town does, but certainly it's not something that you don't see Pam Gary running the soccer camp or running Little League or with teaching lessons. She contracts that out to other people. Now, in, this, in, the, in the case that the town decides, oh, we don't want to use that as a stable anymore, in three years, could the town go back to planning and zoning and have it rezoned for another use? Certainly, that would be the potential for the entire of Great Island. We, for, I think, as part of this, we put in a limited three-year request. Good. Because we didn't expect that the Board of Selectmen would want a long-term commitment, as you wouldn't want to hamstring whatever committee you set up and say, oh, you can figure out whatever you want to do with the property, except you're stuck with this for 10 years. No. So it's giving the town the ability to, again, keep everything running, keep the lights on, keep the heat on, keep the air conditioning on for the time being till final decisions are made, very short term. And then it's going to be up to whatever committee the Board of Selectmen appoints to determine what uses go forward for the Great Island property, again with the presumption that the sale goes through, and then there'll be a series of permits and approvals and requests that may need to be made to various town agencies. Yeah, and who knows what that is? Concern about the safety of horses being around and public being around and what they have use of. So I know that a lot of people were concerned with that permit being there without having an idea of what's going to happen with the rest of. I think that would certainly be as uh, kind of what Monica has discussed for the time being. Uh, it's difficult to have allow full public access with yeah. nine different renters on the property. It would be very awkward for people just to walk in and, hey, hey, oh, you're sitting having a cup of coffee outside. And I think similarly, as part of any consideration going forward, if the town were to keep the stable use or the horse use, what fenced in areas kind of like what Oxridge has, mm -hmm. would the town want to set up and say, OK, here's the fenced in area for horses. And there's other things that need to be considered. As you know, Highland Farm, there were many conditions with respect to the horses, what the town could not do with that property to be sensitive to the existence of horses. So that will have to be considered going forward. Thank you. And as the uh, contract owner, we now currently have standing to make this application because obviously we still have our due diligence period but under the regs we're permitted to make this we have standing to make this application. That, that's correct the okay. owners Wayne Fox was nice enough to get an authorization from the owners to allow Monica to apply and so we are here uh, as you've acknowledged if the town decides for whatever reason not to buy it uh, you would no longer have have that but we'll see. And we withdrew our protected right. land argument. Without getting too bogged down in details, part of the original application was what we call, in, under the regulations, a protected town landmark designation for the stable building because it was desi uh, designed by mm -hmm. this famous architect who did other famous buildings throughout the world including Grand Central Terminal. Uh, and I believed, just speaking for me, that that gave it a little more uh, gravitas in terms of the importance of keeping the building. Uh, since then, that aspect of the application has been withdrawn uh, after some concern by the existing property owners who said, you know, we've given you this letter of authorization to proceed with the special permit. We're not so sure at this point we want you to designate our building and give it this elevated status. So we said, agreed, fair enough. We will withdraw that aspect of the request, but we're still going for the special permit for the stable, which they said would be fine. But we felt that designating it would give it a little more uh, importance. Uh, it was not essential to have that approval as part of to continue to run the stable. Is so, it something that we can go back in in three years when this is over? I would say this. if the town ends up purchasing it between now and August, whatever, you could, you could apply for it at any time. Okay. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you all. Thank Have you a good for, evening. Thank you for joining us tonight.
Um, okay, next next I have at home in Darianne has a new executive director, Chris Jones. I had the pleasure of meeting Chris and I look forward to working with him in his new role supporting seniors in town. I hope that everyone enjoyed the long weekend. I can attest to the fact that there were many enthusiastic participants in the annual push and pull parade, including your board of selectmen. Um, I think we all had a good time there, mm -hmm. right? Um, yeah? It was great. Okay. <laughs> all right. What's not the I line? know. Yeah, I know. Out the lemonade stand. Yeah. <laughs> that was smart. <laughs> that was, right? That was <laughs> for, for you um, young people out there, a lemonade stand along the, the parade route, a very, very good idea. <laughs> so the, uh, it took place on July 4th, and the route was from Darien High School to Post 53, where food trucks and children's games greeted the riders. Thank you to Darianne's VFW Post 6933, and in particular, Sherrard Sammy for organizing this event. Um, I'd like to recognize the Chamber of Commerce and all the sponsors who contribute to Darianne's annual sidewalk sales. The sales will take place Thursday, July 14th, through Saturday, July 16th, from 10 to 5. 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. There are a number of fun activities planned, as well as opportunities to win prizes, and the Chamber website has more details. In collaboration with the Town of Darien, Newport Healthcare is offering a grief and loss support group for local parents and families at no charge. On three Wednesdays in July, uh, you can attend either live or um, attend by Zoom. Registration is not required, and you can attend all three sessions or however many that um, you would like. You can find more information on this on our homepage on the down, uh, town website. Yesterday, Marcy and I attended the five mile run for Ukraine that started at Pear Tree Point Beach. Um, I did not run. Well, Marcy, Marcy participated, and they had planned on um, 200 people. They had over 300 participants, and it was um, it was just a really really uh, beautiful day. The fireworks for Darien um, are scheduled to take place at Darien High School on Friday. The rain date is July. <laughs> the rain date is Saturday, July 16th. Parking passes have sold out, but walk-ins are always welcome. And you can find additional um, information about the fireworks on the Park and Rec page of the town website. And again, I want to thank all of the generous um, sponsors for this event. So that's what I have. Kate? Um, our new HR director, Susan Barksdale, started last week. Mm -hmm. um, it's terrific to have her here. Um, the consultants doing the emergency services study will be in town um, August Forget it right, 9th and 10th or 10th and 11th. Um, the audit, the annual audit is underway. And um, I will have an update on the ARPA funds for you at the next meeting. Okay. Um, liaisons. Uh, I think, um, Mike, you said that Blight, your next Blight, week, right? Yeah, Blight meets on uh, Wednesday, so we'll have a report next time. Okay. Sir? Well, excuse me, for the Hanley Homes and Royal Building Committee, the next meeting is this Thursday at 6 p.m. in this room, and we'll be discussing a preliminary conceptual design um, by our architect, um, KG&D, and um, things are moving. It's, it's, we're, you know, we're past the state submission, so now we're into the design process, and stakeholders are being, um, you know, having discussions about what works best for the buildings and the principals are involved and such. So um, it is exciting, and this week we hope to take action on the designs. So it's good. So, what, how do you um, communicate with the public on this? So, that's a great question, and we plan on putting together some communications um, going forth. We hadn't done a ton because we did not have the submissions up to the state. We didn't, we had been letting people know um, kind of the general things that we've been doing, but now that KG&D and um, ONG has been selected as the um, contractual firm, I think um, we have been putting together, working with um, a couple of the other members, and we're going to put together some, um, but we'd love to put something into the newsletter that Marley does, or on the website, um, we're talking about the best way to use that page that we have on the town website for the Henley Homes Memorial Building Committee. 
um, but we also need to push information out. And we're going to be using during the school year the principals because they have the full list of all the parents involved. But we will need to get it out to the community. So, so will the what will you do over the summer? And I know you have school reps in your orbit. How will you? How will they communicate with their? So right now the principals are going to be the best, the best use because they have those parent lists, um, and we just don't have access to that information. Right. So they'll be able to push information out. Um, no work is really going to be beginning until a minimum, um, probably June of next year. Okay. So um, in the next six to nine months, it's really going to be here's what's coming coming down the pike. But there should be no physical changes to those buildings um, for the next minimum nine months. So people won't be impacted. So there, um, we can we're going to put out information and tell people that um, they have plenty of time. They don't need to worry about you know whether school year be affected um, and it won't be for quite a bit so and you're going to stick with weekly meetings no we're going to move to twice a month you are so okay. um, we have been meeting weekly um, this month it's three out of the four weeks but we're going to be moving to a twice a month um, most likely one virtual one in person and with the option to do both in person or both virtual you too okay thank you so thank you IT committee has been slow, and that's my fault, but I will report on the next, them uh, at the next meeting. Okay. Oxridge Building Committee meets on Wednesday, so I will have an update on that. Um, Mental Health Task Force broke into a smaller group and met on uh, last week on Thursday. The goal of that smaller group is to create the postvention plan, which is a postvention suicide plan. The people that are meeting in that group are people that are going to be hands-on if a suicide happens again in town. So it's first responders, mental health advocates, um, board of selectmen liaison, um, Allie from um, town. So we're working on, we did a little bit of training on Wednesday, on last Thursday. Then we're meeting again next week and we're going to actually write this plan. So that will be an intricate part of implementing that program. Um, the larger group will be meeting at the end of the month to kind of go over where we are and what uh, some of the new programs are that we've implemented in town. So it's busy um, and all good work um, that I think is going to be really beneficial to the town. Marcy, can you speak to who's helping with the postvention? So the postvention, we have um, a liaison from um, the police department. So Chief Anderson is there. We have Allie. We have myself. And then we have a representative from Child's Guidance, a representative for Center for Hope. We have a representative from Task Force that are in that smaller group. The larger liaison consists of some clergy in town, um, a couple of more um, of the officers. Kids in crisis, um, school. school liaisons, right, there's another school liaison that's there from Darien High School. At this last meeting, um, Principal Darien High School came, she um, is part of this uh, task force training. So, pretty good group, pretty good group of, of a lot of people that are very much hands-on to anybody who is affected by um, the suicides that have happened in the last six months. Okay, thank you. Sure. Nope. Okay, public comment. Are there any? Hello, Rolf. Hello. Good evening. My name is Rolf Ogan. I reside at uh, Nine Archer Lane here in Darien. And um, I'm an RTM member of District 4, Public Works Committee Chair. Thank you for uh, allowing public comment this evening. Any of the following comments are my own and in no way reflect any consensus or statement on the part of the RTM or the RTM Public Works Committee. I'm to here to express two concerns regarding the Great Island Purchase. First, the Darien Police Commission met on June 30th and a statement by Commissioner and Chair of the Legal Traffic Authority, Kim Hufford, was read aloud. If and when the town closes on the purchase of the Great Island, traffic impacts and management will weigh significantly on any proposed public use of the property. We don't weigh in on a vote until an actual proposal is in front of us. She then read from a statement by Police Chief Anderson. Should the town acquire Great Island from both the overreaching overreaching public safety and legal traffic authority perspectives, 
proper planning, engineering, and traffic management <coughs> concerns must be at the absolute forefront of any prospective considerations. The public roadways in this area predate internal combustion, as do the roads on Great Island itself. The area is very well traveled by bicycles and pedestrians, in addition to automobiles on most days throughout the year. The simple truth is that significantly enhancing any of the public roads in the immediate area from a safe, state safety standpoint is virtually impossible based on land ownership rights in the geometric topographic features on the existing roadway system. There is but one way in and out of the Great Island. There are but two ways in and out of the area on the approach or departure to and from the Great Island." Close quote. Depending on the defined use of the island, I believe the chief is raising doubt as to whether the existing roadways can meet state road safety requirements and whether it is even feasible to adjust the roads to meet state safety requirements. The town needs to define the use of the property so the LTA can render an evaluation. We cannot go blindly into the acquisition without knowing the viability of the roads that lead to and from the island, particularly as it relates to Goodwives River Road Rings End Road vis-a-vis -vis state safety requirements. I submit that as part of the due diligence process and before closing on the sale of the Great Island, the Board of Selectmen needs to be sure of the road integrity. So I just want to be sure that if we close on this property that we don't come to some realization six months from now with the LTA weighing in on it that we really don't have adequate roads. Or the roadways are adequate, adequate, but only to a certain amount or certain level of activity, which I think is also a, a possibility. I don't know, I'm not a traffic expert, okay? But it was something clearly stated by them, and they're waiting to hear from the Board of Selectmen as to what is the specific use of the island so they can render an evaluation. And so I wanted to make sure that everybody was uh, aware of that. Um, the second thing I want to speak about is the uh, stables. But what I have to say might be dated information or dated material with Jeremy Ginsburg's uh, presentation, but I'll still go through it uh, regardless. Second, leading up to the RTM vote of June 27th during numerous district meetings, public presentations, and committee meetings, people speculated on how the property could be used, but were advised that speculation on use would be subject to later discussion conducted in transparent, open public forum, approached as a blank canvas, something that will be painted on by all of our town's people. I think that was generally the message that was given out prior to the RTM vote on June 27th. When I came to the June 27th RTM meeting, I had no idea which way I was going to vote. My hesitancy was because there was no defined use for the item, and essentially, I voted on a leap of faith that the Board of Selectmen would shepherd this acquisition with the publicly announced terms vis-a-vis -vis open forum transparent discussion to formulate an agreed upon island use definition. Fast forward to Thursday, July 7th, page 13 of the Darien Times Legal Notices. Posted by the Town of Darien, protected landmark number 11, special permit application, Town of Darien, Great Island. Now this, this notice, you know, did mention the aspects of, of what Jeremy was saying about the use of the stables, certainly, but it also was very specific to say that this would be establishing numerous assets on the island as landmark preservation. And once that, should that occur, and he's saying now that this has been withdrawn, but should that occur, all those various assets that are listed in this application, which I, I have to say are, are numerous, it's not just the stables, it's the riding rink that was put behind the stables, okay? It's the paddocks, it's the polo fields, it's the uh, pathways for the horses, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, there was a lot of assets that were in this application <laughs> to be designated as landmark uh, designation. And once that occurs, that renders all of that as basically untouchable. And therefore, the, any other development of the island would be without consideration to what those assets uh, would normally have if they were not put into a landmark status. And so I'm looking back at the process of an open discussion and uh, 
participation on the development of the island, the dead defined use of the island. And so I want to see us get back to that. And I'm hopeful that if this application is being adjusted to where there is no landmark status, that uh, we will be able to do that. Um, so uh, I'm getting a little off here because of the recent change that uh, Jeremy uh, announced. Um, Okay, so yeah, isolating these assets under the guise of landmark status protection takes these assets out of any land use discussion and renders those assets untouchable under landmark protection. This is not what I signed up for when I voted on June 27th. As far as I'm concerned, and again, this was assuming that it was going to be a uh, landmark status application, uh, the application should be withdrawn immediately and reevaluated. Re after a land use definition for the Great Island is negotiated and agreed and adopted by the Darien Towns people. In conclusion, it is clear the Great Island land use definition is paramount to a clear path of acquisition and development of the island, and yet there is nothing in tonight's agenda to start a committee or a trust or a conservancy or a commission to address this pivotal question. May I suggest the board consider doing so as soon as possible. Thank you for your comments, Ralph. Okay. Anyone else wish to speak? Joe? No? We're just here visiting? Okay. Kate, do we have any email comments? I had not received any. Okay. So next item on the business, uh, on the agenda is new business, discuss and take action on a request to update authorized signer for neglected cemetery account grant. Kate's going to so, cover this. We did this, a couple of these, when you, um, you all first got on the board. Um, this is the same kind of thing. We passed this resolution, um, actually I think it might be as far as two years ago, but we passed it when James Stevenson was first selectman, and the resolution actually named her. It said first selectman James Stevenson. So the state will not accept Monica now signing for the grant. So what we're asking you to do tonight is to repass the um, resolution, not naming names, just stating that the first selection is authorized to make it an evergreen approval. Okay. Any questions on this? Comments? No? Okay. May I have a motion to approve the request to name me as first selectman the no, author we're not naming you just no. naming the first selectman to name as first selectman the authorized signer for the neglected cemetery account grant uh, mike moves sarah seconds all in favor unanimous okay thank you uh, next item on the agenda is to discuss and take action on the request to approve the 43rd darien road race um, this race has been taking place for over 40 years. We know that it's a community, uh, a fundraiser for the community fund of Darianne. And um, are there any questions or discussion? What does our approval entail? The budget participation? Kind of um, allow, we're allowing them to use the uh, road. So and they already have. They already have everybody else's that should have been included in the packets. They have police approval. They have right? police yes. approval and parks and rec approval. Okay. And Kate, do we know? Um, is this the number of volunteers? Is this a typical number? I didn't look at the application. I right. don't know. It's but I, 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 I wouldn't even know if that was a typical number. Is very similar to what's been done okay. Okay. Um, and are there any other comments? Discussion? Okay, so may I have a motion to approve the request to approve the 43rd Darien Road Race? Marcy moves, second. Mike seconds, all in favor? Unanimous. Okay. Next item on the agenda is to discuss and take action on a request to approve a resolu resolution authorizing a power purchase agreement with the Connecticut Green Bank. And we had a number of questions about this. Um, and we did not get all of them answered? Um, no, there was, there was one question that um, regarding why we're required to provide workers' comp insurance. I can tell you why we require them to, um, because you know, if one of their workers gets hurt, we don't want it to come onto our workers' comp 
but why they require us to provide it. They haven't given us an answer on that yet. Um, my, my question is why, if th this seems like a different um, approach to this, and I'm different I'm, from. I'm, I'm wondering why, if it's between the school and the, um, the school is the seller, right? Or the buyer, right? The school is the buyer, so right, the, the panels will be located on the schools that will, um, basically under this agreement, that gives them the right to purchase electricity at a lower rate. Right. I guess I'm wondering why. Why we're involved. Why, yes, I understand we own the property, yeah. but I'm not, Con I'm not confident. Well, I think if we're the if we're the property owner, then we're always in the line to be sued. So yeah. you have these agreements, and they relate to insurance and indemnity running from the various parties. Which was another one of my questions was mm -hmm. that in essence, this is going to be a construction project for a period of time where they're going to build those panels then those panels are going to provide electricity, they're, they're going to be bought, and you know that commodity is going to be bought. There are ongoing re maintenance responsibilities for the seller to maintain that equipment that's on our property. When I read the indemnity agreements, they said, well, we're giving indemnity for each other, but that didn't really make sense to me because if they're putting that equipment on, we should be indemnified if there's an accident there, but I can't understand, and Wayne may be able to help out here, what we're indemnifying them for. It's their equipment, they're putting it right, on. Right, right. It's going to be their workers or their subcontractors on those roofs doing that equipment. Why in the world will we be indemnifying them for anything? Why in the world would they be additional insureds on our insurance policies, which would just give them absolute right to make a claim against our companies from because of anything that happens there. So I, and it might be something simple. I could very well just be missing. And you know, Wayne, if you could speak to that, or or if you're not ready to tonight, at at, at some point. But that's what struck me when I was reading through those agreements. Good evening, for the record, my name is Wayne Blackstone. I think the question is a fair one. I had occasion to uh, raise that type of issue with Matt Rinelli, with Good, Shipman and Goodman, who represents the Board of Education. Uh, I think that relates to the underlying question of, with the Board of Education having the care, custody, and control of that property, although we own it, your point is, is a fair one, uh, why are they not the party signing the contract? I know what, why we would have potential liability, but in the normal course of events, I would expect that they would have the obligations called for and provided for under the, under the contract. Uh, I'm going to get answers to those questions. I'm, I'm suggesting to the first selectman that for this evening we put it off for a short period of time. Okay. Yeah. And I, I just, and again, I, I don't, even whether it's a school or us, I don't understand why we would be indemnifying the entities that mm -hmm. are putting the equipment on our property. If they're putting it up there and they're responsible for the maintenance of that, if they're going to be going up on those roofs, not only to put them up, but then to check to make sure, and I, I understand we have to make sure that the trees are cut so the sun yeah. can get in, and I read that part of the agreement, but I don't understand what we're potentially indemnifying the seller for. And that would be my specific. Fair question. In my experience, I don't like my client to have an obligation to identify anyone. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I will check that out with Mr. Marinelli. Thank you. Does, any, does anyone else have any questions on this? Two questions. Um, is this similar to ones that we have signed before? I mean, we've had other properties that we've been talking about doing this, but is this similar to anything else or no? I'd have to pull up. The concept is similar. I'd have to pull up the, the contracts that we signed for, for up here. For up here. Oh. Um, and then do we know what the annual maintenance costs are? If we are responsible, this is going to go on the Daring Public Schools budget. What do we? Well, no, that's they're responsible for the maintenance. No. Buyer shall at its sole cost and expense maintain the site in good condition and repair. I believe this, not the equipment, but the site. 
I think what they're referring to is the roofs. We've got to maintain where they're located. Oh, 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 okay. That was the piece that I was, okay. But I will ask if, if the Board of Ed thinks that there is any cost to that. Okay. Because I think the roof projects will be done beforehand. Okay, so you know what? We will, um, uh, would you like a motion to table to your yeah. August, August? I'm suggesting August 8th simply because I don't know if we'll get the answers back by your July 26th meeting. Right. And so, is, 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 would that be a problem for the school, do you think? I have no idea. I don't think so, but we'll, uh, let me see how quickly I can get those answers, Kate. So you may be able to run the 28th. Okay, so I'll, I'll, you know what? We'll say to the July 26th meeting. 26 is fine. And if you can't, if we don't have the answers, you can table it again. Okay. May I have a motion? Marcy? Mike seconds. All in favor? Okay, motion is um, tabled till July. What did you say, Kate? 26. 26. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Wayne, for being here for that. Okay. Um, next item on the agenda was to discuss and take action uh, to set a date and time for the referendum. And because there was no referendum, we will. Um, are there any comments on this? Otherwise, we will move on. Okay. Old business is to discuss and take action on the proposed vision, mission, and community value statement. We had a lot of um, great comments and additions and some just wording changes. And I would like to open it up to discussion and see if anybody wants to make any other changes at this time. A little, bit of, a little bit of wordsmithing. Okay. Um, so if we look at the vision statement, I'll read it aloud. The town of Darien seeks to grow in a thoughtful manner, protecting the natural and historic resources of the town as we provide opportunities and services that benefit all of our residents. The word grow really stuck out to me as we kind of talked about the 97% developed. And when I think of growth, I think of population growth. I think of growth within, you know, building structures, I, I would like to change it to a word like innovate, because we're talking about becoming a more advanced society, not necessarily a larger society. Okay. Innovate or, uh, as you were saying that, and I agree, innovate or uh, evolve. Yep. Um, but either, yeah. Okay. To that point, I think one of the things that I mentioned in the last meeting was the word, I think, historic resources. I think that could apply to anything. It could apply to a culture. It could apply to a building. It could apply to a bridge. And I guess I want to understand why we're, you know, the, a vision statement is looking forward to the future, not. But I think in the future, you still have to, you have to consider protecting the history of the community, so yeah, you know, and I'm talking, you know, yeah. things like physical structures, um, you know, the Mather Homestead, the stables, um, Rings End Road Bridge, you know, things well, that are sort we don't want growth to take those away. No, but I don't know. I mean, look to to Marcy's point, where it's 97 for 98 percent developed. I, I don't know that including that in the vision statement is going to prevent that from happening. I don't see. Well, so I don't right, but. right. So I guess my point is, but we need to. I guess you know, what does historic resources mean? Well, that could apply to anything. Um, I guess I looked at it like Kate. I looked at it as um, historic buildings that or, you, or sites. Could you, could you put historic character? Or change, I wouldn't use character, but maybe I natural resources character. and his. Mm -hmm. Find another word that goes with historic. Um, Landmarks? Landmarks? Yeah. I, I would go with landmarks. I think we do have some very notable, like the Rings End Bridge, very notable, iconic landmarks in town. Tilly, Pond Park. So and protecting the landmarks and natural resources of the town? Yeah. All right. Okay. okay. So landmarks and natural resources. Okay. Right. And the word 
Are we doing, yeah, are we doing Innovate? I like or? Innovate or Evolve. I like either. I like Innovative. Innovate. Innovative. Innovate is the word innovate. that I had there. Innovate. Let's do Innovate. Innovate. Good and okay. Innovate. Oh, yeah. So historic okay. landmarks, natural resources, seeks to grow, the seeks town, to innovate. The okay. town seeks, town Jerry seeks to innovate in a thoughtful manner, protecting the landmarks and natural resources of the town as we provide opportunities and services that benefit all of our residents. Beautiful. Okay. Okay. Everyone is okay, supportive. All right. Uh, the town of Darien strives to continually provide high quality, high value services to its residents, taxpayers, and visitors. I think from the beginning, that has always been, I think, unanimously agreed upon. So, mm -hmm. any changes? No. no. Okay. Darien's sense of community is rooted in residents who respect one another, who welcome diversity in all facets of life, and who are engaged in our larger society. We value equity, inclusion, and dignity for all. We insist on a culture of respect and recognize that words and actions matter. The Board of Selectmen seeks to continuously improve programs and services that are accessible to all, as well as environmentally and fiscally sustainable. The Board of Selectmen is committed to ensuring that the town is a safe and healthy place to live, work, and raise a family. Marcy? Um, just wordsmithing again. Um, I'd like to drop the word who. Where? It says Darien's sense of community is rooted in residents oh. who engage. Who welcome? Who? Yep, get rid of who welcome. Just say rooted in residents who respect one another, welcome diversity in all facets, okay. facets of life, and are engaged in a large site. I think it's just a lot of who's. Sure. And who built. <laughs> <laughs> who's on first? <laughs> and my next thing is we value equity, inclusion, and dignity for all. So I would want to talk about the word equity, but I would, instead of doing inclusion, do inclusivity, just so that it sticks with a Y. And I did a little, because this equity word is always kind of a, people don't really are relating to equality, equity, um, I did a little bit of research to find out exactly what it means in terms of a Webster Dictionary. And there were three other words that came up in mind that I think, I think nail that topic a little cleaner than um, the equity word, which would be either fairness, justice, or integrity, which I think really describe what the word equity means. We're talking about justice, we're talking about fairness, and we're talking about integrity. So if any of those words seem to fit that sentence. Say, the, that say those words again. Fairness, justice, and integrity. Uh, well, I think yeah, I think equity is the right word. Uh, I mean, you know, fairness. I, I, I think it's just the. I think it's just the better word. I think it's the more comprehensive word, and uh, and I think we say we value it, but it's not that we. Insist upon it. We, you know, we insist upon uh, justice. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we're. This is a value uh, statement, and that's a that's a value uh, word. And um, I, did, I just think that's the right word. Okay. I would agree. I think we do things like we look at having accessible playgrounds in town <coughs> look at providing you know equitable access I, I don't know that equity is a bad word and I don't know that I mean fairness is not a bad word I just don't know that it's the I just think it's important person. that we as the Board of Selectmen mm -hmm. understand when we write this what we mean by that word and right. if we are meaning fairness and justice and integrity, then I can stick with it. But I want to make that very clear when we put this out that that's exactly what I mean. I mean fairness, integrity, and justice. I think there's some power in the words that you've brought up. I hadn't thought about it. Um, one of the problems you have with equity is that it's a uh, 
uh, kind of a polarized world mm -hmm. somehow it means something at least in the public sphere uh, that goes beyond what it meant five or ten years exactly. ago. Exactly. Yeah, whereas fairness is timeless, right? And mm -hmm. fairness is something that you associate or want to associate with any kind of government or community or societal system. And so I think for us to come out and, and use the word fairness uh, in a way seems more powerful and unique than just using merely equity. Even though it just says we quote value equity, equity implies an outcome, as whereas fairness implies a behavior a process. And, a, and a process. And so we get back to some of the things we talked about in terms of the values and how we want uh, people to treat each other. The word fairness kind of links up to that concept, I think, a little bit more than, say, equity, which feels more kind of outcome-driven, like we, we, we're going to do something and we're going to expect a particular outcome. So I think in that sense, uh, I, I agree, I would, I would, would re replace equity with fairness for that. I think that's why I agree with you, and I think that's why I also agree with Mike, that the, the equity and the justice are, are um, more, I don't know, they're, they're stiffer, and justice is something that you don't value. It's something that you... you um, expect it by you, statute yeah, or something. Yeah, mm -hmm. you, you expect, whereas I, I like fairness or integrity. I like them both. Why not have them? Hmm? Why not have both? Okay. I, I, I mean, you don't have to replace one word with one mm -hmm. word. Okay. I just don't know if you'd have integrity for all, so we value... Okay. Fairness. And justice. Fairness. We value fairness, justice, inclusivity. I don't like oh, justice. I, I like that there, there's well, a case. I mean, if we're going to add, uh, I'm sorry, if we're going to add fairness, that's fine. But, I, you know, frankly, I, I, for me, you know, equity needs to be in there. And equity doesn't mean equality. No. Right. Equity means a fair result. When you do equity, it's a fair result, not an equal result. What's for what's equity for one in one circumstance is an equity in another. But it's, I, I honestly, I can't. I mean, I can't vote for the the draft without the word equity. And if you want to put fairness in it, that's fine. But I, I can't, I can't, um, I can't pen it out. I mean, we can pass it. That's fine, but I, I can't vote. For I mean, I could, word. I could support the word equity. I could support it. I, it is, it is a word that I, but I, I want to be clear that that's what our, our meaning is. That's what our definition is of the word. It is, it is not equal. Right. That it equity is fair by definition and just. not equal. Have equity is fairness. It's not. But it, but there's, there's a little cartoon that I've seen yes. that describes, you know, okay, like here's what yes. it's got three kids, you know, little yes. one, big one, little yeah. one, and it talks about equal. They all get a box to stand yeah. on, and they're all getting this box to stand on them, but they can't all see over the fence because right. of their heights. Right. Equity is they get different sized boxes so, they so that see. they can all see over the fence. Yeah. And I think that's what you're, mm -hmm. right. and I think yeah. that's what we're understanding. That, Equity yeah. means it does mean fairness, you right. know, but. You're all getting to the same end result. I think, right. to me, the, the fairness was the word equity. But I do. We look at equitable access to our parks. I, I don't know. I I like the word equity. I don't think it means anything other than fairness. And it certainly doesn't mean equal. It means no. I guess. But what I'm hearing is equity means fairness and fairness. So. So. Why don't we just go with fairness? I think the but is equity might be a stronger word. I think it is. Yeah. Okay. Do we want both? You can do both, yeah. We value equity, fairness, inclusivity, and dignity for all. Does that work for you, Mars? Yep, that's fine. That's fine. You got that, Kate? Mm hmm Okay. And anything else, Mars? No. Nope. Anything else from anybody else? No. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So, Kate, can we um, approve this with the yep. changes made? Okay. So, may I have a motion to approve our amended 
vision, mission, and community value statement as presented. Would you like to read them as we've amended them? Um, or okay. okay, so the, the vision statement is the town of Darien seeks to innovate in a thoughtful manner, protecting the landmarks and natural resources of the town as we provide opportunities and services that benefit all of our residents. Wait, wait. Then you forgot natural. Landmarks and natural you resources. You, you, you said protecting the natural. No. I have. Yeah, it's protecting, protecting the landmarks, landmarks and, and natural, natural resources. resources. Okay. Change the order. Okay. Right. Okay. Sorry. Okay. okay. The mission statement is the town of Darien tries to continually provide high quality, high value services to its res residents, taxpayers, and visitors. And then the value statement. Darien's sense of community is rooted in residents who respect one another, welcome diversity in all facets of life, and are engaged in our larger, larger society. We value equity, fairness, inclusivity, and dignity for all. We insist on a culture of respect and recognize that words and actions matter. The Board of Selectmen seeks to continuously improve programs and services that are accessible to all as well as environmentally and fiscally sustainable. The Board of Selectmen is committed to ensuring that the town is a safe and healthy place to live, work, and raise a family. Thank you. I have a motion to approve. Marcy moves. Mike seconds. All in favor? Unanimous. Okay. Nice work, everybody. Here we go. Uh, next item on the agenda is transfer, discuss and take action on a request to transfer $27,000 for the de demolition of 27 Crimmings Road. And we have, um, Mark, are you going to cover this? <coughs> okay, we have Mark McEwen. Good evening, everybody. <coughs> so um, between the time we met and discussed the purchase, back when virtual meetings were the thing, um, we received bids, or quotes, I should say, for the demolition which provided us budget figures and at the time we were in the area of thirty thousand dollars to demolition the structures on the site since that time we bid the project twice uh, the first bid only had two uh, bidders and it was almost triple the thirty thousand dollars and then we rebid it with a little tweak if you will we supplied some of the materials necessary to bring the site back to um, pre-built state which means before the buildings were there and uh, the bids went down just a little bit and so we're almost double the $30,000 budget so that's what the money's for um, most of what I've heard from the contractors is that the cost of inflation and fuel prices has driven that number and Mark we're under a time limit so the, the most crucial thing is that we purchased the property and closed on April 29th and for our grant award we were given 90 days to have the building leveled and on the ground um, it doesn't have to be a completed project at that point but it had to be demolished and that deadlines July 29th can we actually if we were to vote yes on this tonight can that be completed by July 29th so I've been doing a lot of behind the scenes work in order to do that. We've disconnected the utilities. Um, we're hoping to take the money we already had uh, and put it towards uh, demolition of part of the structures on the property, which is the detached garage, um, and also do the abatement work that was necessary. The very little bit was necessary, but it, it has to get done before it will issue a demo permit. Our biggest uh, problem right now is that there's a 10-day waiting period once you remove asbestos and you have to notify the state. So we pass it tonight and we go tomorrow night. We will be right at the 24th hour getting it done. But I, I've been committed to finishing the project, so I feel like we still can get it done. Thank it's you going to be challenging, welcome. though. And I've asked for an extension from FEMA because of the problems we've run into. Thank you for your work on this. Mark, you, um, I remember they asked for that insurance um, when Correct. this whole process started. Right. They have firmly received that, right? No. So the insurance, um, flood insurance, offers a 30, up to a $30,000 acquisition and demolition project but it's a reimbursement 
and they've committed to that. Uh, I spoke to the gentleman two weeks ago, and the uh, uh, prior owners have already signed off on that money, so it would go to us. Directly uh, to us? Directly to okay. us. And that was the only way that it would happen anyways, but they, they did what they needed to do to, to make it happen. Um, so that is money that's not in our budget, never was in our budget, and um, in essence will reimburse for the added cost. But we knew it was a possibility right. and we discussed that all along. Right. But yes, that's, that's available according to um, the gentleman that was running it for them. And then on timing, you, you need to demo it, but you don't need to remove everything, I, right? I was told by the state of Connecticut, as long as it's on the ground, mm -hmm. meaning just a heap of pile of debris, they would be happy with that. But I'm committed to helping the residents that live on the street. They've right. been right. dealing with that for over a year. <laughs> and um, yeah, that's it, what I'm it's saying, a frequent yeah. reminder to a lot of people that what we've gone through and what they've gone through. So I'm committed to trying to get the project finished. I just know I won't be able to have the grass seed and all that stuff right. done. It's just not. That's what I'm making sure the community understands is that we're not going to just leave the pile. No. So the, the, the requirement by FEMA's grant is to remove the structures, remove all the impervious surfaces, meaning the asphalt driveway, the sidewalks, things like that, um, and then level it, and I don't mean level as in flat, but level the property to make it look like it was natural. Right. And, and return it to its natural state, so to speak. Okay. Um, there is fencing on the property, and I ne I've never really understood whose fence it was, whether it was a neighbor's fence or now the town's fence, but it, it, the more times I've been to the site, it looks like it's probably the town's fence, but that, to me, is probably an easy repair to get rid of at some point in the future so okay any other questions for mark just assuming that now the 75 percent reimbursement is going to go towards the almost sixty thousand dollar demo versus the original no there. no oh, this, this is extra this is extra yeah okay yeah. got it and and unfortunately in the fema grant and the contract award the writing on, on the document is very specific that we agree to those terms and anything that was added on at the end would be uh, the burden of the town. Now we're done. Like anything. Okay, any other questions for Mark? <clears throat> okay, may I have a motion to approve the transfer of $27,000 for the demolition of 27 Crimmins Road? Mike moves, Marcy seconds, all in favor? Great. Okay. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for Thank coming you. in to tell us about that. No okay, next item on the agenda is minutes. Um, review and approve the minutes of June 13th, uh, the special meeting. Are there any edits, deletions, corrections, any changes? May I have a motion to approve? Mike moves. Mercy seconds. <laughs> okay, all in favor? Thank you. Um, <coughs> Next item is re review and approve the minutes of the June 20th regular meeting. Are there any edits, deletions, corrections? No, that would be good. Seeing none, okay, may I have a motion to approve the June 20th regular meeting minutes? Mike moves, Sarah seconds, all in favor? Unanimous. Okay, agenda review, are there any topics board members would like to see in the future on the agenda? How about this one? Okay. Uh, just, can we get an update on um, what going on with some of the flooding um, studies that they've been doing? Sure. As we get into August, the one year mark. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Some of that will actually be included with the ARPA update. Okay. Right. There's money set aside in ARPA to do work from whatever the studies uh, produce. So may I have a motion to adjourn? Mark, uh, Sarah moves, Mike seconds, all in favor? Okay, meeting adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Is this going to be adopted before our retreat, or I forgot the timing of this? Uh, no, the no. next, no. no. Okay, it wouldn't be. So, okay, no. We might have comments after the retreat. Yeah, I mean, that's well, you may also have comments after you have a chance to really digest. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.
Okay. Any initial comments or thoughts? Uh -huh. oh. Yes. I'd love to respond to the public comment this evening by Mrs. Uh, Stacy Tai. Um, I have no interest in adding open choice to the agenda until we have the study on the on the student population. I'd also refer to her, and I'll send her the slide that the superintendent provided to the Board of Finance, which talks about student enrollment growing. So uh, I've been pretty um, consistent on my view that until we get a better view on student enrollment falling, that I'm not interested in uh, in addressing open choice for the next year. Thank you, Mr. Sini. Mrs. Karen. Uh, I'd be interested in, and I know that you, we've been adding these to the agenda anyways, but the, the mental health updates, and especially for the August 23rd, and, and what, if anything, looks different mm -hmm. um, for the upcoming school year. Sure. I like that on the mental health side of it. Yep. Yes, sorry, Mrs. Ackman. Um, I would just request that we revert back to um, the process of hearing major budget initiatives prior to the budget coming out. So, you know, I don't know even if we back that process up so that we can make sure we have presentations in time for the budget. Um, but it's it's becomes tight. too rushed in January when we're also trying to do do a yeah. lot. So if there's major budget initiatives, if we could have them rolled out in the fall again, that would be nice. I think the, the discussion at the budget should be about the dollars and cents and beforehand we should be having the discussion around what it is you're trying to accomplish, you know, from an educational standpoint. So then it just becomes more of a discussion around the dollars. Okay. Mr. Brown. Just one other point, and it may not fall in this time frame, but going forward at some point, I'd be curious to revisit policy 9280. We've had a little bit of time to run with this, uh, see what value comes in. We used to evaluate it for if we're getting much out of it and whether we should continue that policy. What, 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 what policy? Can you reference that? <laughs> right right now? Can you tell me which one that is? <laughs> like what? I dream about policy numbers. That would be the title. Uh, student representatives on the board of education. We probably have an opportunity. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Bryan, to do that at the uh, retreat. Perfect. Good. Yep. Perfect. Good. Um, just to follow up on Mr. Sini's comment, I, I guess, and maybe Dr. Adelaide, for shed a light on this. I mean, I think this is a pretty standard agenda, and I think while we can always add to the agenda, I, I would, I think we would see open choices coming as part of your plan for next year before we would add it to an agenda item, and you haven't brought anything to the board um, as a follow-up yet, but I would wait to see what comes from the administration. Um, you know, yeah. I think that's kind of a, a normal process that we go through, if that makes sense. The only other thing we could do here too, uh, maybe part of the retreat is, are there processes here that you would like to fall off the board agenda? Yeah. Just <laughs> that we do as a, like, potentially as a standing item, as, does it have, does it maintain its relevance and important charges or not? If, if you have any ideas, that would be great too. I mean, yeah. I do. Okay, good. Yeah, <laughs> please share that. Good. Well, just, just to add one point there, yes. and, and I'll use open choice as an example because it came up tonight. I think that just like we talked about board goals being a hybrid of district goals of what the board wants, if there are things we said we'd revisit, right? At one point we said we were going to revisit transportation after having a full year to be able to study it came up about revisiting open choice. Like the board should prior to budget season really decide what they're going to revisit and what not so that it, like, just like the superintendent presentation, the board doesn't get in a spin over things. They should put kind of their stamp on things. Is this happening or is this not happening? Um, so I think it could come from both spots, but right. I think it'd be better to be clear about programmatic initiatives prior to budget season. And that worked well in the past, and I think we'd be well served to do that again. Thank you, Grady. Mrs. McCann. The other piece I think we could look at is, is our agenda review process. So for example, this is February through August of 22, which means next month. So, you know, it's probably not the most useful agenda item at this stage to just look at next month's meeting. Um, so maybe we wanna just take a look at how we, the points at which we look at the agenda and, and uh, what those actual dates are. We probably could go further out, for example, yep. in August and not worry about it at this meeting. Yep. Good point. Okay. Good. Um, 
All right, we'll move on to action items, personnel items, appointments, resignations, and retirements. Mrs. Siam. As you can see, the hiring season seems to be earlier this year. I think that people are filling positions that went unfilled last year, and so consequently we have some um, openings. And so far, um, we've been able to fill, except as Dr. Adley pointed out, with some of the support services, which have been a little bit more difficult. They are shortage areas. How's the, the flow of resumes and applicants? We're still getting, well, again, not for every position, but some of those shortage areas, the psychologists, the speech and language pathologists, um, we're being aggressive with um, the preparatory institutions and advertising in New York State, and they're interviewing all the time, so. Okay, questions or comments on the PAR? We have a motion to approve the personal items as detailed in the personal action report dated June 28th, 2022. Mr. Brown, second by Mrs. Parent. All those in favor? Great. Um, we will move on to the contract agreement between the Darien Board of Education and the Darien School Custodians um, Union. Ms. Siam. Yep. So we're asking the board to approve the contracts for both the custodians and maintenance workers. We have really good working relationships with both of these groups. They work hard. I think that like in all negotiations, there was a little bit of joy and a little bit of unhappiness on both sides. I don't know the specificity. I know we discussed some of the provisions in executive sessions. Okay. So just at a high level, a summary of the custodian and maintenance negotiations, the contract term is for three years. The GWI is two and a half percent per year. Um, the new salary schedule will go into effect for employees hired after 7-1-22. Um, there will be uh, potential savings of between 15 and 23,000 uh, per position when transitioned to a new salary schedule. Um, the maintenance savings will be between 16 and 35 um, per position when transitioned to a new salary schedule. Um, the custodian cost um, is 5.02 over three years or an average of 167 per year. Um, maintenance is a savings of about 4.15% over three years, an average savings of about 138 per year. So I know Marge and Rich have been working on this a long time. So thank you to both the custodian and the maintenance teams for all the hard work they do and for uh, working with us at the table. And thank you, Marge and Rich, for that. Questions or comments? All right. I have a motion to approve the contract agreement between the Darien Board of Education and the Darien School Custodians Union. Mrs. Parent, second by Mrs. McCammon. All those in favor? That is unanimous. May I have a motion to approve the contract agreement between the Darien Board of Education and the Darien School Maintenance Association. Mrs. Ackman, uh, second by Mr. Brown. All those in favor? All right. Uh, Michelle, we will go back to public comment. Anyone in the audience? For participants via Zoom, please click the raise hand option. Uh, please state your name and address. You will have up to three minutes. There are no raised hands at this time. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Again, please enjoy the summer. We'll be working throughout the summer along with the administration in the district, but thank you again. Have a good summer. We have a motion to adjourn. Mrs. Best, second by Mrs. Ackman. All those in favor? Meeting is. Darien Sewer Commission regular meeting agenda of Tuesday, July 5th, 2022. Uh, we are calling the meeting to order at 4.34 p.m. Uh, we are sitting in room 206 of Town Hall. Uh, and uh, first item on the agenda is to approve the Sewer Commission meeting minutes of June 7th, 2022. Fastidious readers and editors have any comments? I didn't see anything. I, didn't see anything. I, didn't see anything. I would make a motion to approve the. I second that. Okay.
Okay, any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Uh, that's five. Who's first? I'm sorry. Susan Reese. Peter. Susan Peter. 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 Susan Peter. Susan Peter. That's all right. Five zero. Yeah. You can make it up. It's minutes. Um, <laughs> all right, item number three on the agenda, an update on the potential residential development of Sedgwick Avenue. It looked like they pulled their application from P&Z. Very is good. That, is that it? Um, no. Yeah. Uh, we did our part. We um, shared with them every bit of information that we could find, everything related to the most recent uh, sewer II study, uh, reports from previous applications like the old town hall home uh, project where uh, the commission made them put meters in and do a capacity analysis we shared that with them um, so they've had it uh, you know for three weeks probably maybe more haven't heard anything from them except what you just mentioned so, so we don't know if they're pausing to reevaluate or if they're going away we don't know what the Story. They could be working in earnest to prepare an application or pulling Doing the nothing. plug. Don't I okay. don't know. But you did That's your part to try, try to be as cooperative as possible on the town's behalf. Okay. That's it. Darren, right. when you looked at all of that in combination, knowing what issues are around there, does anything jump out like what timeline we might have as a commission to look at that in terms of repairing things that are inefficient, broken in that area? Um, I know it's come up several times that Mechanic Street's got issues. If you're talking about the II study, yeah, I don't know. Okay, um, Ed might know. Uh, there was a. I'm sorry to cold throw that at you. No, no, I'm sorry to <laughs> cold throw it at you. Welcome guys. back, Ed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, there Ed might was be clearly something. thinking about I this. I know they found stuff and we're looking into stuff and Birch Road area or something. No, I mean it's it's going to be interesting because the the. The first thing is our sewer system right out there, and um, we have looked into, we have looked at the inflow and infiltration into it. So we're going to continue to do that and improve that area. The, the other piece, though, is the Goodwise River. Okay, that does overflow. Um, that will continue to overflow. Right, we're in a flood hazard zone over there, so we need to protect our system more. So we're, you know, we're looking at better systems to lock the manholes down, right, and then correct any inflows that we have coming into the system. So that's the that's key, and that's what we're doing now. Do you know where dredging stands for that river, that, that in front of Goodwife's Shopping Center? I, I have no plans to dredge it, nor do I know of any. Okay. Yeah, this goes back to our days on EPC, yeah. So yeah. when we had thought at one point the property manager. Oh, okay. You're not here for something on the agenda. Not yet. <laughs> Thanks. But I just wanted to catch you before we finished up. I thought you might have no, no, no. Just be here for the item we're talking about. Sorry. Thank you. Sorry. You're always welcome, yeah. Eric. Oh, hey. <laughs> <laughs> you know who Eric is. <laughs> no? Um, chairman of EPC. A related, oh, yeah. related entity. Related entity, yeah. we right. We don't want our sewers to overflow into his wetlands. Well, it's just time we walking over there the other <laughs> day. Or by we don't want his wetlands in our sewers. <laughs> and there's trees growing out of the inside of the river, and I just wondered where that stands. <laughs> that yeah, yeah, if yeah. anything has ever come up to, to require Erstat Biddle to do anything, I don't know. It seems like it would yeah, be. Yeah, the last I heard, Rich Jacobson was out there walking with the property manager, and they were going to put in a three year plan to actually take out pieces, and he was going to just let them go do it because it was important. But that being said, although that would improve conditions in some of the smaller intense, event, it, intense, intense events, it wouldn't have done anything for last year's storms because ultimately the restriction is the, On the uh, railroad. Yeah, the bridge. combination of bridges at uh, the railroad and okay. Tokenik Road. Um, to start. Any further discussion on item number three? Item number four. I, Unless you want me to introduce it. Darian, no. I and I study Arcadis' request yeah. to present at the New England Water Environment Association discussion and action. No uh, I'm all for it. They should be proud of the work they did. We should be proud of the work that we had them do. Uh, and as long as it's appropriately edited, which you will have the ability to see their deck before they present it, I, uh, <laughs> I will do my very best. I think it's fine. Edit myself also as well. 
but I, I, I did bring it to your attention you know, about two months ago when they had asked, but I did want to come in front of the commission and let them know they had requested it. And this, any folks have any feedback, any concerns, any input? I, you know, Craig had let me know how he felt. I, I feel the same way. I think it's a great project, a great opportunity, and we're not the only town that has this problem. I mean, all the way up the East Coast, all the way up to Maine, you hear the same issues with some of the smaller port towns um, with their sewer systems, combined sewers, infiltration, inflow, overflow, same thing. So this is a, a great opportunity to kind of put ourselves out there a little bit. I think um, any publicity is great, to your point, correct? Well, I guess, yeah, to me, it's a, showing you, from a professional perspective, you share knowledge and ideas, and it makes everybody do better work. It sounds like that there'll be someone from Arcadis and some from someone from the town of Darien presenting. So that I assume would be me. So. Any discussion? Any concern? Well, where anybody? is it that it's being that Nui is present? Pres is presenting there an annual yeah. conference up in Boston. Oh, okay. In the that January one every January year. January or February? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Right across. Right across from the uh, the big. Big building. The big building, I forget the name of it. It's, like, it's at the Copley Marriott. Yeah, right across, right across the, from Copley. There's a, there's well, a walkway that. across uh, yeah. in, huh? Huntington Avenue there. That's correct. So, as long as there's no objection to it, we'll. It's been, a, it's been submitted, but I could have pulled it if you folks had any objection. Right now, I will. Sounds like I'm going to let it, let it go. So how many free passes? <laughs> Standing room only. <laughs> I'm going to pack the house. <laughs> Come I was on up. A couple of years ago. Yeah. Was it good? Well, you know, so that's an interesting question. So if there were members of the uh, sewer commission that wanted to attend the New England Water Environment Association meeting, is that something that the town would cover attendance fees for? Road trip? Interesting I'm question. Not going. But <laughs> that's, a, that's a that's an interesting question. I don't know. Okay. Are no, there, but, uh, but I mean to see the equipment. Expensive? Are there any members that are interested in coming? I I would go again. It's been four years or five years since I've been. So Where are they holding it? I mean, it's right across. What's the? What's it would the, come out of the sewer budget. What the heck is the? Under what town? You know, it's in Boston. Oh. Right in the Training center of Boston. and professional show or seminars, things like that. The Italian center there. Uh, what's the? I can't think of the. It's killing me. The the, the famous office building that's not the John, John Hancock. John Hancock. No. Yeah. Prudential Center. Prudent. The Pru. The Pru. Yeah. <laughs> it's referred to as the Pru. But yeah, the Prudential Center, right across the street. I mean, it's you park in the bottom of the Pru and you walk across the breezeway, whatever you want to call it, to the uh, to the hotel. But I mean, it's there's per, there's people who are trying to sell equipment that works on the collection system, and just seeing it may help some people who've never seen it visualize, visualize what, they're what they're talking about. Yeah, whether they slip talking, line, this is the machine that does the slip line, when you, whatever. It'll well, and they probably have a sample of the finished product <coughs> or a grinder or a comminuter, or whatever you want to call it, or oh, yeah, the cutaway of a pump, or yeah. Well, you'll be able to see some slip lining, hopefully, in the next month or two. Starting, we'll update that as far as they go down. All right. Any further discussion on item number four? You heard no objection. Uh, item number five, five Tower Drive. I read a letter appended to the uh, agenda. Looks like you know, we allowed a connection without reminding the property owner of their obligations to a developer's agreement. That is uh, correct. But we subsequently reminded the property owner of those obligations. Well, um, it's a little worse than that. Um, <laughs> we, <laughs> all right. I'm we uh, on your sword. well, we made a mistake, and that's always bad. We should never make a mistake. We we gave out a permit to for this person to connect. Um, and they did, and then I became aware of where it was located, and I said, "Hey, they owe Bob Wood 19 grand." Um, so I wrote him a letter, asking for the money. Wrote him a certified letter, asking for the money. They responded and said, "You know, this is a huge amount of money. I might have held off on connecting to the sewer had I known 
I would have worked my budget differently. And I said, well, that's, that was, we should have told you up front. Um, I did contact Bob Wood, and he agreed to uh, a 12-month payment plan. And I called the owner back. And I don't want to do this without uh, the commission's blessing, obviously. That's, uh, it's outside of the developer's agreement. Um, it's something that the developer has agreed to. Um, sort of like what we did on Hanson Road. Nevertheless, the commission came, you know, made the decision, and rightfully so, I think so. But the private parties are on board with monthly installments. Yes. Yeah. Then they okay. then he's amended the agreement effectively. Can I? I still uh, gotta get the money out of him, but yeah. Can I? Yeah. There's no, really no. Benefit. It's the you same with the everything, right? Over time. Um, can I get a motion to uh, allow uh, compliance with the developer's agreement uh, for Five Tower Drive uh, to pay the pro rata share in monthly installments? I'll make that motion. I'll second it. Any further discussion? Peace. All those in favor? Aye. Uphill. Thanks for being creative, Darren. That's cool. Mm. Okay. <coughs> All right. Thank uh, you. Item number and six. to rectify the situation. Yes. <coughs> Uh, illicit connection letter to be included in 2020 sewer billing. I read the yeah. last page of our agenda. I thought the format and the wording was fantastic. <laughs> I don't know why you would say that. <laughs> Taking credit for something. <laughs> he wrote it. Nicely done. Let's just put it out there. Do you need to compliment? Is that what you really said? Hey, you so know. the question is, you do you guys want to put this in the billing this year? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it, it seems to be a good uh, KISS method, uh, nice and simple, mm -hmm. you know, plain and simple. Um, since Gene Simmons here wrote it, um, I, I'm even more appreciative of it. <laughs> the KISS method. Nice. <laughs> Nice bridge there. <laughs> That's like a dad joke wrapped up inside a dad joke. <laughs> <laughs> Be an old dad now. Uh, uh, all right. Um, but yes, I, I do. I really do like it simple. I think you need to grab their attention in hopes that they will read it. Best we can do. Yes. Again, again, again. Any. Uh, more comments or questions related to item number six, uh, item number seven, rather? Uh, no, item number six. 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 Yeah, thank you. One six. Hearing none, go forth and prosper. Thank you. Uh, item number seven. No motion. Uh, 19, Old Kings Highway South. Access denied. I guess that goes back to access we've been trying to make since our yeah, we're still, test. We're still, uh, still having a little problem with them allowing us in there. After they did their own quote unquote inspection and provided us with the results of what they had found, not knowing what we would look for, um, other than, you know, illicit connections. So uh, the honor system doesn't really work well with me in this regard, because we're, we're trying to find something that really shouldn't be there, right? So, um, so they have refused our requests to have our consultants or inspectors uh, on the property and in the building to look for illicit connections. And we're looking because we think yeah. that this is a particular section where there might be a little extra water that shouldn't be there. Mm. Location of the building kind of dictates being up against a river like that. If you have anything below grade um, that you want to keep dry, then you, you may need some type of uh, sump pump. We just want to make sure it's going to the right location. And our numerous efforts to first contact them took a while, but we finally got a hold of them, let them know what we needed to do. and still would not allow us in the building and instead sent us um, a report back from a company that went in and did an inspection for them, um, telling us that there were no illicit connections, no, no illicit discharges, and so on. And I'm just not, I'm not buying it. Just kind of. So whether it's uh, accurate or not, if there in fact are no issues, then there shouldn't be any concern with us verifying that. So, but we, we uh, I think we expected that as we go through this process, uh, we're going to run into situations like this. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we were first run, worried about running into situations where people had sump pumps that they refused to disconnect. But um, have you? This is the only one out of all the places we were out of the hundred plus places we had to get into. Yeah, this is the only location that we haven't been, been able, able to, to access to. 
we have two left to do the final inspection to wrap up the report for our phase one of that whole um, SSES project. So have you looked into or talked to Wayne Fox about our legal authority to enter the property to, con 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 to conduct this inspection? I, I have not, but in reading the ordinance, it does sound like we have some latitude to go in and inspect as needed, and it can't be reasonably withheld. But I can go that direction. I was kind of I was looking for some guidance because I really don't want to, you know, make a mountain out of a molehill. But I really believe that we have to set a standard for our project, and which means putting eyes on certain things to check the box that something is not happening there. And to take their word for it, I I'm sorry. I, what do you think yeah. the next step is? A really really firm letter from the sewer commission. Draft it up. And with con consultation with town attorney. Sounds good to me. Everybody agree? I is agree. There, Absolutely. There, <laughs> I mean, the next, I'm thinking a little bit more creative. Uh, could you do flow metering above and below them in the actual system to net out what you think they might be using or how many properties are in that? We, we might trunk? be able to. I, I, rumor has it that the lateral goes into a mantle. Ooh. That may be another option, put a meter on there. But then that costs money for us to do. That's what I was just going to say. Why should well, we spend any money? Do you need money? a regulation where the, the cost to do such a thing oh. would be covered under our investigation? Would it be found that the applicant, the, the, the user, was in violation? They'd be altered attorney costs yeah. plus monitoring plus et cetera. And then we net it out against their water bill and figure out if they're actually draining the river little by little. Put that in the letter. I was going to ask. Put that in the letter that know. you're that we're going to. I mean, would that give us? Do you, do you think that's reasonable, Craig, to consider that? That if someone's found in violation, all costs secure, including legal fees, and and on part of our commission. Well, let's work with what yeah, we've got. Work with Wayne Fox on that. Uh, you know, Wayne. in other words, you didn't want to go <laughs> putting down some legal threats of where there aren't any. Right. Right. I mean, you know. Well, let's see if we can first I mean, meet. Wayne Fox will know pretty let's, quick. Let's let's see if it's five hundred dollars or a thousand dollars. It's 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 thousands of dollars. But um, the uh, so the yeah, let's well, just one step at a time, right? If the next step is a strongly worded letter, we try a strongly worded letter. I agree. If the strongly worded letter fails, then we have a plan B. Mm -hmm. uh, if we decide to spend the money on plan B, what I would say is is this um, if we find what we believe to be evidence of an illicit discharge we do have do we have Finding fines we had, didn't we have that or is that specifically for fogs I, I believe that in the ordinance there's a, um, a daily yeah. fine of like $25 a day for every day that yeah. there's an incident what, what kind of an operation result? is this it was more than $25. It's about like $250. Isn't it an office? Mm. No. Well, what's going hey, look, on in this that, not Darren, for, would you be willing to grab the sewer regs? Do you have them on your desk printed or no? Or should I look them up? It's online? an office building. So it's online. online. Oh, yeah, I'm, I don't know if they I'm have sorry, like Peter, a office building. cafeteria yes. in there or not, but I doubt it. Yeah, what, what always get them online. Wor worried me is like if somebody... The fog one is 250 I don't believe the... The regular... The regular, uh, regular violations of our discharge is 250 can I just ask this as, as ask maybe an interim want. step, um, and maybe it makes sense, maybe it doesn't. What happens if we get a notarized letter from the company that uh, prepared the report? If they're engineers, it might matter. Yeah, if they're a, a professional that has ethical standards. How do I know they've looked at everything that we were supposed to look at or wanted to look at? That, that, that was always yeah. my question. I well, think. but... You know, I, I would. And how there, about there, there, there clearly have been examples in the local area where people have been discharging illicitly to the sewers and have covered it up for years. Yeah. Well, how much a day? How well, far do we back to we go? Well, how about do is plumb it out in the yard? <laughs> right how now, about the, just time and ink on paper. <laughs> how about finding out if uh, from them? Would you have any problem with us talking with your Are company they? that did this? Or at least the, you know, the name or the 
Oh, I have the name Engine. and the company's name and everything. I mean, I have the company's name and the individual that did the work. Well. Do you know them? Do you recognize them? I don't. Them? I didn't recognize them. Which the problem is, with I mean, the notarized thing is that just notarizing that they signed it. You're not notari You're not validating anything. You're okay. Just, I was just a thought. No, I mean, it's I think a software. It's a, I mean, it's, it's a software. It's, it's, yeah. yeah. All right. Let me read you a couple of paragraphs. I just thought maybe it was an interim step. Is there any reason why you can't call those people? At, I mean, is that sort of the office is owned by a company something? outside the town of Darien? And it was hard enough to find the right person to talk to about getting in and then huh. not getting in. Was that the first? Well, I mean, but. Yeah. I, well, mean, I you, believe you that. Want, you want to know what they certified, right? I mean, this, this company that did it for them, if you call them, what did you fellas do? Well, if I was in a private industry, and I think Craig could probably speak to this better, you're not going to divulge things that your client hasn't allowed you to divulge. All right. There's a bias. Good. But yeah. and that's another the, strike, isn't it? The, yeah. well, I mean, to me, I, I want to support uh, the superintendent and what he thinks the appropriate next step is. Um, but for a purposes of the conversation, let me read you a couple of sections here. Section 1000-10, penalties. <clears throat> Unless otherwise provided, any person found to be violating any provision of these regulations shall be served by the superintendent or when the reason when there is a reason to believe that a health hazard exists the director of health so we can skip that clause so if you're in violation of these regulations you can be served by the superintendent with a written notice stating the nature of the violation and providing a reasonable time limit not to exceed 30 days to correct the violation the alleged offender shall within that period of time permanently cease all violations and take such action as is recommended or necessary to ensure that there will be no recurrence of such violation. Uh, all such work shall be performed by said person without delay and without expense to the town. Any alleged offender may appeal, yada, 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 yada. Uh, any violation beyond the time limit provided for uh, shall constitute a misdemeanor, and upon conviction thereof, the offender shall be fined in an amount. Unknown caller. In an amount not exceeding a hundred dollars each day in which such violation continues well, we won't know what the violation is until we go in and, and yeah yeah, yeah. Oh, you, you were saying how do we recover costs yeah. Yeah. yeah so first you have to say there's a violation yeah. you get 30 days if they go over 30 days you have to find them yeah. in, at fault and then you have to start finding them from that point so at a hundred dollars um, a day you would need lots of days yeah. it'd be thousands of dollars but look, I think um, this is not going to be the last time mm -hmm. uh, that we are met with um, some resistance to the need <laughs> to inspect things in order to take care of our sewers. And um, I think we should use all of the resources uh, at our disposal to finish the study that was Sorry, recommended I'm by our consultants. I'm not sure about that. Um, so I'm happy to sign a letter, yeah. if that's what you want. We'll craft a letter for you. And have Wayne take a look. Absolutely. Everybody good with that? Yeah. Yeah. You know, there'll be a time soon when the electrical use during storms will be able to be pulled right out of a building like that to show when the sump pumps are kicking on. That's oh, the yeah. point. Smart, smart, right? smart metering. Yeah. But why do you have this draw? During, that, only during rain events. <laughs> well, but all, all that's proving is there is a sump pump. It's not proving where it's discharged. Well, this is true, too. Yeah, uh, reasonable suspicion. It's true. Then we flow here. Um, and, then, and Craig, just to clarify, the letter not to mention next steps after or punitive damages or any. Look, we. we or craft Here, here are our rights. Our rights say this. Uh, or here's our authority. And, you know. We review, would review town council, and we need access to confirm the findings of your consult. And it wouldn't hurt to write that they're one out of what 120. Yeah, yeah not 98 other individuals have given consented yeah. to and our observations. Or, or would you uh, would you accept or unless you give your consultants permission to reveal their findings in detail? I, I don't know how comfortable you folks are taking their word for it. I, I really, okay. I, as right. professional as may be, and stamp signed, sealed, I, I'm. 
you, you, you push back for a reason sometimes, or you, you right. negate entry yeah. for a reason. And this does is not feeling right right now. So out of one out of 110. Too, too bad our regulation didn't read. Yeah. In the event and you failed to give access, <laughs> yeah. it will be a sue. Yeah. Yeah, I think Craig is right. This is not going to be our first dance with yeah. uh, this type of well, issue. Well, anytime so. there's a building right. permit in the building, the, the inspectors would have the right to look at things not just related to the actual permit. This is a good point. Is there a way that with the building department we can flag yeah. the property and be they, notified? They'd have to have an open building permit looking for an, inspe an inspection. They couldn't just right. warrant the right. I mean, we have a right to go yeah, in. think if they happen to come in a year from now to go do something. The fire marshal looks at things every year. Can we be notified? I, we, we could flag it and see if it pops up somewhere, sure. Um, they do do it now. As you're aware, if they see something, they let us know. Yeah, no, they've been great. All right. Any further discussion on item number seven? All right. Superintendent's report, item number eight. Did you want yeah. the map? Bob, the map could, Bob can't look at it because it's okay. Case, but. <laughs> you can't read it anyway. No, you, no, can't, you can't read it anyway. So, one of the reasons that we um, hired a surveyor is to try and demarcate our property from the park's property. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you can see on this map, but um, it doesn't do that. So aside from elevations, which we're very interested in, um, we use the Redis and Mead map. Uh, they, they, the Redis and Mead map didn't have that either. So we hired a surveyor to try and do that. And um, so far, our surveyor hasn't found anything. So um, I put him in touch with uh, Pam. Gary and Parks and Rec, and Fred Dunnett, who runs the GIS, and Jeremy Ginsburg. So hopefully uh, one of those people will know where the tax line on the GIS came from. There must be a map that, there's, there's a tax map that separates our property from the park property. So it must have come from someplace. So that's his next step. He's looking for that. Hopefully we can find something. But anyway, this is the draft copy that we got today. So we're moving along on that. Stony Brook is done. We, we talked about that at the last meeting. <clears throat> and that's that. And just a, for flood proofing, we are um, uh, ordering those door dam, dams um, only because they are back ordered. And we're gonna try to get them to us and continue to move forward with, especially Stony Brook, getting some of those window wells and stuff up things that we can do without uh, requiring a, a permit. We're going to start doing those things now. And what then is the next step for evaluating the each station and the kind of mid to long term uh, I'm, storm hardening? I'm looking required. at prioritizing these and I think Stony Brook seems to be giving me the most exposure right now. I think the last couple storms showed that. It also showed that we have power issues out there. So I have to pick between one or the other. Either that transformer has to get raised up, which is going to require a lot of work, or I take that generator and I go in front of the P&Z and I get permission to raise that up um, to a proper height. At least I'll have power coming from one of the sources um, instead of neither one of the sources if they get flooded like it did last time. So that's, that's probably my first goal out there. So that's short term. That's it's gonna a take a while, but that's, that's a short term. That is short term for that one. Yeah. Uh, same thing with near water. We need to protect that circular building, and then we're going to go after those doors and those vents that protect that circular building. I will note that the storms last year, Elsa in July and uh, Ida in September, were uh, rainfall events, not coastal flooding events. That's, that's which is why things looked so um, tenuous at Stony Brook, but effectively no problem at Nearwater. If the inverse was true, we could, like uh, Irene and Sandy, going back to 2011, 2012, um, those were coastal events, not really rainfall events in our area. Um, and the inverse was true, Nearwater looked much more tenuous in mm -hmm. those two storms in 2011, 2012 than, uh, than Stony Brook did. 
but I what, what happened to read the plan of conservation and development of 2016. Thank you, and thank you. Um, and uh, uh, under infrastructure, uh, hardening our pump stations in our flood prone areas is one of the items listed in the plan of conservation and development as something that we should do. Um, so I still uh, would, would like us to, I would advocate and encourage that you know, we look at the big picture for both of these pump stations and at least understand um, what that means in totality, not just looking at the next most vulnerable thing and fixing the next most vulnerable thing, which we have to do and we can do quicker than a lot of other things, uh, but we should be thinking about the whole sequence of the 10 vulnerable things that start to domino after those first two. I understand. Uh, electricity is not my forte, um, so I will ask this question. If the transformer becomes submerged, is it is it ruined? Oh, yeah. Well, I think particularly the power is it works, well, I'm sure it know. wouldn't work. I mean, but does it dry out and then it's all good and well and good? Or, I mean, I'm sure near water, probably not with the salt water. But Stony Brook. Yeah, it just has other stuff in the river and water that you'd have to be concerned about. My, my concern would be the age of the transformer right now. Um, it's not brand new. It's not something you could take out and dry out later and put it back. Uh, my thinking is they'd have to drop a new one in there anyway. Um, my thought would be anything goes underwater like that and shorts itself out and, and oh, yeah. shorts out the transformer, they're just going to replace it. That, so that would be that would my be first my thought. I was just kind of wanted to. But right now we were up two, we were up two feet on on that transformer with water. It was underwater. Wow. Um, okay. And it still worked. That's incredible. So, I, I liquid cooled. I'm not going to guess Crazy. where the connections are, but I'm assuming they're above two feet. So. Yeah. No, you're doing the right thing on both, right? We're addressing the generators on both, and we should be addressing the transformers on both. Um, and those are the most um, obvious near-term concerns. Um, but let's not take our eye off uh, where it needs to be in 10 years. I mean, if we, if we go back and look at where the problems arise, most of these storms, it, we lose power. Right? Oh, yeah. We lose power to neighborhoods. So though protecting the transformers are important because it's, it's stayed online, um, I, I have to go after those generators first mm -hmm. and make sure that they're up or protected. Makes sense. So we and had, we had an incident just a couple of months ago where the near water generator went down. Or, uh, sure. Yeah, sure. You got an update on that coming too? I can't wait to hear. Okay. Other than item D. Um, any other discussion under 8A? No, I would agree with the generator first. Just if he's, especially if he's saying that the transformer is old. Um, I mean, you don't, you wouldn't want it to become a sacrificial lamb. But if, I just, I agree with this priority. I'll just voice. I was thinking, that. if you've got a good generator, you can live without the transformer. Yep. Yes. For a while. For a while, but that's tenuous as well. Go on to B. Please. Okay, Old Kings Highway South. There's some big, exciting news. It is out to bid right now. Bids are due um, July 21st. Um, our budget right now for this project um, through ARPA funding is $1 million. I am waiting for on their engineer's bid, but they believe it's going to be under that. I won't hold them to it, not knowing what the cost of liners are going to be. So, um, But my thoughts are because we paired back some of the work on the laterals. Um, and relining those, that there is substantial savings there. So I'm um, hopeful it's somewhere around 750, 800, 850, but uh, we'll find out the 21st of July. That's when the final bid is due. Correct. Okay. What, it what it shouldn't a take a us long to get a contract in place. It, it's just the amount of time it takes to order the liner and have it produced and delivered. Okay. That's what? the time. 
What's the APRA funding? ARPA. It's the government that they gave the town of Darien six point three or six point oh. four million dollars to okay. spend towards its infrastructure or other projects that the and this was one of the first ones I put up. Great. Um, so we imagine we get a final bid on the 21st. Yep. You've got to do some more details with signing contracts and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you could guess when do you think there are actually boots on the ground on this? I, I'm hopeful September. Okay. And I want to, I told them I want to enjoy my Thanksgiving. So I want it done. <laughs> okay. well done. Um, they were iffy on that, but they are. I told them I'm, we're well, not doing lining. They the can't week. guarantee you're going to enjoy Thanksgiving. I really. <laughs> like you go a long way this is, help. And you know, sometimes I didn't tell them all the reasons why we'd be out this feel would be. They'll be they'll be sending your turkey in March. <laughs> <laughs> so they they think three months. Okay. Three three and a half months. So that kind of puts me in December somewhere. So so I assume this means that the construction documents for that project are complete. They're they're all set. And does that mean we're working on the construction documents for phase two or three? Uh, that would be uh, that would be no. Okay. So far, um, the next thing we're going to work on is our um, eight miles of uh, camera Video cleaning work. work. Okay. We will set that up. What we're trying to do is set it up in the phase one area where we didn't do it already, to see if there's any more I and I that we can pick up as part of this phase and and kind of systematically close out that phase. Is that, are we uh, overseeing that work or are we using Ar Arcadis to oversee that work? We, we haven't decided yet. Okay. Um, if I pay for it out of the sewer commission funding that I have um, and, uh, and do it myself, then I have to bid it out. If I go through them, extend their contract and put an extension in it for this work, um, I can use their low bidder that they had and keep it contiguous so probably the same company that did the previous work for us. Haven't thought that through completely yet until we find out where I really want to do it and you know, Lindsay's going to be, Lindsay and I are going to be working on that either next week or the week after. I guess I ask only if, are we using Arcadis resources or can, you know, my recollection was that the bottleneck was going to be uh, how available Arcadis was to do the next phase construction documents, not necessarily how available we were. It seems the office work, you know, do construction documents, plans, things like that, seems to be a little bit slower than getting them out to the field to do the field work. They have kind of, they can supplement that easier. Um, that's one of the, 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 the issues that won't happen if when we do the camera work. It's not going to be taking away from something else. Um, the other part is our original estimate for the engineering work for that phase one, the 690 or almost $700,000, well, we have about 40 left over. Okay. So that could actually go to the camera work for this continued phase. If you remember, there were seven different uh, sub areas and we took the worst three. Well, maybe we can take the next group of two or three to do the camera work in those and just kind of work our way through that system, through those areas and through the system. All right. I do like the idea of using them because it keeps everything yeah, fluid. Yeah, I mean, hopefully we'll get some benefit from the institutional knowledge of one company um, having a lot of this information and saying, well, actually, you know, that reminds me when I was looking at this, this would be the area I would look at next, you know. Um, so, she, um, I, you know, kudos to, to Lindsay and, uh, and Vanessa both. They, they, they look at it all the time. They, they come to our meetings. We, we call them on the spur of the moment. And they have what we need. They get us what we need when we need it as far as presentation information, you know, information for ARPA. I needed something and, and they gave it to us. So the institutional knowledge they're gaining in this first section or first phase is going to help us down the line. And the fact that they came in under their estimate, you know, that's, that's a plus in my book, especially working on some of these mm -hmm. contracts where you put numbers through, you're not really sure what you're going to get when you get out there. So I'm just going to harp one more time, given my our responsibility as citizen oversight. Um, you know, our direction after we got the INI report with suggested fixes, areas that we now know are broken, or at least areas that we know can be uh, improved, 
was go as fast as we can. Um, and so if they're not, you know, putting a lot of time into the CDs for phase one, then I would like to get a proposal for them to do the CDs for phase two. I, I think we're going to push them towards that. Once I focus and, and target the areas for the next camera work, I think putting the CDs together. Now, what, what we talked about last time was the amount of time it took us to do the first one. It shouldn't take that long anymore now. Can we have, we have all base, of our front end information. Yeah. Say, yeah. So now it's just a matter of uh, construction specs, and, yep. and they're pretty um, uh, contiguous as you go down and do maybe different areas, but the functions are the same. The yeah. lining process is the same, the yeah. materials. So um, I think I it'll be fast. The question was, I think we, we debated this a little bit when we were speaking with them, do you do phase two and three in the same contract at the same time and just get it all done? Yeah. Or is there benefit to have two separate contracts? You know, that I would still be interested in what you think they think and what the street thinks in terms of I, I mean, I'd like nothing job. better than to have all three phases of that, over three sections of remedies, if you will, yeah. going at the same time. Yeah. I just know that we can't cover that. We have enough money for the first phase. The first or and the second, second phase. First and second, but not the third. But, you know, although I appreciate the, yeah, I guess, yeah. I mean, I could take a look at the reserve and see you could cover it. Hey, let's see what this first bid comes in. I mean, that's going to tell me oh, yeah, if their estimates and their pricing, maybe, yeah. is there a savings? Maybe there is. Maybe they should combine them together will give us a, a, a better uh, cost savings. You know? Our, yeah. So uh, to me, um, in terms of priorities, I would prioritize time over cost. So if putting them together slows us down because we've got to find more money to pay for the whole contract, then keep them apart because we already know we have the money to cover the second contract. So if, so if we use time as the priority, let's yeah. get more done sooner and not slow ourselves down trying to get more done sooner. <laughs> so if putting them together costs, costs us more time because we have to find yes. funds, yeah. Yeah. then staggering them is better. Is better. Yeah. And I think we talked about it. I think we thought staggering those the three as soon as we get one going we should be into the other one and yes. out to bid before the other one is finished that, that yes. would be the preference yeah so once we're done with cds at phase two then we can look at phase three and say how much is it going to cost where are we going to find the money and then go through the process of finding the money while we're doing the work on correct. phase two yeah. correct okay. sounds good all right any further discussion for 8b you have c sure 514 all right uh, 8C. Okay, at the last meeting, the commission, we reported that uh, the sewer pipe was less than the design slope, and um, we reported that there was really no choice because it ends here and it starts there, and, and the pipe goes in between. Um, but the commission asked that we uh, probably should have some assurances that it's okay. So we went back to Baywater and uh, David Genovese was uh, very cooperative and so uh, put his engineer, Ty and Bon, Eric Lindquist on it. I don't have anything for it yet, but it is, they're gonna look into what the effects are in their design and uh, if it still has capacity uh, to handle the buildings that they have connected. Thank you. Hmm. Any further discussion under 8C? All right, 8D. So the near water generator as of <clears throat> this morning is back up and running. Um, Trace the part, they put it through its paces. They're gonna continue to do that uh, through tomorrow. You know, switching it on, switching it off, see if it, we're not losing any power or <clears throat> any reduction in <clears throat> I'm sorry, energy. The, uh, the rental is going to go back on Thursday if everything's working well. Um, I'm, I'm not concerned. What was the it, problem? <sighs> or should I not ask that question? Uh, if out a rabbit hole. I want to say the right, I want to tell you the right term. Is, uh, um, Leg? Flux capacitor. <laughs> Relay? <laughs> the, the flux capacitor. Uh, energy, energy transduced. 
he called it something. I'm sorry, I didn't, yeah, I didn't know you'd want the name of the part. Um, well, I guess it's it's a it's an energy regulator. It, it regulates. What I want to know is the problem was clear, and the. The fix is clear. Well, the, the problem was evident. We were, we were looking for 480 and we we're getting 310 or yeah, 290. It was just, it was dropping down. So you one. can't run three pumps on that, right? Mm -hmm. um, so now with the new piece in, they, you know, they turned it on, turned it off, ran the generator. It stayed constant. How much was the part? I don't know yet. Let's get another I can, one. I, can t so I, I told them to get two. <laughs> <laughs> I told them to get two and look at the one at Stony Brook. Nice. You know, um, when you find it in one, you, you got to know the other ones could do it. And it took us a while to find the to find the part and get the part. Um, so how old is the generator? It's old. It's older. Than me? No. Not older than you. <laughs> is, that, is, that, is that the benchmark? Um, <laughs> Thirty-five. He's still running. Forty-four. He's still running. Bob. He's still running. <laughs> no, it's about. It's about forty. It's about your age. So. Uh, I wish. <laughs> but it's it, you know Stony Brook's the same. They're same unit. Um, unfortunately, we found out while this generator went down that uh, our buddy uh, Bob from uh, Offshore Diesel who manages and maintains those two big units uh, is no longer available to us. He, had a, he took another job, they closed up his, his shop, but happened to recommend this, the young man that came up here and worked on this unit for us. And from what Tony says, very knowledgeable, was able to get the, the part and fix it. So I, and is pretty confident that this was the issue. But we will definitely keep an eye on it. Um, Not to go off tangent here, but yeah, when you think about uh, skilled labor shortages oh. that we are likely to face in the future. This is the beginning. Yeah, this is just the beginning, and it's even, you know, this, it's this right was the electronic very part. Yes. Yeah. And, and I and I hate to ask this question, but did you ask them? Are there any other items which are difficult yeah. to get, which could go in the foreseeable future, since it's a forty-year-old item? Spare parts. I didn't ask him that. Um, he did take a look at our unit and the system that we have out there. Um, I, I, I don't have a crystal ball, Bob. I, 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 I no, can't, but I could tell you that if I knew that there was a, an issue out there with this unit and this piece goes on in every unit, we'll, we'd have spares of it. Um, I was told when this thing did go down the first time that we could get this part within a week or two. Well, it, it took almost two months. So I, I I can't tell you what, what I should or shouldn't buy for this unit. I can ask him that question if there's something that we should keep on the shelf that's relatively inexpensive, you know, anything under $1,000 that he thinks would be critical, it could go at any time and we should keep it. You know, I'll definitely take a look at getting them. But that's a, it's a good question for him and I'll, I'll ask him that. Yeah, I mean, all we can say is he doesn't, he's not sure. Sure. But he may, he may have something. He, he may, may say that I just fixed eight of those in the last eight months, and this is the one part that seems to be going on all of them. Well, that's a good question. Yeah, I, I could ask him that. I will sort of ask that. They told you that the generator was strong, didn't they? Yes, so but there's the there's that, and there's the um, the little part. The electric, little the electric part is are, are different from the motor itself. Yeah. That motor is like it a, seems like it's easier to get a rental generator yep. than it is to get some of these unique parts. I, I, it was, we did have a rental down there quite quickly. Kingsley did a great job. They, another, they stepped up as soon as we called them. They had it down here for us. So. Um, and we used it twice. So I, it, although it's, um, sometimes you can think about old equipment and say, oh, why not just get new equipment? Mm -hmm. um, if, if a piece of machinery has had a good track record of solidly running for 40 years, that means it's a good piece of machinery. Um, and a new piece of machinery doesn't necessarily automatically climb with that potential track record. Mm -hmm. um, so it is a balance because if parts start to get harder and harder, then... Then your thought process has to change. Your thought process has to change. Yep. Uh, the, listen, uh, we've maintained them, you know, up front and honestly for the eight years I've been here and before that. Um, the gentleman from Offshore Diesel has, has been involved with these since they were, and his father before him, since they were installed. So, you know, we're working with a family owned business that took care of these pieces of equipment on their two biggest pump stations for over 40 years. 
Any further discussion on, under item 8D? All right, let's jump pump stations, 8E. Stony Brook pump, um, again, uh, about two weeks ago, it had been repaired um, and is functioning properly um, at the pump station. We had a we had something either get stuck in the impeller or something kind of, it one, burnt out. One of three. One of the three. One of the three. Yeah. Um, so we had to pull it out, have it sent out and be repaired. It took over two weeks to have it stripped down and rebuilt for us. Um, back in, they ran it through its paces for about a week, turned it on, turned it off, lagged it, lead, whatever we had to do to see it turn on and turn off. And it's uh, no leaks, no issues, has all the same power. So it looks like we're in good shape. And wood because I have nothing else for it. I just those pumps you you don't know they they have been since we bought them um, have been doing the work um, without issue and this is the first time that you had to run maintain into. one of them after five or six years. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. When, when it jammed up with whatever caught the impeller, does it have a shutdown? Some sort of a you would think sensor? that you, you would think something would shut it down. So that I I don't know the particulars of what it did, but they had to recoil the whole inside of it. Oh, the pump. No. Right. Yeah. Um, and the other one is, uh, Darren, you want to talk about that plug that we put in, or you? you yeah. Uh, um, administrative policy? No. Nope. Um, we did, we, there was an old abandoned line that discharged to Stony Brook uh, um, that oh, yeah. we found had clear running water in it. So we bought a plug and we tested it in another location, but they have put it in and it's in place right now. And we're monitoring the level of the water behind it, but it's a good amount of water hmm. behind it. Um, I think once we have a decent rain, we get to see if anything backs up in that area. And I'm more concerned about anybody's maybe roof leaders, um, maybe a floor drain in their house. I'm not sure. I'm just I want to check before I plug this thing that so it's got a temporary it's plug in. It's now. a temporary air plug in it. And after um, uh, and after we pull it out, I want to run a camera up it too, just to, you know, belts and suspenders on this to make sure we know what's going on in that line. What size line is it? 12 inch. Is it 12? 12 inch. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's a, it was replaced with a 15, so I think it was a 12. Yeah. How long has it been plugged? It hasn't. That's the problem. Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, are we put oh uh, when we do it? Yeah. Over uh, a week. A little over a week. Okay. Yeah. Well, you'd think something would come up if I, I just think that some type of direct connection to that river somewhere, whether there's an open pipe joint or there's got to be something. And we, we imagine that this was probably a legacy pipe uh, mm -hmm. that was made obsolete by the huge main that was put in. Yes. Yeah. yeah, but they left it connected to the manhole that goes into our pump station. So they made a new connection, yeah. left the old one in place, and then, yeah, yeah. then the connection to our, our wet well, right? Yeah, yeah. So that that pipe that they left in place, the legacy pipe, that's as you called it, leaking. is running water, in clear water. Oh, which is interesting. So why not leave it in place? Because it's almost like a supplementary uh, overflow yeah. for that. I, man, say, I think it's, but I think it's running yeah. storm water, river water, and, and ground water. So I don't think it's connected to anything upstream. No, you don't. No, when you get to Renshaw Road here, you'll... You think it just dead ends somewhere? Yeah, there's two manholes, and one of them's dead, and the other one is live. Hmm. Oh, it goes into the dead one. So the, it comes through the field here and picks up the sewage from the town hall, goes through the live sewer. As far as I know, there's no way for the old sewer to be utilized. Okay. So, unless... All right, we're good. Backing up. Mm -hmm. Find every little bit of water we can stop. Any further discussion under item 80? We have the last one. All right. Administrative yeah. policy on appeals. Um, we're still working on it. Nothing new to report. Okay. Penny is working on it. Working on it. Excellent. I have faith. And I, I think I asked her, and she said she didn't think she'd have it for this meeting, but the next one she would would be the. Um, Great. The differentials of the appeals that we made based on previous usage records yeah. from new uh, town, you know, that's, residents that's that moved into town. Move into town. I kind of want to get an idea of what it looks like. Uh, yeah. Maybe something for us mm -hmm. to look at. Uh, any new business? Uh, I just had one question on the 
it's not. So this is under um, superintendent's one, report. Yeah, um, it, it's an old, outstanding uh, one. The uh, property is the corner of uh, Hoyt and Woodway. Have we heard anything about the cameraing of the one on Woodway? No, the the cameraing was done. We're waiting on the easements. We're, we're waiting for uh, the Woodway house to have an easement over the Hoyt Street's property to get to the sewer. Country Club and lane. that hasn't happened yet. <coughs> it's not left our mind either. Okay. Would you like uh, Darren to reach out and get a status report before the next meeting? Well, I, I put a I put a hold on uh, swimming pool CO for the building department. So they have uh, yeah. So skin the game. Yeah. Yeah, but it was like an, it was more the neighbor that I I was yeah. didn't have as much skin in the game. That's true. So that's where and I could be, that was more helpful. where I was uh, yeah. wondering if they needed a uh, I, they, incentive a prod. Going by memory, but I think Hoping they built the house. Yeah, I mean, just a, just a you know a, a sweet letter this time that <laughs> says. I think they fixed the sewer at their house. They, they that was near the porch. I think they did that part where they they drilled a new hole and avoided damaging the house. No, I was talking about the neighbor that that on Woodway surreptitiously connected to their their sewer line. He is connected to their sewer line. Yes, and, and we wanted him to camera and give us an as bill. Okay. Do you remember his name, Bob? No, but I remember he was a plumber. <clears throat> yeah, I thought so, but but yeah, I just I just watch out for plumbers. I mean, it, <laughs> I know, you know. I, I mean, I don't I don't want to sound I don't know the person, <laughs> but but if they did this once, are they going to just let sleeping no. dogs lie in hopes that? I forget. <laughs> no. um, <laughs> you won't forget the building department. We have a hold on it. I you are tell a you. sleeping dog with the mind of an elephant. <laughs> <laughs> this guy, Gene. Um, <laughs> the guy, the guy who did this um, is a, a contractor, and he's the one who developed. He actually developed those. He did a four-lot subdivision there, and ended up living in one of the houses. That's the guy. So um, he's putting a swimming pool in his backyard. Oh, I didn't know there were two swimming pools. Yeah. The, this um, was, this the White Street house. wants to connect their, oh, I didn't know we let them a... connect their swimming pool house right. to their sewer. But the guy on Woodway needs to have an easement across the Hoyt Street property to get to the Hoyt Street sewer. So there's two pools? Two pools. They each okay. have their own pool. Yeah. And the guy on Woodway, um, I believe he did TV the line because they located it. And uh, also the commission asked for an as built drawing. And of course, an as built drawing is imperative to develop an easement map because where are you going to put the easement? Over the sewer. The sewer is there. So, but no, it's, um, it has been dragging on, and we have been talking about it internally in the office, and we did put a hold on the CO. For the pool. Okay. That's item E now. I just That'll want be on the next. I just want people to know that we're paying attention. No, I mean on the. You'll see item E on the G. superintendent's report next. G. F G. G. Uh, anybody have any new business? Peter. Uh, I make a motion that we adjourn. Anyone want to second, second that? Second that. All right. All those in favor? Aye. All right. Six zero. Fifty nine minutes. Thank you, Channel Seventy Nine. We are done. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ann Godlaski. I'm the Director of Journalism Training for the National Press Foundation. I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Fauci uh, to join us today um, for this briefing exclusively for NPF fellows. 
Um, as you all know, this is on the record. Um, if you need the recording afterwards, please contact Alyssa Black. Um, and we will do typical Zoom press conference etiquette, which is I will call your name. You can unmute. Uh, please say your name and your news outlet and then ask your question. Um, it will be just one question per fellow uh, because we will not have time to get to everyone. Um, and uh, with that, um, I don't want to waste any more time. So the first question uh, goes to Rachel. Hi, Dr. Fauci. Uh, this is Rachel Coors with Stat News. Um, and my question for you today is about um, variant specific vaccines. Um, FDA advisors are meeting today to talk about, you know, potentially switching to um, Omicron specific vaccines. Based on the data that you've seen, is it time to switch to new products for a fall vaccination campaign? You know, I can't answer that question, Rachel. I'll tell you why, because the, the Vert Pack is looking at data that I have not yet seen. I have seen a lot of the data, but I have not seen all of the data. And I think it would not be appropriate for me to, to give you my opinion what I would do, because then knowing that they have data that I haven't seen, they'll come out with another opinion. And then bingo, you have a story, front page. You know, Fauci disagrees with Verpak. <laughs> uh, I'm just joking, but th that's what we want to avoid. But I can tell you the fundamental principles that will guide, and I don't know where they're going to come out. Sure. You know, when when you look at what a particular infection exposure or vaccine exposure, the, the depth and the breadth of the antibody that, that it gives you, you've got to determine what it covers on what's called an antigenic map, which is the way you look at the different variants and the coverage of the antibody is kind of like an umbrella over each of these particular variants. We have been fortunate in that the vaccine that we used against the prototype, the wild type ancestral strain, did a pretty good job of covering most of the variants that we have received when you get one more transmissible than the other. So we've gone from wild type to alpha to beta to delta to Omicron, which now has four sublineages, B1, B2, BA2.1, 2.1, and now BA4, 5, that it becomes more and more transmissible and more and more removed from the original protection. So apropos of your question, what the Verpack is looking at now is data from what happens when you boost with an Omicron alone, what kind of coverage does it give versus boosting with an Omicron hybrid with wild type? They've collected that data. Then the next question is, what happens if you boost with a B4, B5 monovalent versus a B4, B5 uh, bivalent with the ancestral? Unfortunately, there's no clinical trial data that's related to the last thing I mentioned. There's only mouse data. So what they're gonna be looking at now is to balance what you might project from mouse data that would inform your decision. Namely, are they gonna recommend only wild type, unlikely, wild type, bivalent with an Omicron, maybe. Wild type bivalent with a B4, B5, maybe. So having not seen all the data, I myself am very interested to see after they get all the data, what their recommendation would be. Was that helpful? Yes, thank you. All right. Thank you. Brittany. Hi, yes. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Brittany Johnson with KCRA. Um, just wanted to ask, do you have any concerns about the way people with long COVID are being diagnosed or treated? Well, first of all, uh, the diagnosis is still very iffy. So I don't have a concern about what's going on. I have a concern that we need to learn more about and get a stricter definition of what long COVID is. With regard to treatment, there is no treatment now for long COVID. So it's kind of tough to have a concern about it. It's that 
you can't treat something if you don't know what the underlying pathogenesis is. And quite frankly, we don't know what the underlying pathogenesis of long COVID. There are some hints from some studies that have been done, but nothing definitive. So we're really in a very much of a swimming in the dark a little bit with this until we get more and more information, which is the reason why, for example, in the Recover uh, uh, initiative, which is the big initiative at the NIH, that we're collecting large cohorts of people to try and find some both clinical and laboratory common denominators and then pursue a pathogenic mechanism. And once you get a pathogenic mechanism, then you can start thinking about treatment. But otherwise, it, it, it's you know, th there's no guidepost for what to treat. Thank you. Erin? Thank you so much for taking my question. This is Erin Prater with Fortune Magazine. My question is, why was herd immunity floated as a potential end game for the pandemic early in the pandemic when, as far as I'm aware, um, circulating coronaviruses other than COVID are common cold and herd immunity isn't a factor? Thank you. Well, I, I, you may have read a paper that I wrote a few months ago in JAMA about the fact that you're not gonna get herd immunity with, uh, with, with COVID for a simple reason that herd immunity presupposes a virus that does not change, that once you get uh, protection against it, that you will have either lifelong protection or protection that would require a boost, but the virus doesn't change. The big stumbling block with COVID is that history has already shown us we've had five separate variants with five separate surges and the immunity to coronaviruses is very self-limited and fleeting. So when you think of herd immunity, you think of two factors that are required. One, a virus that doesn't change much and two, immunity that's long lasting. That's the reason why you can readily get herd immunity with measles, and you can get it with smallpox, and you can get it with polio. Why? They have two characteristics, or three characteristics, that are very much unlike the characteristics of SARS-CoV-2. One, the virus doesn't change. The measles that was circulating 50 years ago is the same measles that's circulating now. Number two, if you get infected with measles or you get vaccinated with measles, the durability of the protection is measured in decades and likely for a lifetime. And three, there's a universal acceptance of the vaccination programs of measles, of polio, and of smallpox. For that reason, you get good herd immunity. We don't have any of those factors with COVID. So that's the reason why, as I've written, we're not gonna get classical herd immunity from SARS-CoV-2. If I can just ask a real quick follow-up, if that's okay, on the, on the same line. So I, I understand why we will not get classical herd immunity. Why do you think um, the, the possibility was even floated in the, begin the beginning, given that you know there are not, there's not herd immunity to other um, coronaviruses that circulate that are common colds? Well, it, well, that's a good point. It was felt that there, it was unclear that there would be so many variants, because even though there wasn't durable immunity against the original common cold viruses, they didn't change much. So there's a big difference between the four common cold coronaviruses and SARS-CoV-2, which every few months you get a new variant. We didn't realize that until the variants started to evolve. Then it became eminently clear we were not gonna reach herd immunity. Thank you. Gabrielle? Hi, Dr. Fauci, thank you for doing this. Uh, my question for you is, first off, I'm Gabrielle Suttles. I'm a reporter for PolitiFact. Uh, so we deal with a lot of misinformation here. Um, so prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, had you ever dealt with health misinformation on such a broad scale before? 
um, and with the misinformation that we're seeing now, you know, how has this informed your approach to how you dealt with public communication? Well, in answer to your first question, Gabrielle, no, I've been, I've been at the NIH for over 50 years, and I've been the director of the Institute for 38 years, and I've dealt with everything from the very early years of HIV, through Ebola, through Zika, through pandemic flu, through COVID, and I've never seen anything of the magnitude of the deliberate misinformation, disinformation, and conspiracy theories that we're seeing with COVID. It is truly unprecedented to the highest extent. What you do about that is really, you know, very unclear. It's problematic. We always say the best way to flood, the best way to counter misinformation and disinformation is to do as best as you can to flood the system with correct information. However, it, it appears um, almost diabolical or paradoxical that the energy that people put into spreading misinformation and disinformation is greater than the energy of people who have a day job is in putting out correct information. You know, it seems that there are people who do nothing but put out incorrect information. And the people who have the correct information have other things to do with themselves. And they're not constantly out there beating the bushes with correct information. It's a problem that is very, very difficult to solve. And I really worry about the future when we have now lived in an environment where we have what's called the normalization of untruths, that there's so much nonsense, misinformation, and untruths there that society tends to shrug their shoulders and say, nothing is true. I mean, anybody can say anything, and with social media, it gets a life of its own. And after a while, the general public can't figure out who's telling the truth and who's not. That's a very difficult situation for our society to be in, but it seems we're sinking deeper and deeper into that. Thank you. Laura? Hi, Dr. Fauci. Thank you so much for your time today. My name is Laura Duclos. I'm with the Houston Chronicle. Um, I had to write down my question, uh, so just one second. Um, with so many at-home COVID tests available, what, if anything, is the government doing to improve tracking those infection rates, and how will the public know the level of virus transmission with inaccurate case data? That's a very good question, and there's no real answer to that. What I believe should be is that there should be some easy way, an app, or something that when someone gets an antigen test that's positive, gets mild symptoms and doesn't come to the attention of a physician, that there's an easy way to report that to a central data bank. But there's not. And I'm disappointed in that, that there's not. Because even though the last count yesterday was something like 100,000 cases, there were probably five times that amount that actually, or three times, I don't know what a number is, I'm just guessing, but it's certainly an undercount because I'll bet everybody on this Zoom call knows people who have tested positive but never reported it to anybody. I did have a second portion, though. Um, I'm not sure if this is a strictly COVID talk, but I just wanted to know your thoughts on the WHO's assertion that monkeypox, the monkeypox outbreak does not constitute a public health emergency of international concern. Um, anything on that? No, I mean, that's it, it is almost like a little bit of a semantics to that. I mean, I, I don't I don't rest my attention to an outbreak based on whether somebody defines it as a public health emergency of international concern. I think we have a problem here. We're facing an outbreak, a global outbreak in non-endemic countries. We don't have a handle on whether there's subclinical spread that we're missing because there's not enough testing going on. So, you know, whatever you want to call it, it's a problem that we really better address because you know it's, it grows and grows, and that's all of a sudden how things get out of hand. William? Hey, Dr. Fauci, this is Will Newton with Clinical Trials Arena. Um, given the many different ways that long COVID presents, what are some of the biggest challenges to selecting outcome measures in long COVID trials? And 
to what extent do you believe they should be standardized? Well, they absolutely have to be standardized. Long COVID is a very heterogeneous constellation of signs and symptoms that vary from people to people. Some of the real common denominators are rather substantial exercise-induced exhaustion and fatigue. The other things vary from person to person. Temperature dysregulation, dysautonomia, sleep disturbances, mental cognitive problem, which they call brain fog. That's one of the reasons, uh, William, why we created this very, very large cohort of people to try and see if there are some truly common denominators and can we pinpoint any pathogenic mechanism associated with that in order to get to the question that one of you asked me a few minutes ago is what about treatment? You can't do anything about it if you don't know what's causing it. So that's the reason for the large number of people in the cohort. Jimena? Thank you so much for the time. My name is Jimena Bustillo. I'm with NPR. Are you playing any sort of role in the planning of the White House Conference on Hunger and Nutrition, especially since there has been such an explicit tie between COVID and diet-related diseases? Well, the simple answer to that is no. Uh, I'm not involved in the planning of that conference. No. Sorry. Are you hoping that they'll touch on the tie between COVID and diet-related diseases? Well, you know, I'm not sure. When, when you say, well, what do you have in mind when you say COVID and diet related diseases? I'm, I'm trying to connect the dot here. What, 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 what did you have in mind? Yeah, 100%. Multiple members of the Biden administration, especially the agriculture secretary and Biden himself have noted that those who were more likely to get COVID as well as suffer worse impacts of COVID, uh, stronger symptoms, higher rates of hospitalization or long COVID tended to be those that may have been obese or suffer of other forms of diet related oh, disease. Yeah, yeah, good point. No, that's, uh, that's good now that you clarify that. Yeah, one of the real problems that we don't know why that connection is, but one of the strongest connections to COVID severity is obesity. And in fact, to our surprise, a recent paper came out that said not only do obese people have a greater likelihood of suffering a severe consequence of COVID, but they have a greater likelihood of getting COVID to begin with which has got to get unpacked and sorted out because there's got to be a lot of confounding variables in that. But your point is well taken. And even like, I mean, people who are undernourished and immune compromised because of that have a greater, a greater chance of getting a severe outcome. So in that respect, it is related to dietary related issues. Dan, are you ready for us? Uh, I'm Daniel Rocher, I'm with the Kansas City Star. Uh, a few months ago, you uh, were in a hearing and you called Kansas Senator Roger Marshall a moron. Uh, I was wondering with hindsight, how do you feel about that comment? But also the larger question of what has it been like navigating the politics of Congress in particular in this pandemic or compared to say like the HIV AIDS pandemic that you had to deal with, you know, politicians in the past? Well, I don't want to resurrect that that hearing for anybody because I think it's best laid low. I didn't directly say that to him. I mumbled something to myself under the, my breath. There's a little bit different than publicly calling someone something that was not meant to be heard. But if you look at the circumstances of it, would you go back since you asked the question and take a look at what antedated my mumbled comment to myself? He started off by showing a posted, a post, a, 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 a placard of my government salary. And one would ask, what the hell does my government salary have to do with an oversight hearing? I don't determine my salary. The government determines my salary. The next question that he asked was a strong inference that I was in bed with pharmaceutical companies, and that's the reason why I did not allow my financial statement to be publicly available. One, my financial statement is totally publicly available 
And B, why would you infer publicly at a hearing on television that I was in bed with the pharmaceutical companies when the fact is I have never taken a single cent from a pharmaceutical company? That was the reason why I made the comment to myself. I wasn't making it publicly. <laughs> and your second question? <laughs> well, I, I mean, you kind of spoke to it, but kind of the difference in navigating the politics in this pandemic than what you've had to deal with in the past, you know, say like during the HIV AIDS pandemic and, and how they are interacting, the politicians are interacting with you in a way. Well, it's totally different because back then where the, for example, the pushback on the part of activists of which was, I think, one of my finest hours because I reached out to the activist community. The difference between then and now is that, for example, the, the tension between the activist community and now was really based on the fact that they very much um, were saying things that were reasonable and needed to be addressed, the lack of attention and the lack of resources that were being put into um, uh, HIV. And their confrontation was to gain our attention, which we didn't give them. And when I started to listen to what they were saying, I became convinced that what they were saying is very, very true and needed to be addressed. What we're dealing with now is a deliberate distortion of reality and what I call the normalization of untruths. I mean, there's so much nonsense going on, I've never seen anything like it. And you know, in getting back to your question um, early on about the hearing, there was never any impugning of my integrity or, or anything. It was always a question of a disagreement with the policy. When what you referred to a little while ago at the hearing was a direct unprovoked impugning of my integrity, which I resented and responded accordingly. Jennifer? My name is Jennifer Solis. I'm a reporter for the Nevada Current. So state and local officials across Nevada signed an agreement with North Shore Clinical Labs, a COVID uh, testing laboratory that missed 96% of positive cases. Um, you know, according to an investigation by ProPublica, the company also collected uh, nearly 165 million from the federal government. Uh, you know, what kind of oversight do these agreements that receive federal money have? You know, what's being done at the federal level to prevent ineffective yeah. labs like this one from getting these contracts? I can't answer that question. That's totally out of my lane. I'd wind up getting in trouble doing that. So that's something that I just don't deal with. So I'd rather not comment on it. Okay, Kirk. Thank you, Dr. Fauci, for being here. Uh, really appreciate your time. Uh, question for you here. Congress has reached a stalemate on the latest round of COVID funding. The White House has had to reallocate uh, the available funds to make new vets scenes for the fall. What does this mean for COVID response at the current moment? And what concerns do you have about the future with this lack of money right now? Well, I and my colleagues on the coronavirus team, uh, you know, from the White House down are very concerned about uh, the lack of responsiveness to our needs to both develop and distribute countermeasures in the form of vaccines, drugs, and tests, as well as the lack of resources to continue to do some of the research that's necessary to well position us for the inevitability of future pandemics, as well as to improve upon the countermeasures that we already have. So it really is a very serious problem. I don't want to uh, belittle the fact that the Congress up to now has been extremely generous, giving us a lot of money. So it is not that we're not appreciative of the large amount of money that has already been given to us, but we are still in the middle of a war here <laughs> against a very formidable virus. And to all of a sudden stop funding at a time when we need it, you know, is really disconcerting to say the least. 
Mm -hmm. Uh, one more question for you, Dr. Fauci here. What, you know, you've been very visible in the administration's COVID months. And in fact, I cover campaigns and it's really been shocking to see how prominent you are in some of these attack ads for some of these Republicans right now. Like I think there was an ad that had a villains meeting and you were in this sort of AA thing with the Joker, Nurse Ratchet from One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest and Satan. Does that, how does that, what is your reaction to being so politicized in this campaign season? And has that impacted how you do your job at all or go about your job? Well, the answer to your second question is no. Um, you know, because I originally, during the Trump administration, had, I believe, if you want to call it that, it is the truth, I had the courage to stand up and have to contradict the president when I took no great pleasure in that. Mm -hmm. I don't like... I have a great deal of respect for the presidency of the United States. And I don't like to have to get up publicly and contradict something he said. And there were many things he said early on that I had to for the sake of preserving my own integrity, as well as my responsibility to the American public. And I feel a very deep responsibility to the American public. I'm a public service, I'm a physician, I'm a scientist and I'm a public health official. That triggered a phenomenal amount of enmity against me on the part of the very far right Trump people. And even after he left now, I have become, as I am the symbol of some people, you know, it's a big dichotomy. Mm -hmm. For a great proportion of the population, I've become symbolic of truth and integrity and telling thing as it is, and for another portion of the population, I've been public enemy number one in which they politicize me and use me in campaign ads. I mean, I, you saw me bring that out at a hearing uh, when Rand Paul was accusing me of outlandish things. I showed up his website that said, fire Fauci. And underneath it, you can donate 10, 20, 100, 200, $300 to my campaign. I mean, is that is that a way to handle a public health emergency? I don't think so, but that's what it is. Thank you, Victoria. Hi, thank you so much, Dr. Fauci, for doing this. Um, so as you just mentioned, under President Trump, there was considerable pressure um, to downplay COVID, to offer alternative treatments that wouldn't actually treat it. Um, and you stuck to the scientific facts at the time, but you've talked about retiring, um, you know, in the near future. So what, is there anything that you can do to ensure your replacement, um, you know, doesn't succumb to political pressure if there is a new administration that doesn't stick to the scientific mainstream? What can you do to ensure the, the NIH can do that? Well, you know, I I, George Stephanopoulos asked me about, you know, I'm 81 years old. He said, you know, you've been this at a long time. When do you retire? And I said, well, I will someday. And all of a sudden that became news, <laughs> you know, that, that, that I was retiring. So the only thing I can say, I can guarantee you, Victoria, that I will retire before I die. <laughs> so uh, I, I tend to do that. Uh, I, I intend to do that. Uh, but, you know, my replacement, I hope my replacement would, would use me as an example of why it's so important to stick by the truth, no matter what the, the forces they're pushing back against it. I have confidence that there are enough competent people around that when I do leave, when that happens, that I'll be replaced by somebody that would still do a really good job. I, I don't worry about that. There are a lot of good people in public health. And we are at 4.30, and Dr. Fauci, I know that you uh, had a had a hard stop, um, but I wanted to thank you for sharing your time and your expertise. Um, and uh, fellows, if you could just hang on for a second, but Dr. Fauci, thank you so much. My pleasure, good to be with you. Good luck, take care now, bye. Thank you.
This is the Environmental Protection Commission regular meeting, Wednesday, July 6, 2022. Um, we, I have received a request to move the second to last item on the agenda, EPC 30 2021, 31 Hancock Lane. First, because the representative of the applicant has to get to another meeting. So I'll need a motion to change the agenda. I'll, I'll move. I'll also move uh, to this applicant to move uh, 30, the item 30, 2021 31 Hancock Lane to the top of the agenda for tonight. Second? I'm happy to second. Okay. All in favor? Thank you. So, Chairman, the, uh, the, uh, the applicant represented here by Craig Clarity tonight is um, proposing to modify EPC permit 30 2021 to allow construction of an underground propane tank and a backwash system um, on the property situated at 31 Hancock Lane. Um, I prepared a, a very brief agenda sum report highlighting the issues and the summary of the prior history with the granting of the, the permit back in October of 2021. The, uh, the applicant has addressed the uh, major uh, issues that were identified um, as, as part of the modification request. The tank has been sited, of course, it will be below ground. There'll be no hydraulic impacts, the same with the, the backwash system. They um, are set back to the uh, edge of the river, um, although it's still in the floodplain. They have provided a, um, a detail of Connecticut professional engineer certifying this, the, that it would be capable of withstanding the flood depths, pressures, velocities, impact, and upward forces. And for, other factors. For how many years? For, for the 50 year flood? For the 100 year storm. For 100 year storm. <clears throat> and um, they've been relatively uh, good in, in maintaining their sediment erosion controls under the, under the, under the prior permit. And um, as the uh, opportunity lends itself, as, it, as the, 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 uh, the project has progressed, staff had asked for and the applicant had, um, had addressed um, planting along the edge of the water course. There had been an initial planting plan that had been submitted as part of the prior approval. And with the removal of the pool that was there and you know, as the construction progressed when they removed the existing house, opportunities lend itself to do additional planting. And they have revised the planting plan um, with a, a, a very good um, selection of conservation valued plantings. They've expanded it up up the water course in, in, in some uh, manner on both sides of the, mm -hmm. the water course uh, as well. Um, it's not expected that the addition of those items will uh, you know, exacerbate flood conditions or will have an adverse impact on the regulated areas. Note that it's all work that is within the, um, the, uh, the uh, construction envelope that had been defined at the original time of subdivision. I have some de minimis conditions of approval having to do with certifications at the end, um, and all of the conditions of 30-2021 remain in full force in effect. Craig is here to, to add uh, this evening and certainly available to answer questions. For the record, my name is Craig Flaherty and I have nothing to add. <laughs> <laughs> So you're going to keep the construction. What I was uh, concerned about was the construction, right? because you got to get something in there to dig it out to, for a thousand gallon tank. Yeah, well, uh, construction access is very simple. The approved driveway is right here on the east side of the site. Uh, the gray areas are approved additions that are now under construction. So construction access is very simple and will not involve any disturbance in or near uh, the resource, which effectively is the Good Wives River and its fringe wetlands. I mean, the Stony River River and the Good Fringe Wetlands. Mm -hmm. Does any commission member have a question, comment? I have, I have a question, Mr. Chairman. And if it's, cut me short, if it really doesn't apply, because the question, Craig, is really, across the street from Hancock Lane from your project to the south there. Mm -hmm. I didn't see a sign, but it almost looks like protected property like a dairy and land trust might. 
be interested in. I don't know if that's owned by them or not. Oh, it's not owned by these folks, no. Right. Yep. But there are a huge stack of those man-made kind of interlocking wall system things stacked up in that property. On the south side of the room. On the south side. Now, I don't know if the owners of 31 Hancock right. that's are responsible for that, or it could be another neighbor, but it was kind of unsightly, and if it is land trust property, they would want to ask you to get rid of that if it's yours. Well, uh, we can see in one second who owns the property, if I look it up here on uh, the Darien GIS system. There's a lot going on in this site, is it? Well, a lot, no, of, I, I, a lot of rocks, a lot of stuff. Um, on the site itself. Oh, on on your on your oh, building oh, site. You, well, I will. You know, not to rehash the approval you granted um, last year, but but really it was a. Come on. Um, it was definitely a net benefit. We were reducing impervious coverage. We were removing mm -hmm. a garage uh, from the setback. We were pulling back the. Uh, driveway, removing a pool from the backyard, upgrading the septic to uh, current standards. So, uh, all right, here we go. Let me find Hancock in here. It is north of Highland Farm. I don't mean to this whole meeting with that question, but I just thought it <laughs> So, uh, the property directly across the street is not a land trust property. There's an owner. Um, this property boundary right here, the property uh, that owns up to there. Right. The house is on the west side of the river, and they just have woods on the east side of the river. Right. And then the next property. Hey, Rick, maybe we need to tell uh, what did you go visit it? Yeah, you know, let's see what's going on. And, and maybe, it's, maybe it's the owners of the property storing some stuff. <coughs> there. I'm just, if it happens to be this contractor found a convenient place to drive. No. 100 blocks that shouldn't be done. Yeah, there's those like versa lock blocks, like the wall. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, I don't think there's it nothing on this like site. kind of thing they'd be using yeah, that's in correct. this project from what I saw. They're not it doesn't sound walls. like They're not building walls. Yeah. No, they're not. I mean, they're using but anyway, we'll, beautiful we'll, we'll stone, stone, but anyway. I'd, yeah. Rick's got it as a follow-up yep. to uh, thank you to go out there and, and then they'll, talk, they'll, they'll Sorry, take, they'll take action there. against the uh, Find, yeah, find out who the owner of the property is and go from there. Thank you. Okay. Just a, this is a very small item. Uh, sure. On the site plan, it talked about boulders to be located along the septic system. On the new architectural plan that came out on 627, <coughs> there's no boulders placed there. I would have thought that was part of how the, uh, the shrubs and all the other plants would be based around those boulders. So minor thing, but you know, it'd be nice if they both tied together. Uh, look at what you're looking at? Yeah. <clears throat> so I'm looking at this right here on the site plan. Uh, boulders to be located yeah, with the yep, uh, landscape yep, architect. Right. And the landscape architect, I don't think we'll put them in here. Yeah, let's do a catch. We'll make sure the drawings are coordinated. Thank you, guys. Thanks. 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 Can you send an updated set of drawings then? Yeah, that's not Okay, to Rick to uh, just yeah. make sure the package is complete. Yeah. Great. Okay, anybody else have any questions or comments? No? Thank you very much, Greg. Okay. Good. Okay, <laughs> moving on to new business here. We have EPC 30. Yeah, you, you want us to vote? Yeah. Okay. Can I have a motion to approve the modification of uh, EPC 30 2021, 31 Hancock Lane? I'll make a motion. Go ahead, dear Bill. Good. You would. would it, go ahead. No, he wanted to make the motion. <laughs> My lady's first, so, so second. Competing. Carolyn gets a second. All in favor? Uh, okay, unanimous. Thank you very much. Have a good trip to Fairfield. <laughs> okay. Uh oh. Next is new, new business EPC 13 2022 for Linda Lane T. Carruthers to construct a pool slash privacy fence and install landscaping proximate to wetlands. The property lies along the east side of Linda Lane, just south of Hanson Road, and is identified as map number nine as lot number 92. The zone is R2 and it's one, that's approximately one 
0.01 acres. And representing the applicant is? Sure. Oh, you want to go first? Well, just a bit, uh, yeah. Mr. Chairman, the, um, as you know, it's a, the applicant is proposing, this was a, a uh, lot that's currently under the development. Mm -hmm. It had been previously developed. The house was raised sometime between 2016 and 2019. <clears throat> Again, the house currently under the development, under development with, a, with a pool. Prior to the issues of the building permit, it was a soil report that had been issued and said no that was on the property. I remember that one. Right. So what was, remember that one. Mm -hmm. what was what was missed was the wetlands on the joint properties in the upland review area extends onto the property. And so uh, in advance of doing the pool, uh, the applicant has come in to uh, restore and enhance a fence along the property perimeter. It will also serve for privacy and for screening and for the, the pool in the future. The uh, project engineer has also relocated the system to make septic system to make sure it stays outside of the the regulated areas again, which is only the 50 foot upland review area, um, and um, they have submitted a pretty comprehensive uh, relandscaping plan. And so today I was working on the project, and <coughs> and the expectation is that uh, um, I'll be looking to do an agent approval on this for verification at the, the commission's next meeting. But certainly, mm -hmm. uh, Doug is here to, to make a, a, a brief presentation. If you have any questions or concerns, I can incorporate it into what I look at. Okay, good evening. Doug DeVesta, professional engineer, representing the applicant. Uh, as Rick, Rick was saying, we had a permit from last year. Um, the house is basically up, uh, sheet rocked, window, waiting for windows and stuff like that. Um, so we're here for tonight is that we had a, a, a memo from uh, Otto Theo saying there is no wetlands on our site, but possibly on the joining, joining properties. Uh, Rick brought that up to us when we were going for our permit, our, our pool permit. Um, we did a little research. We found wetlands on from survey or from various surveys. We found the wetlands on the adjoining properties, which I highlight here in the green. And that's the wetlands that are on the adjoining property. Um, there is a, a privacy fence that's kind of falling down on the south side of our property. The upland review area shown in red here is the area uh, that we're looking to enhance. Um, Tree, some, I think two trees were removed um, and the stumps that were there were moved, removed and then piled up and that's the debris you see on that area there. Uh, the septic system has been shifted to the, to the north and to the east, keeping it all outside of the upland review area. Um, this has been submitted and Mindy's aware of it. Um, Health Department is aware that this system has been shifted up there and she's been in the process of reviewing. She's out, I think she's out this week. Um, and, and we've, we had a staff report, uh, I don't know if you saw the staff report from May 4th, uh, then we had an up, updated staff report on the 23rd, um, which we received uh, last week. And he's asking, and Rick was asking for uh, details of proposed fence installation requirements. So now shall provide a passage of water, uh, stormwater, small forms of ant wildlife, avoidance of significant trees as possible, et cetera. Um, the, the tree, the, the privacy fence that will be installed um, and, there's, and the um, pool fencing that's be on the east side will be done with post hole diggers, you know, pay by hand, uh, dig, dig down nine inches or so, down, get down, put the post in there, either back, take a bag of cement, pour it in there, or take rocks and chink it in there to hold it up. So that would, that's the, the amount of disturbance that we're looking to put the, for the fence purposes. Um, stormwater passage, um, the, let me just, I have some photographs. These are the photo, these are, are for the, that's the, the first one on top is the actual uh, fence for the pool. The second page will be the stockade fence for privacy, again, to sort of cover and hide the existing stockade fence that's kind of falling down on the neighbor property. Um, passage of stormwater, I don't see an issue with that. I'm not sure what Rick means by small forms of wildlife. Uh, it's kind of vague. I'm not sure if it's chipmunks or. Yeah, so typically, what you do is, again, just for those two purposes. It would be like three inches off the ground, so about the passage of stormwater and any of the little critters that are running back and forth in the, in the corridors that are there, you can make it back and forth. That's a typical practice to, to most fences. Okay. Okay, so and then and there's, one, there's one is, tree. Is there an issue there? I don't see it. I'll see that being an issue, no. Not at all. Um, 
There is one tree that right at the edge of the um, upland view area, but there's enough space in there between the tree and the property line to put the, the stockade fence in there. So that doesn't seem to be any problems or, um, you know, again, avoiding the trees. Um, the next question he asked for engineer statement, sign and seal, confirming the absence of impact of drainage infrastructure and adjoining properties. Uh, well, this, this, the, the, the fence, the, the, the pool fence and the privacy fence uh, will have no impact on joining properties, neighbors, or um, drainage infrastructures. And then the last question that Rick asked, a planning plan, which he talked about, uh, he said it was very substantial, and I have a copy of it right here, showing that we are providing uh, plantings through the upland view area, uh, privacy fence, uh, additional privacy to the east, and along Hanson Road, as you come down Hanson, that house is sitting right there. There was a fence there, there's also was hemlock trees in that area. A lot of them blew down during a storm, and the privacy fence that was there was pretty in pretty poor condition. Uh, so again, we have a fairly uh, in-depth planting plan along the um, south side of Hanson Road to block the back of the house there. Um, so I think that really addresses all the comments um, that um, that Rick has brought up in his May 4th letter and also in his June 23rd letter. If there's any questions, I'd be glad to answer them. Lauren, would you like to start? Um, yeah, I, I guess I just wanted to understand. So is it correct that you're removing 45 trees on the whole property? Or am I just misreading something? Because see all the on the other side of the property there's there appears Correct. to be Correct. This, these trees here, these were all the hemlock trees that were uh, damaged or hemlocks are all dying anyway. So yeah. they, they, they took all those trees down there and then from the trees up along the area by the septic area, things like that. So yes, we took them a, a number of trees down. Um, like even on the other side of the the property too, right? Where there's no work being done, they're just removing down through here, the front Yeah, there's a couple over there. Oh, there's, a, and well, there's, a park, there's a parking court there and a driveway there as well. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, they, they all need to be removed because they're damaged? Or? They've been removed. Sorry? They've, they, they've removed. already been removed, correct. all 45 of them. Whatever the trees were marked on our plans mm -hmm. that were, were removed, correct. Okay. Well, then that answers my question if they've already been removed. Are, are they planning on... Um, replacing any of those, you know, larger trees outside of this right, planting right. plan, or it's right. it's just what they've identified. Yeah. Correct. Mm -hmm. So the planting plan that was provided is to move for the encroachments into the regulated area, which is in the top, I mean, in the back corner down mm -hmm. here, mm -hmm. and so they've extended the planting up and through here. This was. Issue. This was already closed. And it wasn't I even. Said. It wasn't even a. a yeah, because it just said proposed plan. everything, so <clears throat> it's already been completed. No, it's not complete. It's under construction. Okay. We're waiting for the windows. Let's see. Um. Okay. Uh, that I'm good. I don't have any other questions. Then on the Jim, I have no questions, Mr. Chairman. There no questions. No questions. No questions. Okay, uh, what would you like to do, Rick? Uh, do you want us to this is just the initiation. The reason why we're here this evening is just to give a, brief, a very brief presentation. And if you've uh, gone out and you can, if you had any questions, issues, or concerns, mm -hmm. it's my expectation to do a more detailed review. I gave Doug some uh, things that I needed him to address, and we'll put it in the record. And that is my intent to do. An agent. An agent, agent approval. approval, and then you can review it at the April 3rd August. meeting. August. No, the other day. <laughs> August 3rd meeting, and uh, we'll go from there if there's any additional issues or concerns. Okay. Thank you. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you. Um, next item of new business is EPC 14 2022, 64 Andrews Road, 8 Teodoro, to expand and reconstruct a recreational deck and fence proximate to the wetlands. The property lies along the east side of Andrews Road, just north of Red Coat Pass, and is identified as map number 64, lot number 113, zone is R1, and it is approximately 1.75 acres. Mr. Chairman, this uh, again, we again initiate the process, start that time clock. 
<clears throat> um, I have already been out to the site and have reviewed. This is another one that is I'm anticipating doing an agent approval. It's for an expansion of a deck along one side of the house. If you had been to the site, mm -hmm. it's a very abrupt site. The wetland is way at the bottom of a hill along the road. There's a pretty substantial retaining wall, perhaps eight, ten feet high. The house is situated up on top of the hill. There is a deck along one side. They're expanding it some de minimis amount, but it lies within the upland view area. So um, staff will be preparing a, a review evaluation mm -hmm. in advance of the August meeting um, and uh, for your review to see if that we were uh, can authorize this activity. Okay. Does any commission member have any? Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Does any commission member have a question or comment for Rick? Okay. I'm, I'm generally okay with this. My only question is, I don't think I saw, maybe I missed it, an engineer stamp on the, on the, uh, you know, just because it's a wetland property, technically it is mm -hmm. close to up on the view area. I think we just okay. have I mean a on the survey. an engineer stamp. The oh, next sorry. one. I'll look into it. So it doesn't fall over or anything. Do, yeah. do they have to submit the application form as well and all the flooding documents or is this? Yeah, there was no application form for that. Well, there was no application form in that. They have submitted everything online and they brought that package in, but I can make sure that you oh. get the application form. Okay. <coughs> Moving on. EPC 15 2022, 35 Old Parish Road, J. Morgan to construct an in ground pool pool, equipment, <coughs> fence, drainage, and related improvements in a special flood hazard area <coughs> to the wetlands and watercourses. The property lies on the east side of Old Parish Road, approximately 400 feet north of West Avenue, and is identified as map, map number 19, lot number 46, in the zone is R1, as approximately 1.03 acres. Rick? Again this evening, starting the process. Uh, I have inspected the site. The uh, applicant is proposing to, as you had noted, do a <clears throat> an in-ground pool and related features on the property. There is a uh, water course that borders the edge of the, the, uh, the site. There's uh, fringe wetlands that are there. There's areas of special flood hazard on the property. In advance <clears throat> of the August meeting, uh, we'll be asking for information and uh, send out the analyses that have been presented to DPW and mm -hmm. do a, a, a thorough review and get back to you with um, a, a report. Um, but it is a, uh, you know, a, a full application. I do not anticipate it's going to be an agent approval. It will be for the board's consideration. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll go from there. Are you representing the applicant? Yeah, I'm Brian Carey from Lantech. I'm the Director of Environmental Services, and I'm here in support of the application for our client, uh, Jennifer Morgan and Mr. Ward. I can answer any questions. I, I can give the quick spiel about what we're doing, um, or, if, or if you want to wait till August after we have the comments, we can do that as well. well if anybody has any questions or comments, to Bill? Uh, yeah, uh, I went out to the site, and there's a um, PVC, probably six inch diameter, uh, going into the brook. And we saw it on the, uh, on the actual survey. I didn't see it located on the uh, site plan. And I'm just curious what that is. It's, uh, it, it's not, there's no water coming out of it, but there was upland of it toward the house. Very, very wet. So it's probably just a meter drain wall. We'll have to rotate okay. that in the field. And, okay. and have to Basically, just real quick, um, as, uh, as the director said, there's just a water course off site that's culverted. There's a small area of wetland on the property. The only work that we're doing within the upland review area is this tiny uh, portion of grading. The entire pool is outside of the upland review area. There is a flood. Uh, this is the flood line on the property. Um, it's this this area is it, within the special flood hazard area. Uh, the structure is basically upgraded. This is still sloping down, so it shouldn't cause any issue as far as uh, the flood plain is concerned. Um, there's a pretty well established wetland buffer, and when we did the initial design and planning for. Uh, for the placement of the pool, we didn't want to uh, disturb this existing buffer because it is 
pretty significant and well established. Um, so this fits within the zoning um, set back for the side yard, so we were able to fit the pool in there um, and, and basically provide direct uh, access during construction so as not to disturb uh, the area behind that, the back. We, we tried our best to minimize all disturbance within the upland review area based on the grades. Um, there is just this one uh, small grade fill in the area. What happened during the September storms? Uh, I, I, I don't believe the water got in the house, but it did come up um, to, to basically the flood line itself. Really? Yeah. Because I would have suspected more, but but if that's if that's what the homeowner report. I believe this is a zone A, so it's not map. There's no actual elevations that are mapped for that specific mm -hmm. uh, for that specific area. Okay. Well, if that was. Any, uh, the, the, anybody else for it? I don't need to keep going. We need Carolyn to go. No. I don't have any questions about it yet because I haven't seen it, but I will next time for sure. Uh, just a comment. I think I'd like to see a buffer uh, to the north to match uh, what is located to the east. Yeah, There, there is actually uh, plantings. Um, it's not so there, the, you can see the tree line here um, on the plan. Um, there, you know, there, that there is low growth vegetation in that area. There's nothing there now. It's, it's, you know, low growth. It's not directly grass to the top of the water course, yeah. but that is something. I think what he's thinking is that when you get that sheet run off yeah. and you got an elevation that's dropping that way, it's going to rip any fertilizer and pesticides right over there. So that, I believe that you need to, we need to beef that up so that it catches some of that. The other section in the back is far enough away from any of the mountains. Right. That section is not. Is that what you were talking about? Yeah. Okay. Not a problem. Sorry? Great minds think alike. Yes. <laughs> that was a joke. I'm laughing on the <laughs> inside. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anything else? That's all I have tonight. Okay. No questions. Okay. See you in August. Um, sorry, where did the wetlands actually start and end? So I see the water and I see the upland review area in the little corner in there. So but where are the... So this is the town wetland line. Um, the wetlands, uh, this is the town wetland line. That we, we actually did not flag them. They're, you know, this is off-site, so we, we don't have access to flag the water course. And we're assuming that uh, the wetlands are either in this area or further off-site on, on the neighboring property. Oh, okay. So okay. we did not, we didn't actually, because of the buffer and the fact that we were already out of the established 50-foot uh, upland review area based on the town's mapping, we didn't go back there and do additional um, soil, soil mapping. Um, okay, and then just one more quick question on the map. Um, sure. So it looks like there's trees that are X out. Are there trees being removed or does that indicate something else on the map? No, there's no, there's no trees being moved as okay. part of the application. Um, that, that was one of the reasons we kept it over in this area to enter a property through here with the excavation or build a uh, construction entrance. It would have caused us to disturb some of this. And, and also, we're trying to keep the stockpile out of the flood flood, way, sure. flood flood zone during construction. This minimizes all of that. So even if there was, let's say, a 100-year storm, most of the, the, all the construction of materials and stormwater drainage is outside of the 100-year flood hazard area. OK, that makes it more clear. Thank you. OK, well, we'll see you in a month. I lied. I had one more question. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm with you for one more application. So. Oh, OK. <laughs> uh, how are you proposing? What is the order? I mean, and maybe one of the things that I, I would suggest um, for staff or, or for the commission as a condition is to uh, itemize how you're going to construct the pool, So um, and specifically dewater. So you're going to be not only digging for the pool, but also for the coltex. Yep. And during that time, we know you're going to dewater. So there is a little bit of general uh, erosion sediment control notes that 
do contain some of that, but we'll come up with a construction. So what I'd like to see is where you're going to phase in plan construction. Where you're going to dump the water. Yep. And where it's going to sheet flow, or if you're just going to dig a hole somewhere else on the property and pump the water into that hole, but just locate it on plan and have a yep. have an itemization for that. That's not a problem. Good. And that's generally something we would establish if it's not on the plan. We would establish during the pre-construction meeting with the contractor. Yeah, and uh, you know, it's there's a there's a privet hedge um, yep. up until the driveway as well. So I'm just curious how you guys are going to. That, that, that yeah, how you're going to get in? It, how you're just going? No big deal. Just, yeah. just itemize it. That's all. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And now we'll move on to BPC 16 2022 20 St. Nicholas Road, D King and L King, construction of an in-ground pool, pool equipment fence, and other related features proximate to the wetlands and water courses. The property lies along the south side of St. Nicholas Road approximately 325 feet west of Mansfield Avenue and is identified as map number six, lot number 81, zone is R1 and is approximately 1.331 acres. As with the other three prior applications, it's the mark to start with this evening's uh, indication on the agenda is to mark the start of the, the application process. Um, and uh, again, like the others, uh, staff has already been out there and we'll be generating a list of information and, and activities that are necessary to do a thorough review of the application um, with the expectation in the next month or two that uh, we'll be back before the commission and to, to uh, and make a presentation. The, uh, the pool is at the rear of the property. There is a little wetland corridor along the um, western side of the property. It goes to a pond. Um, part of the pond the edge is already planted and buffered. The applicant's proposing some additional planting down there. <clears throat> and we, again, are yet to evaluate that. Uh, construct the pool, construct terraces, construct a fire pit, and along with um, drainage to accommodate any increase in, in the pretty system to protect water quality. We'll also be <coughs> Uh, sediment erosion controls, those will all be evaluated in the future and um, a referral will be made to the uh, DPW to <coughs> independently review um, the project and impacts. Does anyone have questions or comments? I, I just have one question of, uh, about just clarification on the size of the <coughs> property because um, on the application it says 1.3. 331 acres, and then on the soil scientist report, yeah. it says 1.01 acre. The, I mean, it's it's 1.331. It the is. Soils, okay. The soil report needs to be amended. Okay. No, if you can amend that and submit that again, we can believe I caught that while I was uh, <laughs> <laughs> doing my. It's a tough group. <laughs> it's a tough group. I like it thorough. <laughs> Go ahead, Bill. Come on. Uh, Rick already talked about it a little bit, but just to clarify, around the pond, it's probably 80% has been, we're back to this buffer thing. Yep, from understood. My, it's yeah. one of my yeah. pet peeves. As uh, it should so be. So if they can get the other section, which is toward the west, I guess, of that pond, where it's not, where there's nothing uh, in plan there. Because that's, that's actually, because it's a very high pitch that's coming from that pool, it's going to come down there very quickly and you might as well cover that section <coughs> very helpful. So you're, you're asking yep. to extend the buffer plan? Yeah, it's, okay. it's a pretty big gap. Um, and the only other small item at the very, very south part in the wetlands there is dumping. It's not major compared to some of the other sites we've seen recently, but it'd be nice if they uh, you know, clean that up and let their contractors know it's not the right thing to do. Thanks. That'll become a condition anyway. That they clean it up. So. Yeah, this is kind of a cookie layout for the when we flagged it in the field. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just had one thing and I was interested when I was there that you, you made the construction access from the existing driveway, <clears throat> which is at a pretty abrupt slope. I'm not a slope, but it's a, it's a retaining wall. So you essentially have to build a road. Yeah. To, to get in. Did you look at any alternatives? And I'll certainly ask for it. 
to come straight off the road and it's only be to remove and then I guess ultimately restack the road without the necessity of in this area there yes is a, there is a stone wall there um, I think that was part of the reason and then speaking with the contractor they, they didn't feel it was a big issue to build the ramp down off of the exact existing with process and to, to it's come like down. three feet or more. Yeah. So there'd be a so, pretty expans, extensive road being built. I mean, we, we are more than willing to answer that question, but I believe that was a discussion we had with the potential pool contractor um, because we do work closely with them um, during the design um, and, and obviously construction phase. It also, it also necessitates the removal of some you know, pretty good screening yeah, shrubbery there, that's this, in there too. This area we looked at, obviously there's there's, uh, there's other issues with access through here. So, um, yeah, we, we, you know, and also trying to pull this back as much as we could um, because obviously the wetland areas uh, coming down, coming down through here. So even to try to, you know, we we're trying to minimize the amount of temporary disturbance to the wetland. This Anyone else? Just had a, um, Describe the flow. I see they to the uh, west. Is is this a stream or? Yeah, it's a stream that comes into a man-made pond yeah. that was excavated, and um, basically there's stone walls um, around the edge of the pond. There's a decorative pond. So the stream is coming between the stone wall on the east it, and it, the stone wall on the west. Correct. It flows. It flows into a stone line culvert. Yep. Um, from basically from north to south. And then exits at an overflow basis to the southern part of that. That's property. correct. There's a little weir here that keeps the level of the pond. Okay. Um, I didn't have a chance to get out to the site. What is actually there now where the, uh, the pool and the patio are going? Uh, nothing is, you know, this is an open area right here. It's just grass. Yes, yeah, there's, there's grass. There's, there's a little bit of gray change. One of the things to minimize the amount of grading um, is we did put a wall in um, to minimize disturbance within the upland review area. The wall will help prevent um, additional grading that would have likely extended further out. So um, that's one of the, there's a little bit of grading in the bottom of the wall, um, but the wall helps uh, prevent additional impact and, and grading at a, at a cost to the, obviously, to the homeowner. Uh, I can jump in, um, you know, because this is a material project, I, I'd like to see some consideration where we're moving the um, the pool equipment away from the wetlands. I think you have a material amount of land to locate the pool equipment further away from the wetlands. Your pool equipment, your proposed pool equipment is to the south to the south, behind the shed. Yeah. Well, I understand the convenience. I mean, I would say I'd like to see the generator further away from the from the wetland. Um, I'd also like to see on plan where the generator is actually feeding to the house, and any other any other buried structure in the ground, so we can understand the development. So my suggestion is, uh, another question would be, is the shed on a foundation or is it just sitting on gravel? No, I believe it's on concrete block. So the shed can move? Uh, I believe so, but I, I do have to field check that. So i like to see a prudent and feasible alternative to the location of the shed, the generator, and the pool equipment. I don't think it's acceptable that it's located that close to the weather because you have the real estate to, to plan for that. That's all I got. Um, one observation not really related to, to the environmental aspects, but is, does it seem odd that the fire pit is directly adjacent to the propane tank? <laughs> <laughs> no, I believe it is propane fire. I'd have to check that it is propane fire. Oh. See how close they are? That's like. 
I don't know. It just makes me a little uneasy. <laughs> That's a fire marshal setback, but I, I mean, we will check that. Good kid. Yeah. That's a good. Next time we see Bobby Bush, we can ask him. <laughs> Okay. <coughs> See you next month or? That would be August 5th, correct? Third. Third. Thank you. Uh, so everything, all the requirements Thank are you. in the It could very well be just a 250 gallon bottle that's always been there, maybe supplying a kitchen or something. Yeah, I wasn't sure. I wasn't clear what it was. Okay. <clears throat> Old business, EPC 05 2022. 141 West Avenue, D. Leschnewinski, to demolish an existing detached garage, construct parking grade, and conducted related activities in close proximity to the wetlands and water courses, Stony Brook. <coughs> Work is in association with a proposal to partially demolish and then raise and flood proof an existing single family dwelling and associated features. The property lies along the south side of West Avenue approximately 335 feet east of Old Parish Road and is identified as map number 39, lot number 103. The zone is R1 one third and is approximately 0 0.1702 acres. Rick? So Chairman, in your packages, you have a site development plan and um, mitigation plan and, and other related documents in support of the, the application. The, um, again, the applicant is proposing to, there's a very small reach of Stony Brook and, and, a, and a fringe wetland at the, at the very um, extreme south of this property. It's also primarily, the entire property is within this, the special flood hazard area. So the applicant is is proposing to take this this home and to substantially improve it, but bringing it up to flood compliance. And in, uh, related to that is um, a very small um, drainage mitigation system, water quality system. He's demolishing an existing detached garage that lies immediately adjacent to the brook. He'll be removing debris. He's doing landscape enhancements. I can go into a little bit further detail. But a lot of my time had been spent, and in, in, in if you're interested, I'll, I'll go into it, is on the flood proofing of the dwelling. The, the plan and zoning directors have me look more in detail at that, make sure it's flood compliant. So um, the applicant was charged with the task of demonstrating that um, it's minimized or avoided the wetland resource impacts. It's utilized measures to protect water quality, <clears throat> address potential drainage impacts, minimize or, or ensure that there's no hydraulic impacts um, or flood storage loss, and that the dwelling is built to meet the very strict requirements of what FEMA dictates and what, and what Darien has adopted over, over the years. Finally, is to evaluate or look for opportunities and to evaluate any kinds of mitigation plans that could um, be presented for the site, you know, given the scope of, of what the, um, the activity is. The, uh, the, the, the applicant has done a, uh, after a long drawn out process, has done a good job in addressing those, those issues. He provided a site development plan. <coughs> A site development plan that shows that there's no grading associated with this. They are just putting in uh, the, any kind of the drainage structures and features will be um, installed um, at the existing grade and, and the water and the, um, the groundwater conditions were such and the choice of the, the drainage structures were such that um, they could do it without uh, um, raising the grade and without um, the necessity of a hydraulic impact analysis or, or providing for flood storage loss. Um, they've looked at drainage and they've done, they've taken portions of the roof <clears throat> and have put them into infiltrators with, um, and as a result of doing that, they, they've decreased the peak rate of runoff 
for storms ranging from two to 50 years. They've also done a, a, a maintenance proposal and uh, it's been looked initially by DPW and they've offered no objections. No hydraulic impacts, again, no changes of grade. Water quality is with the erosion control um, provisions, perimeter fence, uh, anti-tracking pads, stockpile areas, final stabilize, stabilizing ground covers to the spaces that are um, affected by the construction, utilizing infiltration to <clears throat> seize upon the, um, the soil's natural ability to uh, um, cool and, and filter runoff, and um, it'll be served by electric heat, so there's no fuel storage. <clears throat> a, a mitigation proposal has also been uh, developed, provides for the removal of accumulated debris, uh, removal of in invasives, and a, uh, a, a, a planting plan that is uh, pretty well in line with what the, um, the applicant is asking for. It's about 15 plants along the edge of the brook. The dwelling has been designed to meet the standards of the, of the flood regulations. They are filling the basement, they're creating a crawl space, they're providing wall, hydraulic wall openings sized specifically for the dwelling. <clears throat> no finished wall ceiling or floor materials, no, no, um, no mechanicals or service facilities down uh, in that lower space. It's no longer it's a basement, it is a crawl space, meaning it meets subgrade, uh, it can't meet subgrade on all four sides. In this case, they're pretty well meeting. There's very detailed accounting of those flood openings and where they have to be located. The first floor will be raised substantially above the base flood. Um, <clears throat> same thing with any service facilities. The exterior mount boxes, the air conditioner units attached to the dwelling but raised with a platform are all a foot above the base flood. He, they've done um, a pretty good job putting all the appropriate notes, um, provided access to that crawl space. And so, um, with that, if you have any questions, the, my, I anticipate is, is uh, listening to your questions and concerns. Um, if there's anything that I need to gain additional information for, but I was generally leaning towards uh, drafting a resolution for next month's meeting. Warren, anything? Okay. This is ambitious. Um, I don't have any specific comments to what they're doing. I, I admire them for, I guess they love this location where they've been, of course, and they're looking to make it worthy of li living there for a long, long time to come. It's a very ambitious project. But this is what you have to do for, as you, as you well know, for a flood-proof dwelling. There's a lot more than what, I yeah. think, you're, what you probably typically have seen. Oh, right. And so what you... Well, well, it's in a flood zone, so FEMA gets a hold of us. So, uh, so we make sure that, well, we will now make sure that it's compliant with the flood regulations for residences. What happened to this? Do you, do you know what happened to this in last September? <coughs> um, I, I get I asked do that not question all the time. That's, what, that's the reason it's because... Oh, we also have you know what? I do know, actually. The, uh, pardon? I do know, actually. I mean, there was, if you went into the back and you looked across, hey, you could see a lot of furniture. You know, all that washed down Stony Brook, there has been some erosion along the pretty, on the next property, some pretty substantial erosion of the embankments. Mm -hmm. um, in the basement, they had about five feet of water. Because mm -hmm. this is near the turn in the river where the scout cabin is. Mm -hmm. Across the street. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Which, and it goes down. And, and it, it goes down. And it goes down. The scout yeah. Yeah. So when the scout cabin floods, the water floods over. I mean, it's I don't know yeah. if you've ever gone there, but. I've gone down West Avenue where drive, dri dri driving, driving through the water that goes over West Avenue is it's problematic. Yeah. So, so this poor, this poor property gets it all. So. Yeah, yeah it is, it is ambitious, but he's. Um, I, I know that he's he's done similar projects before, and. Um, what? What? Uh, Wayne's done similar projects, or the builder? The builder. Is the purpose of these Coltex to? Store the water before it overflows. I mean, it really is. It, it's just going to overflow. Well, that's what. Well, well, during a storm, yeah. of course, it's going to. It's yeah. going to overflow. You, you have the, the water quality um, 
I'm just saying. You know, I mean, there's, there's a water quality associated with it, too. So in your lesser storms, it's not going to No, gonna I understand. Flow. I'm saying anecdotally speaking, it looks like eyewash to me. In some ways, I suppose it is, too. But I mean, I'm agnostic mm -hmm. to it. I'm just wondering, could you, could you back up the, the coal? I don't know if it really makes a difference, but could you back up the coal text to be underneath the driveway so they have a better chance of performing? They could be relocated, I suppose, but it would depend on I mean, um, you know, test hole data, et cetera. They had the test hole one, which I think they probably used for this because the garage is still there. Are they is there are they keeping the asphalt driveway or is that why? Or are they is there a new driveway that's gonna go in place? I'm just saying yeah. further up the elevation, understanding that you have to do a test hole. If the soils are better, I mean, you know, well, the elevation form a function of stormwater management. And maybe cleaning the water because it's just not going to be geysering out the overflow. There is, um, you know, there's a. It's a very flat lot. It's a very flat lot. You do get in some elevation. I think it's less than a foot of difference as you get up towards the house. Yeah. <clears throat> just, so again, it's very. It's it's complicated. I'm, I'm, it, it's just an observation. Yeah. No, it's. It, you're Wayne does you're a great absolutely job. correct. Wayne knows what he's doing. So. So, is it gonna is it gonna perform in a hundred year storm? I think no. all the soils wet. I don't think I don't think it's a material difference, but I just it, it's in a flood zone. So yeah. so so uh, no, on a one inch storm, it will perform. Okay, when it, when it hits when it, when you hit three or four, you know, and you're well, absolutely yeah, right. Just, I'm just doing no no. You're absolutely right. Just mm -hmm. common man approach is. Coltex further away from the body of water might perform better than being closer. Yeah. Yep. No garage. The garage is being removed. Yes. And there'll be no replacement garage. No. Right. So we're getting rid of a. You know, it, it's positive because you're getting rid of these obstructions. Mm. But they're expanding the driveway. They're expanding right? the driveway. It's only for the back, the turnaround. Oh. Okay. But they're eliminating the garage, and. Um, it, it, they're just giving, I think, enough for basically one car to, to back out. It's like a hammerhead. They're going to park in the driveway and, and hammerhead and get out. They're not going to have fun getting in and out of that car. I'm just wondering if, if asphalt is the right material for it. What about the porous asphalt that we... Then they, they try to get porous asphalt in a limited quantity like that. Oh. It's more expensive. He knows. Oh, because we had it for that other house on... Trail? Yeah, they trail? offered that. Yep, yeah. mm -hmm. they offered they offered it, and it was. And the question is that the the asphalt company has to do a special run without sand. I guess it is. Mm -hmm. So and so for a, a large parking lot like the Good Wife's parking lot, that you know, oh yeah, right, we, right. we we can we can do it. But yeah. but for you know a, uh, a couple of truckloads are not they're they're mm -hmm. you know. So this is the anecdote. Is the ask there's like probably I don't know there's more, but let's just say there's five flavors of asphalt. Mm -hmm. Well, the asphalt factory makes one type of asphalt, and that's the compliance for DOT, and that's what everybody gets. You could ask for a driveway mix, but they just add more sand to it to make it smoother. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you call a guy up and say, I need asphalt, you're getting asphalt, that's it. Yeah. So so we had, for example, the scout cabin was gonna get, when an application prior to, prior to your thing on EPC, it was the scout cabin, and the scout cabin was going to get done by Craig Clarity, and so was, uh, who was the app representing the applicant. And uh, he was going to get porous, uh, porous asphalt. And, and so the obvious question is you really don't have enough square footage, and you can ask them to. And he, he was absolutely 100%. So. But they'll be coming back to us because it's, actually what they, it's so, you know, three what they or four do years is, since we've seen it. So they're not going to get to it. So we'll probably uh, probably ask for an extension at some point. The asphalt <coughs> producers will not produce it unless they have some number of projects to go to. We learned that on, on uh, Scout Trail. They'll do it like on a Saturday. <coughs> do the mm -hmm. porous asphalt mix as long as they have like seven customers for it. Mm -hmm. yep. And it's more expensive. And for the scope and scale of this, is it appropriate when all this is currently asphalt? And we're just talking about the expansion of this one. You know? yeah. But I mean, it helps tremendously in terms of you know stormwater runoff. I mean, it it permeates down through the the layers. As, as long as you don't use 
it has to be, Michael's probably more familiar with it, but you can't use sand mm -hmm. on, on it to, you know, like for, for ice or things like this because that'll, that'll just it, make right. it, it'll make that'll, it that'll, that'll, that'll block right. it and I believe you have to vacuum it every so often. Oh, so there's a maintenance hmm. There's a maintenance There's a whole maintenance thing, so, okay. you know, that because you want to suck up all of the small particles that get in there that that would make that it would make it impervious mm. so so there's so you need a committed owner to uh, to do that so that's that you often don't want to do it like in like in sea shore settings or where there's a lot of flooding because in the time the of flood mm. there's so many of these little particulates in yeah. it that it would clog mm. oh. But what the engineer on this application has done is he's provided a driveway with drainage, so he's serving the function of the requirements that we have in town. Mm -hmm. um, so it's like an apple or an orange. So he's yeah. he's he's done his job. Mm -hmm. Is the reason um, Rick for no um, access to the basement from inside the house just to discourage the temptation to? No, you can you can have it from any you, you you need to have it. Of Doesn't course. say the um, access is only from the outside? But you don't need to have it from inside. Yeah, he's doing it particularly from outside. You just need to have access. Okay. Oh, the crawl space, yeah. right? From the building's exterior. No interior You're going to go from the back side. Okay. When you start coming from inside, unless it's only a couple feet down, then you could maybe drop down, but then you have to start worrying about stairs and the composition of the stairs and the composition of the materials holding the stairs in place looks so like the Simpson clips and all these other things and you have to have a choice of materials from the technical bulletin list. It, often it's, it's a, it, Just if you're not really using it, it from, and you're yeah, not really supposed to be using it for anything but, you say parking the car, it's not gonna happen in this case. Limited storage, you throw some boxes down there. Yeah, okay. Or building access if you were coming underneath. So the idea is not to encourage it. So as long as they can get there if they need to. Okay, anybody else? Okay. Moving on, EPC 06-2022-81 Inwood Road, JBL Corporation, to construct a new single-family dwelling, <coughs> dwelling drive, drainage, and related features, proximate to the wetlands and water courses. The property lies along the west side of Inwood Road, approximately 1,275 feet north of Horseshoe Road, and is identified as map number three, lot number nine, the zone is R2 and is approximately 2.758 acres. Chairman, sure, you have a, a resolution here, extensive testimony over the last couple of months yes, we have. concerning this lot and the adjoining lot. <clears throat> Just for the record, the adjoining lot, they decided to seek the alternative and they ended up redoing their site plan to get all the activities outside of regulated areas. So if we're tough, that's good? If we're tough, just the fear of coming to the EPC when it comes up with a good proposal. Um, but this one, they are, um, again, extensive testimony. They presented site plans. They did septic testing. They did a drainage analysis. They did extensive mitigation. And uh, the staff was directed to formulate a resolution for this month's meeting based on that mm -hmm. on that testimony. So has everybody got a copy of that resolution? Yes. No edits? Well, I found no edits. I actually had one Rick's, <laughs> compliment. Rick second in English course. I wanted to bring, <laughs> I wanted to bring this up over many prior meetings. I either overlooked or didn't. But I know that the effective date of this permit to conduct regulated activities is tomorrow. Yep. As it should be. We've had that date be the, the date of the meeting for all so we're, we're one day for many off. months, and the, and the applicant therefore kind of loses, loses a day. day. Right. There's not a lot of work happening after tonight. So <laughs> this, I think, is very smart. I have to tell you that, Jeremy, the first thing he told me was, don't mess up the dates on the resolutions. <laughs> he says there's a long history of saying that it was not the same date, that it starts the next day and then it ends the day before. So maybe my compliment's going to get pulled back or Jeremy's going to overrule or something, mm -hmm. make you go back no, to it's today's fine. date. No, you got it right. No, you got, you got, it, got it right. We got it right. Got it right. Got it right. So I don't think we've ever had a comment or a question from an applicant. 
saying that we got the date wrong. So uh, but even Maslin in his best days didn't catch that one. So. But we have records going way back where the effective date is the date of today's meeting. Yes, and we've never had a con we've never had someone come back and complain about it. So, all right. So uh, I guess everybody's taking a look at this. Um, can I have a motion to approve? I'm happy to make that motion, Mr. Chairman, to approve. The permit to conduct regulated activities with respect to EPC application 06 2022. I'd like to uh, second uh, to approve EPC 06 2022. All in favor? Aye. Okay, unanimous. Okay. Thank you. Approval. Everybody's got the uh, draft of the minutes of the oh. June 1 meeting. Yes. Yes. So we, we were there and no comments on this one either? We had these earlier. I sent what were very, very minor comments to Rick 10 days ago or so. I mean, they were mm -hmm. very minor. OK, anybody else have anything? What are you laughing at? You're so good. <laughs> OK, um, may I have a motion to uh, approve? Minutes of January, uh, excuse me, June 1. Uh, certainly, I move that we approve the regular meeting minutes of our June 1, 2022 meeting of the Environmental Protection Commission. I'll second the uh, motion. Great, thank you. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. Thank you very much. There are no other approvals, other business. We took care of. 31 Hancock, and now we move on to oh, one of our favorites, Thir EPC 37 2021, 32 Plymouth Road. <coughs> Jay Dylan there, uh, modification of permit number 37 2021 to allow construction of an <coughs> alternately designed and located pool house, in ground pool, drainage, grading, residential additions, and other related activities within a special flood hazard area and approximate to the wetlands and, wa uh, well, and water courses. The property line lies across the west side of Plymouth Road, approximately 475 feet north of Shipway Road, and is identified as map number 57, lot number 36, known as R-1, and is approximately 1.01 acres. And representing the applicant is, you want to go? Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, so, Mr. Chairman, um, we had a brief presentation on this matter before, and it is in, you'll recall, and it's noted in the agenda summary, <coughs> the EPC approved an application on this property to do the same thing back in, I think it was September, November of 2021, and um, approved in November. It rolled around through January and February, and it was determination that some changes needed to be made um, uh, to uh, move the project forward. Mm -hmm. The applicant decided to make some changes, and the, and, the, and the changes had to do with instead of being a walled platform, filled platform in which the pool, the spa, and the pool house sat. And there being a terrace that 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 connects the, really the, the dwelling to the the the, the pool area, um, they decided to go with a graded slope in lieu of in lieu of the um, uh, the wall around that. They diminished the size of the pool. They looked at a alternative pool house, shrunk the size of the pool house, and decided to do it as, which is completely legitimate, to do it as a floodproof structure with a crawl space area just like they did with <clears throat> West Avenue uh, not more than 10 or 15 minutes ago. Mm -hmm. The entire pool house has been elevated um, um, meeting the, the, the spirit of the flood regulations here in Darien. It has the wall openings that have been properly sized to the outside limits of, of that foundation space. No ceiling, uh, no finished wall ceiling or floor materials, no service facilities within there. All those things will be will be located um, on the first floor of the pool house, <clears throat> which is more than a foot above um, the base flood elevation. The um, 
uh, another essential component is what's happening to the house. They decided to forego the the terrace and to come out and to provide a deck in lieu of that to, to make that connection. <coughs> Flood regulations say we have the home. As long as it's not a substantial improvement, you're allowed to um, to do that and until such point there was more than 50% of the fair market value of the structure. They provided the, uh, the documentation that it is not. Um, one of the other benefits is that the, the deck also allows for that. It was built as a floodproof structure <coughs> many years ago um, to allow for the flood vents to continue to function in the, in the house itself. Um, they have, one of the big concerns at the time had been um, the, the, well, we get to the regulated areas. Regulated areas are, well, in soil areas, but more so a channel that flows along one of the property boundaries. Always had been filled with debris, diminishing the ability to flow. That had been a great concern of the commission. Um, we have incorporated into the plan to keep that, that, uh, that channel free and clear. And in fact, they've gone and, and, and cleared. Um, the channel maybe within the last month or so and uh, seem to be functioning rather well. They've done a drainage analysis, <clears throat> again, to demonstrate that um, there'll be no adverse impact on drainage and adjoining properties and to provide that water quality um, relief um, in lieu of what was had been proposed before, which was essentially a rain garden planter next to the pool. Um, They've gone with more traditional infiltration systems that will be placed in select fill um, in the raised in the raised uh, platform. There's also been submitted um, in support of the application documentation of the engineer that the, uh, the the placement of the the pool, the platform, and all the other things that we've talked about <coughs> will in no way um, change the dynamics of the flood as to adversely impact resources of the abutting property owners. Back to the drainage, there's no impact on, on um, again, as documented in the drainage analysis of uh, um, no ad adverse impact on drainage in adjoining properties. The last thing was the, the commission was um, demanding in, their, in the requirement for a landscape buffer that had been along the proposed for along that channel in the wetland soil area. A plan had been submitted, <clears throat> but in response to uh, the prior um, the prior uh, first the first go around on this review of this application, um, that planting plan has been expanded to include all the area next to um, uh, that channel, and that planting plan that has been provided as part of this reflects that. Um, given the fact that. They've met the test um, in terms of impact analysis and complying with the flood regulations with some de minimis uh, modifications that we could certainly work out the staff level. That um, staff is recommending a, an approval of this permit modification request with the conditions outlined in the agenda summary dated June 28th, 2022. Um, and I see Harry's here. And uh, I'm sure you either a presentation or answer questions if you have any. And uh, this sounds like a lot better solution than than previously. And the encroachments and the encroachments are the same, if not better. Mm -hmm. And um, and so they they worked their way through it. It was a it was a kind of a difficult modification, but the changes were were significant enough that it warranted that it could come back. Sure, no, I, that I appreciate. <coughs> yes, absolutely. Does any commission member have any questions or comments? Please. I do, have, I have one. Um, so, um, Rick, you um, specify that the, um, the shrubs uh, have a, you know, conservate their conservation valued shrubs. Um, you don't specify that they're native, and I'm just wondering, do we generally require that things be native plantings just because they require less fertilizer? You know, they provide. They'll survive. Yeah. They'll, they'll survive. survive. They won't be a bit yeah. Harry, do you have a problem with that? No, I believe they are all native as well. Okay. Yeah, I just I didn't didn't know. I'm, they are specified okay. here. I just didn't know if they were all. 
Yeah, um, we can certainly have the landscape architect confirm that, but I'm 99% sure they are all native. And I believe that came up at the first uh, order yeah. back in November. Yeah. yeah, and it has been extended over here. If you recall, during the meet, last meeting, it sort of ended here. Mm -hmm. so it was extended east to uh, meet this other right. uh, buffer here. So now it uh, encloses the entire backyard to that drainage ditch. I believe they added um, 10 shrubs and 19 ground covers. I mean, nine ground covers for a total of 19 plants. Right, yeah, yeah. Sounds like a better solution, though. Right. right. Um, and you, you said that the size of the pool has been reduced from the first that's right. Go I believe about 150 square feet. That's all that I have. <coughs> I'm just reading the notes here. Um, you have a demarcation that says the existing oil fill to be removed. <coughs> so is that the fill pipe into the found into the basement where there's a, a basement oil tank? Um, this would be, you know, now, now, um, uh, approximately that notation is next to the word terrace in front of the pool house. Right over here? Yeah. yeah. Um, I believe that would go into the basement, um, and there's propane tanks that are there currently that will uh, replace that. So did you write that on your plan? Are you responsible for that notation? Yes, that's on our plan. Okay. So what's... so. For the record, are you saying that you're filling the pipe that was used to fill the basement oil tank? Uh, Chuck, I don't believe that oil is used anymore in the basement, correct? So Chuck will have Brooks and Blanick the architect on the project. It's actually in ground. We can't pick you up back, back there, so we need you to get you to a microphone. Please identify yourself again, if you don't mind. Chuck will have Brooks and Flotico, the architect on the job. To my knowledge, it's actually an in-ground tank. I was put in at the end when they, when they was originally built. We want to remove it from the ground for a lot of obvious reasons, and we're removing it, the fill, the fill included, and switching over to propane. Okay, so that was well, that was going to be my part B. Is so, you, I, I'll just give you all of my questions, and you guys can think about it and then respond. So I just see here that you you have um, you have let's say closer to the the pool house this notation saying remove the existing oil fill. And then um, parallel, you know, between the center of the pool and the home, you have um, a notation with an arrow to remove the existing buried oil tank. So that to me looks like two separate locations. And then my follow-up question to that was going to be, has the health, have you, you haven't tested the soil yet, correct? No. Okay. Is there, Rick, is there a plan to test the soil? before the tank is removed? That's part of the procedure, right? Yeah, the general contractor on the job would have to submit all of that paperwork. Right. That's, that's, that's part of any oil tank removal. Right, and there are no other, and then again, for the record, there are, uh, well, that would have to go through just commensurate records is are there any other buried oil tanks on the property? Uh, I do not know. We'll, you'll, you'll see that paperwork though, right? Uh, we can make a condition that we get copies yeah. of it, that it's, that it's removed and verified. Right. Um, and it's in I'm everyone's sorry. best interest to get that out of the ground. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, I think it would make sense. Um, and my other question is, where is the pool equipment located? It's on a platform in the back, behind the pool house. Can you inside the building. Inside the There's a wing it's on the first the floor. That answers the question. Okay. That's all I have. Thank you. Anybody else? No? I'll just share something I think I overheard you say, Eric, as, uh, as we got started here tonight on this. I think this is a, a very good example of, while it may feel like it takes time, I think it's a another very good example of the 